Chapter 1 The Beginning of the End Part 1 Half Endless Path, Infinite Cosmos December 31, 1999 The whole world stands upon the precipice of a new millennia. While some look towards the coming era with endless hope, others wait with anticipation towards a prophesied end. The clock ticks down towards midnight as a woman screams in pain whilst going through labor. In the final seconds of the year, the cry of a baby is heard for the first time as the clock strikes midnight. The delivery was not easy, and the expectant mother lays powerlessly on the hospital bed. Using what remains of her strength she reaches towards the doctor who wears an expression of shock on his face. Please, let me see my baby. Her call breaks the doctor from his thoughts, as he congratulates her on the new birth. After signaling towards the nurse, he exits the room to make a phone call. The nurse, wearing an expression similar to the doctor, hands the child to the new mother. It's a boy she says, her voice trembling. The woman holds her child for the first time, and catches a glimpse of his face. Shock briefly seizes her as she stares at her newborn son. My baby, W what's wrong with my baby? As the shock fades she begins to tremble, unable to express the anxiety growing in her heart. She begins to weep as an agony far greater than the pain brought by childbirth settles into her heart. My child, my son. Other than the crying voice of the mother, the rest of the room maintains an eerie silence. None of the nurses can explain the phenomenon they've all just witnessed. The child cradled in the arms of this unfortunate mother is something beyond any of their combined experience. Instead of the rosy skin of a newborn, his complexion is so pale as to be transparent. You can clearly see the veins pulsing in his small limbs. Yes, they can see the blood visibly pulsing through his body with a tiny glowing heart as its source. As the crying of the new mother begins to fade, she looks into the closed eyes of her newborn son with a mixture of pain and love. I will love you no matter what, Vaughn. The baby, as if hearing the voice of his mother trembles slightly as if in acknowledgement. The glowing heart within his chest beating in a fast and strong rhythm. Through the worry and anxiety, the mother shows an affectionate smile as her eyelids begin to close. Advertisements. The instruments hooked up to the mother begin to sound, alerting the nurses to action. The baby begins to cry as one nurse removes him from the arms of his mother. The doctor returns into the room with his team in an effort to resuscitate the young woman. After two hours of emergency treatment, the young woman finally succumbs to the wounds sustained during the difficult birth. Thus the new era greets life with death. With the birth of the child and his unique characteristics, he quickly caught the attention of the media and doctors around the world. Many wanted to understand the nature and physique of the child, whilst others began spreading rumors of the birth of a new messiah. After a series of tests they quickly discovered that the child's blood had a unique mutation which enabled the cells within the blood to store a previously undocumented form of energy. Unfortunately, Due to the nature of the blood they were unable to store it outside of the child's body for more than 24 hours before it lost the unique properties and turned into a black mass of particles similar to ash. The child was quarantined for further tests as the media and populace waited with bated breath for any news related to the child. As test after test were performed and media coverage of the event began to spread globally, all news of the child suddenly ceased overnight. In an outrage at the spontaneous lack of news, People began to gather en masse around the hospital in an effort to pressure the staff into disclosing what had happened. After several days, an official statement was made by the hospital administration saying that the child had been moved to a more secure facility where he would receive care from the best scientific minds in America until they were able to verify if the child's physiology was a threat to normal people. The crowd, further incensed by the turn of events began to rally together claiming that the government was hiding away the child to hide an undisclosed truth. Some more radical groups even claimed that the child was an alien, and the government kidnapped him to dissect and analyze his body in some secret underground lab in the middle of a desert. Several groups began to form after the announcement. They would protest outside government institutions in several states trying to pressure politicians into disclosing information about the child. Though the media had seemingly been silenced, the internet was exploding with several conspiracy theories. Hundreds of thousands of online users began to rally together and petition for full disclosure of any information related to the child. As months grew into years, the size of the groups increased to the point they were able to elect representatives that would allow them to gain some insight into what had happened to the child. Advertisements After four years of effort and the change of a president, the populace was once again exposed to news regarding the child. 
They were able to learn the child possessed a mutated blood type that emitted a unique form of radiation that was able to revitalize cells and even break down other mutations and abnormalities within the body of test subjects. Mice that were injected with the blood were able to show an instantaneous increase in vitality, with any previous genetic defects seeming to repair themselves. After preliminary tests were concluded, the scientists had moved on to conducting experiments on chimps that had cancer as well as a variety of other ailments including Alzheimer and Huntington's disease. The team was surprised that in every instance where the blood was introduced into a patient, it was able to completely remove the ailment after just several hours of incubation. Follow-up tests showed that not only had the cancer cells been removed, but any tissue within the area that had sustained damage from prior treatments had been restored to a healthy state. Upon hearing of these discoveries, the populace was in an uproar. Around the world cults and religious organizations began to tout the child as the son of God, the Messiah, or a prophet. Many organizations began to demand that the child be turned over to their respective groups so they would be able to raise the child within the proper environment instead of a lab. Other groups included the various members of the scientific community from around the globe. Many countries wanted samples of the child's blood to conduct their own experiments. They eventually even banded together in hopes they would be able to pressure the United States government into turning ownership of the child over to an international group dedicated to the purpose of studying other potential uses the child may have. There was even a movement to try and justify cloning, or even forced extraction and breeding of the child's sperm. Pressure continued to build over the years as everyone wanted access to the child, now known globally as Von Mason. The child himself however had very different thoughts going through his mind. Chapter 2. The Beginning of the End. Part 2 Hives. Endless Path, Infinite Cosmos. Where am I? Vaughn muses to himself. Ah, I must have passed out again he says while looking at the machine attached to the valve on his hip. He remembers the day it was attached six years ago. The doctors had begun to get frustrated with trying to draw blood from the veins in his arms and legs, so they had put him under and performed an operation to attach a mechanism on the left side of his hip to serve as an easy access to the arteries going into his legs. Now instead of having to attach tubes to his arms, they just had to attach a hose to the release of the mechanism for quick access to his blood. He often worries about the valve leaking, and if it were to get damaged if he would die. In the last few years, this thought came to Von's mind quite often. The boy, now 14 years old, had an emaciated appearance. Though his complexion hadn't changed since birth, still almost translucent in nature, it now had an almost unhealthy appearance. Though the doctors put him on a highly nutritious diet and even had him hooked up to various tubes to feed a cocktail of vitamins directly into his body, it couldn't hide the damage done by the endless experiments. Von sighs, guess I'm still alive. He often nurtured the expectation that every time he falls asleep it would hopefully be for good. He had long given up on the possibility of killing himself because the doctors were constantly monitoring his every action. Once, when he was recovering from one of the more severe experiments, he had tried to take his life by bashing his head into the wall. Unfortunately, his attempt ended in a failure resulting in the walls to now become a padded cell. In protest, he had tried to stop eating, but the doctors simply injected him with a muscle relaxer and hooked him up to an for and nutrient drip. A bespectacled female doctor with short brown hair spoke, Awake are we Mr. Mason? Yes, Dr. Keenly. I guess I'm just feeling a little, anemic spoke Vaughn with a cynical attempt at humor. Smiling, she grabs her tablet. That's good. Don't worry, the procedure is almost over. How are you feeling today? She asks feigning concern. She had been assigned to me after my attempted suicide. Even though I know she isn't really my friend. She is one of the only people that at least pretends to treat me like a human. I'm feeling a lot better. I just finished the latest volume of Naruto. When can I get the next volume? Vaughn asked expectantly. He had really begun to enjoy reading manga and watching anime in previous years. Dr. Kinley had introduced him to it after one of their earlier sessions as a coping mechanism of sorts. You really do enjoy that manga don't you? Which one is that? Ah, the one with the blonde haired ninja boy, correct? I believe the request had gone through recently, so I should be able to get you the newer volumes soon. That is, assuming you do well in your upcoming tests. Advertisements. She often tempts me like this. It was discovered early on that my mental state had slight improvements on the quality of my blood during testing. Nothing significant, but one of the groups within the lab had gotten a grant to observe the effects, 
so someone must have cared. At least I get something to alleviate my boredom. Vaughn nods his head, yes ma'am, I will do my best. He gives his most practiced smile. Very good Mr. Mason, she says while making notes on her tablet. I'm looking forward to our session this evening. Now, if you'll please excuse me I'm going to go check up on the status of my shipping request. She turns and walks out the secured door, nodding to the guards as she passes. After she leaves Vaughn rests his head on the table, trying to get what comfort he can as the machines slowly drain the warmth from his body. I hope I can get the new volume today. I guess I'll need to put in a little more effort this afternoon he muses to himself as he once again begins to pass out. Though he used to fear going under now he tries his best to sleep through any procedure he can, especially the ones like this where they cycle blood out of his body. As he lay back, he begins to let his mind wander to the various stories he had been reading recently. His current favorites are Naruto, Bleach, and Danmachi. He liked to imagine what it would be like to be in the various worlds, away from all the painful machines and experiments. There were even times he prayed to a god which he didn't believe in, hoping to bring an end to this endless cycle of suffering, as he was unable to do it himself. As the various images and scenarios play through his head, Vaughn's conscience begins to fade. Insert random sounds of combat, bullets, and moderate explosions. Awakening suddenly to the new sounds, Vaughn turns his head in the direction they're being emitted. From the door that symbolizes his imprisonment, he can hear the sounds of dull impacts and vibrations. Straining his ears, he can hear the shouts of various men and women trying to get control of the situation. What's going on? Those voices sound like the doctors that are always watching me through the windows, and is that the sound of gunshots? Instead of fear at the unknown events happening outside of his room, he feels an anticipation. He had often heard from some of the researchers about various the organizations that wanted to save and free him. According to some of the rumors he had heard, outside of this cold and hateful lab, there were countless people that treated him like a hero or messiah. This was how he came to understand the concept of what a god was, as some of the researchers had tried to encourage him saying how much the research he was assisting with was saving lives all around the world. As he closely watched the door, he could hear the sounds getting closer and closer. After several minutes, the sounds suddenly cut off and Vaughn can hear a scraping of sorts happening from outside the door. Muffled explosive noises. Suddenly the seam around the door emits a spontaneous coughing sound and a mild shockwave which causes Vaughn to wince and become slightly disoriented. As the door falls, a group of men wearing dark militaristic style clothing rushes into the room. They quickly spread out and two of the men directly approach Vaughn who is still hooked up to the machine. Still slightly disoriented, Vaughn looks directly at the men. A-R-Y-Y -Y you here to save me, he stutters with anxiety beginning to build. We are soldiers from the organization known as Don. Are you Vaughn Mason? One of the soldiers asks while looking over the mechanisms Vaughn is hooked up to. Yes, my name is Vaughn Mason. Who are you? He asks with excitement. The man pulls down the mask covering the bottom half of his face. My name is Maxwell, and yes, we're here to get you out of here he says while smiling. The second man that had approached Vaughn fiddles around a bit with the mechanism attached to his hip, trying to disconnect it. Unfamiliar with the device, he ends up snapping the release near the valve while detaching the tube. Suddenly, blood begins to rapidly drain from the now unblocked valve. No, please, what are you doing? Vaughn screams in panic for the first time in years. Advertisements. All of the men in the room turn towards the now frantic boy while the man named Maxwell quickly tries to seal the wound. Due to the nature of the valve and the fact that it is connected directly to a series of major arteries he is unable to stymie the blood flow. In a matter of seconds, Vaughn begins to lose consciousness. The last thought that passes through his mind before the darkness grabs him is how he always worried that this valve might kill him. You poor child. Chapter 3. Meeting the Goddess Kleiska. Endless Path, Infinite Cosmos. In the seemingly infinite darkness, Vaughn's consciousness begins to stir. Memories from his life begin to cycle through like a reverse kaleidoscope within his mind. He experiences the moment of his death once again, every single experiment he was ever put through. All the thoughts, pains, emotions, and agony which had been locked away in his mind assault him anew. He begins to scream out with a voice that doesn't exist as the phantom pain pulses throughout his non-existent body, threatening to rob him of his existence. It hurts. Key events begin to get emphasized within his mind, taking the forefront of the kaleidoscope's focus. He remembers the time where the doctors had amputated his legs to keep him from moving around on his own. 
He remembers the group of scientists that tried to test his regenerative properties by cutting and burning segments of his skin. He remembers the time when he tried to commit suicide, only to have any semblance of freedom removed for his efforts. I don't deserve this. Nobody deserves this pain. As the events continue to cycle through his mind, the kaleidoscope slowly begins to dissolve from its edges. The pain which now encompasses his entire being begins to dull as his mind seeks reprieve within the comfort of oblivion. Why did I have to suffer so much, it's not fair. The kaleidoscope now begins to fragment, shattering into segmentary images which seem to exist outside the periphery of Vaughn's focus. Without directly observing each fragment, he is able to let the pain cease. I should have never been born. Vaughn lets his mind wander away from the images within the kaleidoscope. He begins to look within the encroaching darkness, something that causes a fundamental fear to resonate within his soul. I shouldn't even exist, what meaning did my life have? To be used as a tool for the benefit of others, I hate them. They should have been the ones to suffer, not me. Advertisements. The entire kaleidoscope fragments further, leaving only a few remnant images floating within the darkness. Vaughn continues to stare into the abyss, developing a sense of longing to contrast the fear. He refuses to stare at the images that only cause him pain. Each image slowly begins to fade away, and with it, Vaughn himself begins to fade. I just, wanted, to be free. Now only a single image remains within the darkness. Vaughn instinctually knows that if the image fades, everything that ever defined who he was, his very existence itself, would fade into nothingness. Finally, I don't have to suffer anymore. He closes what he imagines to be his eyes and awaits the coming oblivion. He feels no sense contentedness, only a solemnity far beyond anything a 14-year-old child should possess. After waiting for an indeterminate amount of time, an unease arises within Vaughn. He feels as though he had been waiting a long time, but no matter how much time passes he cannot cease to be. Within the darkness, a single image still remains, the last defining moment of his entire life the last bastion of the pain that defined his very existence. Finally succumbing to the unease within, Vaughn grits his teeth and looks towards the last image as if to acknowledge his pain for the last time. To his surprise, he sees a scene foreign to him, something outside the scope of his memory. There is no feeling of pain, only a longing, and a feeling of loss. He stares blankly into the image where a woman in tears cradles a young infant in her arms. Everything else within the scene is a blur, but the image of the woman remains perfectly vivid within the ambiguity. He feels an attachment to this woman, unlike anything he has ever experienced. His soul seems to cry out as the feeling of longing begins to overwhelm him. I will love you no matter what, Vaughn. Suddenly, the darkness shatters, and a now crying child lays on the ground bawling into a now infinite white space. He stares into the image that now encompasses his entire view as the woman smiles gently while rubbing his face. He watches as the strength in her body fails her, and the gentle sign of affection ceases as her hand falls. He screams as if in a testament to the very embodiment of suffering and loss. He recognizes this woman he has never met as his mother, the first and last person that ever truly loved him. He stares into the image that now encompasses his entire view as it begins to deteriorate from its edges. He screams and screams with an inhuman unwillingness to let the image fade. Mother, mother please, don't go please, don't leave me. He watches as the image begins to fade, reaching out but unable to grasp it until finally, the image disappears into nothingness. An emptiness far deeper than the black abyss he previously observed settles within him. Though the image within the kaleidoscope has faded, he adamantly refuses to let the memory escape from his mind. He sits within the vast white space, tears dripping from his face, as a silent cry escapes from his throat. The image of the mother he never had the opportunity to be with the becomes the only thing holding him into existence. You poor child. A voice sounds within the vast emptiness. Observing the young emaciated boy from above, it begins to descend upon him. You have experienced a suffering far greater than the average soul. Please, allow me to help you. The young boy sits, unmoving as he stares into the emptiness. The tears, now having run dry carve deep trenches within his skin. The voice, that had cried out in pain for so long, now a memory long forgotten. Please child, you have been sitting in this space for three years now, please, let me help you, I cannot bear to see you suffer so. The voice sighs, unable to stir the young boy that has earned its attention. It begins to reflect upon its previous actions, uncertain if it was the correct choice to bring the child's karma to an end, resulting in his death. 
But the boy has been calling out to them for so long, it believed its decision to be correct. It did not expect that while the child was observing the kaleidoscopic wheel of karma that his soul would be on the verge of dissolving. To prevent his soul from being lost to oblivion, the voice had created a route to anchor the child's soul to his final memory in hopes to salvage the situation. Little did it expect that its attempt was too successful, causing the child to become firmly attached to the memory even after it faded away. Now the child sits, unwilling to move forward, making it so that the voice itself is unable to leave this space. Her name was Adrienne, your mother. For the first time, the child stirs. She knew you know, that giving birth to you was bound to have complications. The child slowly turns towards the voice almost as if each words has a magnetic effect on his very soul. She was very sick you see. After she became pregnant, the doctors and her family encouraged her to get an abortion. They feared that the pregnancy itself would be too difficult, and even if she were to bring you to term it would probably result in her death. The child now stared fixedly at the source of the voice. Before him stood a very beautiful woman, with difficult to define features. Her hair was short and had the appearance of silvery liquid that refracted light. Staring directly into her face was almost impossible, as the features within seemed to constantly be shifting. She seemed both tall and short, fat but thin, and the clothing that garbed her seemed to be fused with what should have been her body. It almost seemed as if the body itself was comprised of feathers and dust. Regardless of what everyone told her, she was determined to give birth to you. It was her belief that every child deserved the opportunity at life, and she was willing to trade her own to ensure you were allowed that chance. The child seemed to draw tears from a previously expired source as he listened to the words of the woman, advertisements. She truly loved you. Even though you lived a life of suffering, you gave meaning to her sacrifice. I cannot ask you to be grateful to her, but I pray you're able to understand that your life had meaning. It was not born of convenience for other people, but out of a genuine expression of love and the desire you would live well. The child stared at the woman as she concluded her speech, watching, waiting for her to continue. After a time, he seemed to understand she was waiting for him to speak. He lowered his head, drying his eyes for the first time since his arrival. Who are you? The boy asked. The woman, a gentle smile appearing on her face looked to the child. I am Kleiska, the goddess of dreams. Chapter 4. Karma. Endless path, infinite cosmos. I am Kleiska, the goddess of dreams. The woman had a gentle expression as she looked into Von's eyes. He could see infinite darkness, similar to the abyss that had encroached upon his memories previously. Within that infinite darkness was countless images like stars floating within, like an amalgamation of events creating a view similar to a nebulous galaxy. Vaughn, I cannot deny you lived a very tragic existence, but know that the love and hopes your mother entrusted you will now become your power. What do you mean, my power? Vaughn asked in a confused manner. You see Vaughn, everything that a soul experiences in their life result in an accumulation of karma. This includes all events, both good and bad. The decisions they make, even how they deal with thoughts and memories during moments of introspection. Though you experienced a lot of negative karma from others, it did not increase your own. In fact, because you were the victim of the circumstances it resulted in a positive gain for you. And I know it may have been the cause of your suffering, but your unique bloodline had resulted in a total of 1,317,042 total lives saved over the course of 14 years. Vaughn was shocked. Even though he had learned to hate his own existence and inability to take action, even though he had blamed his accursed blood, even though he felt he was just a tool to be used at the convenience of others, he had in fact saved over a million people. A million people, me. 1,317,042. You shouldn't overlook the 317,042 lives Vaughn. Each and every one of them is an entire life credited to your existence and your mother's love for you. The child, Vaughn, looks down at the empty ground, seemingly lost in thought. I understand. Advertisements. Kleiska looked at the child who seemed to be in deep contemplation. He was so small and frail, it shouldn't have been his burden to save so many people. As I was saying Vaughn, even though you may not have intentionally done so, you were able to save 1,317,042 lives. Saving a single life could generate you a large amount of positive karma, and even true heroes typically only accumulate several thousand over the course of their entire lifetime. Because of this, 
you've accumulated far more than the required karma to obtain benefits after your death. It was because of this fact that I was able to hear your prayers and summon your soul to this space when you died. It's also the reason you have been able to persist in this space for the last three years without being pulled back into the cycle of reincarnation. Von's ears twitched at the word reincarnation. You mean people get to reincarnate? The goddess smiled at the boy's interest in the subject. Certainly Von. Every soul, including the bad ones, is able to undergo the cycle of reincarnation. Generally speaking, when the soul passes through what we gods refer to as the gate, their memories are wiped after being reviewed through the kaleidoscopic wheel of karma. Depending on the accumulated karma the soul would then be reborn among a variety of creatures, or sometimes even inanimate objects. For those who have accumulated a lot of positive karma, such as heroes, saints, and other legendary figures, they are able to retain part of, if not all, of their memories. A slash n, this sentence has a legendary amount of commas. The child's eyes seem to light up somewhat, as he looked towards the goddess with expectation. You mean to say that I'll be able to be reincarnated, and keep all of my memories? Indeed Vaughn. In fact, because you accumulated so much positive karma, there are a variety of benefits you have access to. Benefits, he asked, confused at the goddess's words. Yes. You see, in most cases, the cycle of reincarnation happens automatically, as it is one of the fundamental principles governing the multiverse. It is only in very rare circumstances that a god or goddess personally oversees a soul going through the cycle. It requires the soul to have accumulated more karma than the grade of the soul being assessed. As you come from the mortal plane in the third dimensional web, you are graded as having a tier 1 soul. Generally speaking, a tier 1 soul cannot accumulate positive karma exceeding 100,000 points. And how much positive karma have I accumulated? Vaughn asked inquisitively. The goddess, Kulsha, showed her biggest smile yet as the images in her eyes seemed to become more vibrant. 173,419,003. Vaughn was shocked. 173 million? I thought you said I only saved 1,317,042 lives. The goddess giggled with her hand covering her mouth. That is indeed correct Vaughn, and it's good that you're including the entire number when you speak. You see, even performing a simple act of kindness to someone can accumulate positive karma, so of course, saving a life would give you more. Ah, uh, I see. Yes. That makes sense. The goddess fixed her demeanor and continued. Certainly. And now let me explain the benefits I mentioned earlier. When a soul accumulates enough karma they are given the opportunity to meet with a god slash goddess before they reincarnate. Which god shows up depends on the desires of the soul, which in this case gives you me, Kleiska, the goddess of dreams. Because you had a powerful dream and constantly prayed, your voice was able to reach me. Now I can use my power to grant you a wish and give you the opportunity to select various benefits before your reincarnation into the next life. So tell me Vaughn, what is your wish? Vaughn paused for a moment and began to seriously consider his options. He thought about having various superpowers like flight or the ability to walk through walls. He thought about having an absolute strength or having the power to dominate others. As various thoughts went through his head, Vaughn realized that many of his desires reflected the negative experiences that he dealt with his entire life. He wanted abilities that allowed him to escape, abilities to punish the people that hurt him, abilities that would enable him to do whatever he wanted for the first time in his life. Is something wrong Vaughn? asked Kleiska, a grim expression on her face. The child looked directly at her with a deep hatred in his eyes. She could see in him, this child that has not an ounce of negative karma in his soul, an endless potential for darkness. A concern for this child's future began to deeply implant itself into her soul, until the child's expression suddenly relaxed. The darkness that seemed to permeate his entire existence seemed to have faded away, in its place a deep loneliness. I wish my mother were alive said the child looking deeply into her eyes as hope began to sprout in his. The goddess sighed, helpless to answer the child's desire. Following this, she observed as the boy developed a solemn expression. I am sorry Vaughn, but it is outside the right of any soul to request the alteration of a soul other than their own. Even though time passes differently for entities within this space, your mother has already returned to the gate. Everything that was her can now only be found within you. I cannot even see where she has reincarnated to nor can I alter her fate to allow her to be with you again. I can promise you this though, since she had given birth to you who was able to accumulate so much positive karma, 
She likely achieved the level of saint upon her death. She is likely living happily in another world with the hopes that you are living a healthy and happy life. After her speech, Vaughn seemed to relax, almost as if a heavy weight had been lifted off his shoulders. I see. I am happy as long as she is happy. The only thing I can wish for other than my mom is, I want to be free. I want the opportunity to live the happy life my mother would have wanted for me. I can ask for nothing greater. The goddess smiled once again, with a gentle, almost reminiscent look on her face. I am proud of your decision Vaughn. I will grant your wish and give you the most powerful tool to help guarantee your freedom. She reached into space and pulled an ancient looking orb out of the void. This is an artifact called the path. It is the core comprised of my divinity as the goddess of dreams. With it, you will have access to all words that exist within the dreams of creatures throughout the multiverse. That includes all the anime and manga you were so fond of. She said with a chuckle. You mean I will be able to go to any world I want to? The boy could barely contain his excitement. Eventually, yes. But, it will need time to grow alongside you. As you pass through various worlds you will be able to accumulate strength. That strength will be transmitted into the path and allow you more of the freedom you desire. One day, the path may even take you to the very time and place your mother resides. Vaughn was awestruck and couldn't even breathe for a few minutes. It almost seemed like his brain had completely shut off. Your time here is almost up Vaughn. The reason I had broken you from your earlier reverie was because the time available before your soul forcefully reincarnated was approaching. I, I see, said Vaughn. Can I choose the world I reincarnate to? The goddess nodded in affirmation. You just need to place the path into your heart. Once it merges with your soul it will give you the power to choose your destiny. Vaughn took the orb and placed it on his chest. Upon contact, it seemed to dissolve into his body and a warm feeling spread through his soul. Asterisk synchronizing with host, 1%, 37%, 100%. Initializing the path in accordance with host's records, 1%, 19%, 90%, 100% ding records verified. Please confirm records by thinking key phrase display records asterisk. Vaughn could hear an artificial voice speaking directly into his head. It was a very peculiar feeling unlike anything he had ever experienced. Before he was able to inquire, the goddess Kleiska interrupted his train of thoughts. Your time is up Vaughn. You will now be taken to the space contained within the path. I pray you are able to find happiness in your journey. Advertisements. He was shocked at her sudden announcement, but before he was able to respond. Asterisk detected host within unspecified. Forcibly removing host to prevent dispersion of soul asterisk. And with that notification, Vaughn disappeared from the endless white void. Kleiska stood silently staring into the space previously occupied by the child called Vaughn. She issued a silent prayer to gods greater than herself, hoping that his journey is able to heal the wounds within his heart. Chapter 5. The Path. Endless Path, Infinite Cosmos. A slash N. Warning this chapter might feel like an information dump since it goes over various aspects of the path as a system. I'll try to make sure to avoid having too many status slash skill descriptions in future chapters and instead post them in the compendium slash auxiliary chapters. Also, for the five beautiful people that voted, congrats. The first world will be Danmachi. Is is wrong to pick up girls in a dungeon. Next poll may include potential love interests. Vaughn felt a tugging force in his gut as the world around him seemed to collapse. After a brief, albeit incredibly disorienting experience, he finally arrived in the middle of a circular dais about 3m in diameter. With the sudden urge to vomit due to vertigo he was experiencing, Vaughn retched into empty space only to realize there was nothing to actually vomit. After dry heaving for a few moments, he was able to finally reorient himself and get a better understanding of his surroundings. He noticed that he was sitting, naked, on a featureless stone dais. The biggest surprise, which had previously gone unnoticed, was the fact that his limbs were still attached. For the first time in a decade, Vaughn stood up. My legs, they're not longer amputated. He jumped, yes jumped for the first time in years, exclaiming loudly into the infinite void surrounding the stone dais. I can't believe this, I actually have legs again. Asterisk affirmative. While the physical body of the host may have been damaged, the soul maintains the proper shape. As the host previously existed within the astral realm, his body was restored to the shape of his soul asterisk. Vaughn heard the synthetic voice within his head, almost as if it had been reminding him of its existence. Who are you? How are you speaking into my head? 
Are you the voice of the path which Kleiska gave to me? Advertisements. Asterisk I am the system created to act as an intermediary between the host and the path. As the host is incapable of understanding the functions of the path without assistance, the system was created as an auxiliary support for the host. The system exists alongside the path which had bonded with the host's soul, thus it can communicate directly with your conscience asterisk. I see, I think I understand a little. So you're going to help me use the path until I'm able to understand how to use it myself. Asterisk the host can indeed interpret my existence to that extent. Would the host like to initialize the tutorial function? Asterisk. Tutorial? I don't know what that word means. Said Vaughn ashamedly. Asterisk a tutorial is like a guide or a walkthrough. It will enable the user to understand each of the basic aspects currently made available through the system. The host also has the option of changing the system's name and form of address towards the host asterisk. Thank you for explaining things system. Can I call you? Let's see, how about sis? I don't think you have a gender, but I always imagined that an older sister is the best type to teach things to their brothers. You can call me Vaughn. I look forward to working with you in the future. A slightly more feminine, but still synthetic, voice rings inside Vaughn's head. Asterisk confirming name change from system to sis. Altering voice structure to match the expectations of host now referred to as Vaughn. Sis also looks forward to assisting you with any inquiries you may have in regards to its functions in the future. Would you like to initialize the tutorial Vaughn? Asterisk. Vaughn is slightly startled by the sudden changes in the system's voice, but is happy given its efforts. Thanks, sis. Please initialize the tutorial. Asterisk affirmative. Sis will now display a list of all available functions and their uses asterisk. Available functions. Status, shows a list of all numerical values that make up the host's physical slash mental slash spiritual attributes. Skills, shows a list of all available skills. The host can toggle skills on and off to activate slash deactivate their functions. Shop, shows a list of all available items. Items displayed are dependent on available records. Inventory displays a grid that allows the host to store items within the void. The host can store slash extract items using mental commands. The host can also equip items to pre-designated slots to immediately change equipment. Inventory size is limited to the growth of the host. Records shows a list of all available worlds and their difficulty. World difficulties range between 1 to 9, with 1 being mortal worlds similar to the host's origin universe. Caution it is highly recommended that the host avoid worlds beyond the level of his soul as it can result in a quick death. Asterisk Vaughn, you can view the specifics of each function by saying display function within your mind. It is recommended that you view your basic status before selecting a world from the list of records asterisk. During the massive number of notifications ringing within his brain, Vaughn had fallen onto his butt in the middle of the dais. He was suddenly very thankful for the existence of Sis since it would be difficult to keep track of all this information on his own. Thanks, sis, you're the best. You are very welcome Vaughn. Vaughn called display status within his mind, and a transparent blue window seemed to appear within his vision. Status. Name, Vaughn Mason, temporary. Age, zero, age does not exist in the soul state. Race, human, soul, sealed. Parameters, empty outside of record. Soul strength, tier one, mortal soul. Karma 0. Upon reviewing his status, Vaughn noticed that his karma was 0 instead of the astronomical number previously mentioned. Sis, what happened to my karma? Didn't Kleiska say I had like 179 million previously? Asterisk yes Vaughn, you previously had a positive karmic value of 173,419,003, but it was exchanged by the goddess Kleiska to allow you to possess the path. The path is a tier 9 artifact that has existed since the origin. It is normally impossible for a person with a tier 1, mortal soul, to be able to possess the path as it would place too much burden on their soul and potentially even destroy their soul root which would remove them from the cycle of reincarnation entirely. The goddess Kleiska seems to have imbued her divinity into the path to act as a limiting factor allowing your soul to activate the basic functions of the path. Your karma was used in exchange to grant your wish to have freedom. As your soul grows in strength, you have access to increased functions and higher tier records asterisk. Vaughn was stunned with the revelation of Sis. It would seem Kleiska put in a lot of effort to try and grant his wish. He gazes into the endless space surrounding the dais, almost as if he is searching for the sign of some presence. 
I will do my best to repay this gratitude, Kleiska. Affixing this vow within his heart, Vaughn calls the list of records into his mind. Display records. A list that seems to go on for an eternity begins to form in his mind, dazzling Vaughn. Vaughn, I would suggest filtering the worlds by places you are familiar with and based on the strength of your soul. While the list kept ever expanding within his mind, Sis seemed to throw out a lifeline. Display records limited to worlds I know of accessible by tier 1 souls. Records. Danmachi, 1 to 4. Fairy Tale, 1 to 3. Dash 1 Piece, 1 to 3. Fate slash Stay Night, 1 to 4, etc. As Vaughn perused through the list of records, he noticed he was unable to find the world he had considered going to. Display records for the world Naruto. Records. Naruto, 2 to 5. Oh, I didn't expect the Naruto world to require a soul level of 2 to enter. Do you know why that is sis? Analyzing. Asterisk it is due to the existence of the foreign energy known as chakra combined with the average difficulty of surviving within the world. As Naruto is a world with a feudal system and hidden villages, there is a high probability of being targeted early on and eliminated by forces within the world who possess high spiritual power. It is recommended that you increase your soul strength to at least level 2 which would allow you to have an easier time cultivating chakra and increasing your attributes within the world asterisk. I see, that kind of makes sense. Thanks for the explanation sis. Is there any record you would recommend for my first world? Asterisk certainly Vaughn. The display records function automatically lists worlds by relevance to your current soul strength, so I would recommend the record of Danmachi. It has a base requirement of tier 1, and if you are fortunate and put in a lot of effort you can strengthen your soul all the way to tier 4. Keep in mind that obtaining tier 4 would put you on the same level as the strongest beings in that world without their divinity asterisk. Hmm, but wouldn't fate slash stay night be a good option since it has similar requirements? Asterisk though the requirements are similar, it would be difficult to establish yourself in that world without using karma to overwrite the record of an existing character. Since you would have a difficult time having anyone teach you magic, and would be unable to take part in the Holy Grail War, it is advised to wait until you accumulate an adequate amount of karma before entering asterisk. Wait, you can use karma to overwrite the record of an existing character? Does that mean you would replace them? Vaughn was shocked at the idea. Asterisk that is correct Vaughn, but please note that the worlds created using records do not exist until you enter them. They remain in a form of suspended time which doesn't begin until the point you enter. Thus, assuming the role of a character would change the causality of that world without altering the timeline or events unless you directly change things. You would also inherit the memories of the character you replace asterisk. So the worlds I'm visiting don't exist? The people inside of them aren't real. Vaughn was a little dejected at the thought since it would almost feel like he is the only living person in the universe, of course, he is currently a soul. Asterisk that is incorrect Vaughn. Thus you are able to assume the role of the person within the record asterisk. Wait, sis, you skipped a part of the explanation. Asterisk that isn't possible Vaughn. If you were unable to hear the explanation it would be due to the restriction of your soul tier. Some information that governs the foundational laws of the multiverse cannot be explained or understood without accumulating a variety of experiences. Once you are able to strengthen your soul, you will naturally begin to understand what I was trying to explain to you. Just know that the people you will be interacting with are as real as those from your previous world. Though you may possess the path, it does not mean you are the protagonist of that world. There is a real possibility that you may die depending on the actions you take asterisk. I think I kind of understand sis. I will do my best to become stronger. And I won't look down on anyone like those cruel people did to me in my previous life. Asterisk that is for the best Vaughn. Giving into negative emotions and bringing harm to others would only result in the accumulation of negative karma which would restrict the growth of your soul asterisk. Understood sis. I think it's time to go. It doesn't seem like I can do anything in this empty space and I'm really looking forward to the opportunity of interacting with the characters I read in the manga. I hope I'm able to make a good impression on them. I don't really have any experience interacting with anyone outside the lab. Well, except for you and Kleiska, which is a little odd now that I think about it. Asterisk acknowledged. Would you like to use the item beginner's package to obtain a pertinent ability? Asterisk. Hmm? Beginner's package? What's that? Asterisk one of the items Kleiska had placed into your inventory before giving you the path was a special consumable that would give you a skill that would assist you on your first world. 
Please note that if you do not use the beginner's package it will be converted into the equivalent value of karma as the skill would have been worth upon entry into the world asterisk. Oh, then go ahead and use it. I hope it's something that will help in the record of Danmachi. Advertisements. Asterisk acknowledged. Opening beginner's package asterisk. Slash slash obtained system interface function. View affection. Be advised Vaughn, consuming the beginner's package will activate forced transmigration. What? Wait, are you sir? Before Vaughn is able to finish his sentence, he is once again gripped by a tugging motion in his stomach and forcibly transported away from the stone dais. Chapter 6. Within the Western Forests, One Half. Endless Path, Infinite Cosmos. Vaughn felt his soul being pulled through several layers of an unknown substance. It almost seemed as if had passed through various forms of liquids with different densities. As his momentum constantly increased, he became unable to breathe or orient himself as an endless multitude of colors flashed through his vision. Suddenly, the tugging force in his gut returned and Vaughn found himself laying in a clearing surrounded by trees. After looking around for a bit, Vaughn stood up and wiped the debris that was littering his clothing. Sis, what happened? Why did the transfer start so suddenly? You should have warned me before I used the beginner's package. Asterisk sorry Vaughn, but since you had asked me to use the beginner's package immediately after I had explained its function, I had to open it without being able to clarify. Remember, my purpose is to act as the intermediary between you and the path. I am unable to delay the execution of commands without your consent asterisk. Hearing the apologetic tone within Sis's voice, Vaughn felt slightly guilty for blaming her. It's alright Sis. It was my fault for making the decision so quickly without asking for your guidance. Asterisk don't let it bother you Vaughn. Would you like me to explain the current situation? Asterisk. Vaughn once again looked around the area before looking down at his own appearance. He seemed to be in a clearing surrounded by trees, which he could only assume was a forest. Instead of being naked, which he was grateful for, he was attired in a brown tunic with black pants. Around his waist was a belt with a strange leather container which, upon closer inspection seemed to contain water. The biggest thing to note was that the complexion that differentiated him from normal humans was replaced with a mild tanned skin tone. Yes, sis. Can you please explain what happened after the transfer? Why has my body changed, and where is this? Also, from now on please include any advice you believe would be beneficial to the situation. I don't trust myself well enough to make proper decisions in a new world. Asterisk after the transfer commenced, your body had to be reconstructed since you were just a soul. The path was able to alter your appearance to match the ideal you held within your own mind, as well as reconstruct the networks within your body to enable you to use the source energy within the record. Since you disliked your previous sickly complexion, you now possess a healthy body and what you consider a normal skin tone. Your body now possesses the ability to channel the source within this world, and if you practice you will even be able to use the magic and skills unique to this world. As for your present location, you are currently on the outskirts of the area known as the Western Forests. The path determined this would be the safest starting location, and it puts you in close proximity to Orario which can be found 30 kilometers to the southeast. As for advice, I would recommend you take the opportunity to review your status, skills, and inventory. After that finding shelter would be the highest priority asterisk. Advertisements. Vaughn was shocked at the barrage of information provided by Sis. He felt like his brain was going to melt trying to organize all the information he just obtained. Sis, I'm sorry, I don't think I can remember all that, said Vaughn with a tone of dejection. Asterisk it's alright Vaughn. To summarize things, you now possess a new, healthy body which fits your preferences as far as looks are concerned. Your current location is a forest near the city of Orario where the main story takes place. Other than that, please use the commands to display your status, skills, and inventory before seeking shelter asterisk. Okay, sis. Thanks for simplifying things a bit. My pleasure, Vaughn. Display status. Name, Vaughn Mason. Age, 14. Race, human, sealed. Parameters, Danmachi. Level 1, 0. Power, I-40. 0. Endurance, I-70, 0. Dexterity, I-23, 0. Agility, I-38, 0. Magic, H-120, 0. Soul Strength, Tier 1, Mortal Soul. Karma 100. Upon seeing his status, Vaughn frowned. Other than my magic, 
all of my other stats are low. And what are the second values for? Asterisk the second values would indicate the parameters shown on your status board when you manage to join a familia. As you have yet to join a familia, the total would be displayed as zero asterisk. That makes sense. Why is my magic stat so much higher than my other parameters? I've never been able to use magic, so shouldn't it be as low as the rest? That is due to the path altering your body to allow you to exist in this world. Vaughn continues to stare at the status for a moment when a few things catch his eye. Sis, why is my age set to 14? Didn't Kleiska say I had spent three years in that white space? And why are there two values for race? And didn't my karma reset to zero when I obtained the path? Asterisk since the soul is ageless, it did not change your age regardless of how much time you spent in the astral plane. When your body was reconstructed upon entering the record of Danmachi, it let you keep the age you had accumulated at your time of death. As for karma, while you were able to have a value of zero as a soul, you cannot exist in the world with zero karma as your existence automatically begins to alter fate around you. Upon birth, or in your case entering this world, a child would have 100 karma. Please note that the total value of karma includes both positive and negative values, asterisk. Vaughn was pleasantly surprised at the information. He had expected since he was going to reincarnate, that he would have to go through the process of being born and raised as a child. He didn't know how he would have dealt with being a child born into a family with the mind of a teen. I see, that's good. At least I can start training to become stronger immediately. And are you saying that if karma becomes zero, I would instantly die? Asterisk that is correct, but note that it is very difficult to lose karma. Even if you decided to do bad deeds, it would still result in a net gain but comprised more so of negative karma asterisk. Vaughn nods in understanding at the given explanation. Display skills. Though he had no expectations, Vaughn was surprised at what he saw. Skills. Chain breaker. Rank S. Status increases if the wielder is bound, sealed, or imprisoned. Increase is proportional to the stress of the user and desire for freedom. Pain tolerance. Rank A. The more damage the wielder sustains, the greater the effect this skill has on the mind. Does not inhibit pain, but prevents the wielder from being distracted by it. Yggdrasil's favor. Rank S. Your connection with the source enables you to vastly improve comprehension of healing skills and abilities. Increases success rate of alchemical products. Allows the user to imbue source energy into objects. Veil of the Traveler. Rank S. Prevents information about the user from being exposed by skills of lower rank without the wielder's consent. Increases the effect of concealment and stealth-related abilities. Development skills. Spirit healing. Rank D. Increases the recovery rate of mental energy and source. Wound transfer. Rank B. Transfer wounds to willing targets. Increases recovery rate on target. After reading all of his skills and their descriptions, Vaughn was confused. He couldn't understand how he had so many skills, given how low his stats were. Sis, why is it that I have so many skills, and aren't they very high ranking compared to my level? Asterisk Chainbreaker is the manifestation of your wish to live a free and happy life. When you obtained the path it gave you an equivalent skill that should transition with you when you move to other worlds. Pain tolerance is a result of your mental state and experiences in your previous life, I won't go into too many details for that. Yggdrasil's favor seems to be a blessing you received upon entering this record from the world's source. It should prove to be very beneficial for you while trying to become stronger and develop a profession. Veil of the Traveler was given to you by the path as a means of protecting your identity as a transmigrator. Though you may not have considered it Vaughn, it can prove to be very dangerous if people discover you arrived here from another world. As for spirit healing and wound transfer, those skills seem to be a result of dash. Asterisk. Ah, you omitted some information again. I guess my soul isn't strong enough to know that information yet sighed Vaughn. Asterisk so it would seem. I'm sorry Vaughn asterisk. It's fine, sis. It just gives me more motivation to grow and become stronger. So, to summarize what you had said, all of my skill are a result of my past experiences, and my soul seems to have retained them after I transmigrated to this world. Other than that, I should be very careful about exposing the fact I came from another world, is that correct, inquired Vaughn while contemplating the new information. Advertisements. Asterisk yes, Vaughn. For lower tier worlds that have no interactions with other planes, it is very dangerous to expose information of their existence. 
This world seems to be comprised of five different realms, but the mortal populace is only made aware of three of them. If you try to talk about the existence of other worlds, it could invite a backlash from the world's laws asterisk. Vaughn perked up at the mention of the word laws. What do you mean by laws, sis? Is that something that the gods made to help govern this world? Asterisk that is only partially true Vaughn. The laws of each respective record are things that maintain the stability of the record itself. Even the various gods and goddesses are bound by them, and may not even be aware of their existence. They can use their divinity to emulate the function of laws and pass them on to lower-tiered beings though. That is the biggest difference between mortals, demigods, and gods within many records asterisk. Vaughn was surprised that even the gods of this world were restricted so much. He could understand how divulging information about his previous life and experiences could bring about great harm to himself. After mulling things over for several minutes, he makes a personal vow to keep his past an absolute secret, at least until he is able to become strong enough to break free of the laws themselves. Chapter 7 Within the Western Forests, Two Halves Endless Path, Infinite Cosmos After cementing his newfound conviction deep within his heart, Vaughn continued inspecting the functions of the The Path. He noticed there was a new function labeled View Affection which he remembered obtaining from the Beginner's Package. He decided to inquire about how it's used later, but for not focused on his inventory as suggested by Sis. Vaughn stated within his mind, display inventory. Within his view, he could see a grid that, after counting, contained 27 empty spaces. To the left of the grid was a very rudimentary image of a human body with a total of 13 empty spaces. There was a single slot allocated to each of the, head, neck, torso, waist, legs and there were two spaces each for hands, feet, wrists, and fingers. He could see that everything he was currently wearing was displayed on the image of the man. Upon closer inspection, he noticed he could even view the details of the items. Three-layered wool tunic, brown. Rank, I, torso armor. Slots, zero. P.def, three, physical defense. M.def, one, magical defense. An insulated tunic that provides protection against the elements. Its three-layered function gives it basic waterproofing capabilities. Common linen trousers, black. Advertisements. Rank, I, leg armor. Slots, zero. P.def, two. M.def, one. A pair of trousers commonly worn by humans within the continent of Eden. A slash N, no pockets. Tempered leather belt, brown. Rank, H, waist armor. Slots, two. Decanter of replenishment. P.def, 1. M.def, 0. A belt made from the hide of a minotaur. Possess a moderate durability and can hold two attached items. Decanter of replenishment. Rank, B, auxiliary waste attachment. Special status, indestructible. A decanter made from a mysterious entity at the bottom of the ocean. Blessed by the goddess Amphitrite to replenish up to one liter of water per hour. Common sheepskin sandal, X2. Rank, I. Slots, 0. P.def, 1. M.def, 1. A common sandal that is worn by humans on the continent of Eden. Manufactured from sheepskin and hemp. Vaughn was surprised, especially at the information about the decanter of replenishment. With it, he didn't have to worry about finding a clean water source, and if he finds containers he can fill them with fresh water for bathing. As he continued inspecting what he recognized as his equipment, he noticed there was an icon in the bottom right corner of each equipment slot. It looked like two arrows which were following each other to draw a circle. When he thought about pressing it, what on earth? Vaughn exclaimed, noticing the tunic he was previously wearing was now gone, leaving him bare-chested in the clearing. He noticed that the slot was now empty with the faded image of the tunic behind it. When he thought of pressing it again the tunic immediately reappeared so I can freely wear and remove the items I've placed into the equipment slots. Asterisk that's correct Vaughn. I'm impressed you were able to find out on your own so quickly. You should also take note of the equipment slots for each of your hands asterisk. Taking the advice given by Sis, Vaughn noticed that there was a faded image behind each of his hand equipment slots. In the right slot, there was a dagger, while the left slot held a small hatchet. Toggling each, both the dagger and hatchet appeared in his hands. He inspected them. Common steel dagger. Rank, H. Slots, 0. P.ATK, 90, plus 10. M.ATK, 10. 
a dagger forged with a unique refining technique to give it increased durability. The blade has been polished thoroughly to give it increased attack power. Common steel hatchet. Rank, H. Slots, 0. P.ATK, 110, plus 10. M.ATK, 0. A hatchet forged with a unique refining technique to give it increased durability. The blade has been polished thoroughly to give it increased attack power. Gives an enhancement when felling wood. After reading their description, Vaughn weighed each of them within his palms. The dagger was relatively light, even for Vaughn, and it had an excellent balance even though the blade was about 20 centimeters. The hatchet was much heavier, which was the likely reason for its increased physical attack prowess. He noted that the blade was only about 13 centimeters long with a thickness of around 4 centimeters tapering into a wedge along its blade ridge. He also experimented with swapping the two items between his hands and noticed it immediately updated within his equipment slots. This is so cool, remarked Vaughn as he toggled the equipment over and over, watching as it vanished and reappeared instantly within his hand. Ahem. Vaughn was surprised at the sudden coughing sound within his mind, resulting in him dropping the dagger onto the ground. Since he was so focused on toggling the icon, he noticed that when he dropped the dagger the image within the slot vanished. Picking up the dagger, Vaughn remarked, Sorry about that sis. It's just really cool seeing something disappear and reappear like that. It's almost like a magic trick, and I just got distracted. In an almost apologetic sounding tone, he heard sis reply, Asterisk that's fine Vaughn, but remember your priorities. Right now it is around 3 p.m., so you need to begin looking for shelter and food before the sun sets asterisk. Yes, sis. Thank you for your reminder. But what happens when the sun sets, inquired Vaughn while looking at the bright orb floating within the sky. Asterisk, when the sun sets, the world becomes dark making things difficult to see. It's also when dangerous, nocturnal creatures begin hunting for food. If you are unable to find shelter before the sun sets it will become very dangerous when you're wondering about, much less trying to sleep asterisk. Vaughn was shocked at the information. Since he had spent his entire life indoors, he had never seen what the actual sun and moon look like. All the information he had about he came from manga and anime, where even though it was slightly darker everyone seemed to be able to see and move about freely. Advertisements. I understand. I'll begin looking for shelter immediately, but, where should I begin searching? I've never been in a forest before, so should I start heading towards Orario? Maybe I can find some of the characters from the story, or even join a familia and start my journey. As his excitement began to build, he was once again alarmed by what Sis said next. Asterisk that will be impossible at present Vaughn. Even though 30 kilometers isn't that far, you wouldn't be able to make it there before the sun sets. There is also the fact that entering the city requires money, so without items to trade or barter you would be unable to gain entrance to the city. But the most important factor is that many of the characters from the story may not even be in Orario at the moment asterisk. What do you mean Sis? Why wouldn't they be there? Asterisk it is due to the fact you entered this world without designating a point and time of entry. To compensate for this, the path determined it would be most optimal for you to arrive here in the outskirts of the western forests. As for the reason characters may not yet be in Orario, that is because you are presently three years from the start of events in the story. Asterisk. Chapter 8. First Blood, New Home. Endless Path, Infinite Cosmos. As for the reason characters may not yet be in Orario, that is because you are presently three years from the start of events in the story. Vaughn kept repeating the words over and over within his mind, unable to comprehend the revelation Sis just gave him. Sis, why is it three years? I understand it's my fault for not specifying a time, but what should I do now? I don't know anything about this world outside of what I had read in the manga, he shouted. Asterisk relax Vaughn. The path determined that your current strength was lacking for residents of this world. As it stands, a common thug would probably be able to take advantage of and even kill you. At best you would likely become an underling or supporter for disreputable adventurers. Without having increased your own strength, it would be difficult to join and survive within a familia. You now have three years to train before the events of the story so you can be more impactful in your decision-making asterisk. Vaughn took several deep breaths, ruminating over what Sis had said. He understood by looking at his stats, most of his parameters were far below the record standards. There wasn't much he could do about that since he was never able to exercise or move freely in his previous life. And, 
since he didn't wish for any power from Kleiska, he would have to rely on his own efforts to become stronger. After thinking it over, he started to develop feelings of gratitude towards the end. It seemed to be making the best possible choices given his current lack of understanding. It also provided him with a companion he could talk to when he is feeling lonely. I understand, sis. The path was right to give me this window of opportunity to grow. Even I wouldn't want to accept someone into my familia if they were to become a burden. At least until I become much much stronger. He begins to look around the area once again. It's his first time seeing a real life tree, much less being in a forest. After weighing his options, he is uncertain of the best course of action. Sis, where do you think I should go? I don't have a map, and I've never been inside a forest. I don't know any edible plants, and the wildlife of this world is completely foreign to me. Asterisk the path has a basic mapping function which includes a compass. Though it can only map things within your line of sight, it will allow you to compile a map within the system of the path. I would suggest heading north. Note that when you first entered the world the path was able to make a basic map of the landmarks in your immediate vicinity for 50 kilometers. About 2 kilometers north, you should be able to find rock formations and water, which has a high probability of providing access to a cave which would be highly beneficial for your current situation. You can access the map by using the command toggle map or toggle minimap asterisk. Advertisements. After the explanation, Vaughn tried using both commands. He noted that toggle map showed a very large bird's eye view of the surrounding area. He could even see a large portion of the western section of Orario, though the buildings were presently unmarked. To the north, a distance that didn't seem that far, he was able to spot the rock formations Sis had previously mentioned. Considering that much of the surrounding area was dense trees, he agreed it would be the best choice. He closed the map using a mental command, and then tried toggle minimap. Within the peripheral of his sight, he could see a circular, somewhat transparent map, much smaller than the one he had used previously. It also showed his line of sight as a cone emitting from the arrow within the center of the map. He noted that, whenever he turned to look at objects they were immediately updated on the minimap, enabling him to see their presence even when turning away. This is going to be a useful function. As long as I have this, any place I've been to I'll be able to return to without getting lost. But won't this be incredibly overpowered when I finally enter dungeons? Though he didn't mind taking advantage of all the features provided by the path, Vaughn didn't like the ingenuous feeling lingering in his heart. Asterisk you don't have to worry about that Vaughn. Many of the dungeons within this world are similar to living creatures. They are able to change their layout and alter their structure over time. Though you will definitely have an advantage in general mapping capabilities, it isn't to the extent where it will allow you to far exceed others. After all, anyone could draw up a map as they progress into the dungeon, it just takes more time compared to the map function of the path asterisk. Vaughn was convinced by what Sis had said. He also understood that focusing on the map could distract him from things happening around him. Though he could mentally move the map around using his thoughts, it did take up a part of his vision. He began walking towards the northern direction. On his way, he made sure to look around his vicinity while trying to map everything he could see. Periodically he would use the toggle map command to see the larger map. He noticed he was able to zoom in on the areas he had traversed, and the area of focus now had all the details he had mapped using his minimap. Though the area of the rock formation was only 2 kilometers away, Vaughn noted that it was very physically demanding to move through the forest. His clothes would constantly get stuck on the various plants and shrubbery, and he began to develop rashes around the scrapes that began to accumulate on his arms and face. It took him an entire two hours to finally arrive at his destination, and he noticed that the sky was beginning to darken. On his minimap, he could see that the cone that depicted his line of sight had begun to shrink and it became more difficult to map things as he progressed through the rock formations. After another half hour of searching, as the sun continued its descent, Vaughn finally found a small cave near a creek. As he approached to investigate, he heard strange noises coming from the shrubbery to his left. He could feel the hair on the back of his neck stand, as a cold sickening chill crept down his spine. Turning towards the source of the noise, Vaughn froze. Standing around 10 m away, there stood a small emaciated green-skinned humanoid. The upper half of his body seemed to be covered in a leathery hide, while the bottom was entirely covered with dense fur. Its height was slightly under one meter, and its physique was similar to that of a small child. Vaughn could see within its vicious red eyes a ferocity that shook him to the core. The monster, 
which Vaughn recognized as a goblin, looked directly into his eyes. It seemed to understand the terror he inspired as it slowly began to walk towards Vaughn, waving a short serrated knife that seemed to be carved from stone. 10 meters, 9 meters, 8 meters, as the goblin continued its approach Vaughn stood absolutely still, unable to muster any thought of fighting or fleeing. Though he had spent his entire life in a lab having horrible experiments performed, he had never been in a combat situation. Though the eyes some of the researchers used to look at him were similar to the goblin before him, it was nowhere near as vicious. Vaughn knew, this goblin genuinely wanted to kill him. 7 meters, 6 meters, just as it began to reach the halfway point, Sis suddenly shouted out within his mind. Asterisk Vaughn, equip your weapons? The goblin has higher agility than you, so you have to fight back. You need to take the initiative or it will be too late. Asterisk. Vaughn immediately snapped out due to the sudden exclamation from Sis. Just as he was about to equip his weapons, the goblin seemed to have sensed his change and immediately lunged at him, aiming the small knife directly at his throat. Vaughn twisted his neck back as quickly as he could, raising his arms to protect his face. The goblin continued its lunge, impaling the small knife directly in Vaughn's left arm before pulling it away, tearing away at his flesh due to the serrated qualities of the blade. Because of the sudden impact, Vaughn was knocked off balance as a sharp pain coming from his left arm sent alarms ringing in his head. Asterisk Vaughn, you need to get up quickly. If you don't equip your weapons you won't be able to fight back. Asterisk. Vaughn scrambled back, trying to right his footing as the goblin began to prepare another lunge. He crouched down, this time aiming towards Vaughn's torso before jumping out at with murderous momentum. Catching the goblin's movements in his eye, Vaughn's mind felt a cooling sensation spread seeming to dull the effects of the pain emitted from his left arm. He mentally tried to equip both of his weapons, causing the dagger to appear in his right hand while his left hand remained empty. Using the clarity brought about by the cooling sensation, Vaughn shifted his weight and tried to use his now disabled left arm to absorb the oncoming lunge. Once again, the goblin's knife pierced into his already mangled flesh. It lifted its foot to try and kick off of Vaughn's torso, using the leverage generated to rend the knife from the arm. Vaughn used the brief window before the goblin is able to recover to throw all of his weight into the small-statured creature. Taken by surprise due to the young boy's movement, the goblin tried to back away and create a distance between it and the human standing before him. The moment it began to open the gap, it saw from the left side of its vision the shadow of a dagger aiming directly at its temple. Due to the previously generated momentum of its lunge, the goblin was unable to change directions in time and could only watch helplessly as the lethal strike approached. Completing his strike, Vaughn fell powerlessly on the now dead goblin. The moment he touched the ground, he could feel a painful throb coming from his left arm, which he was now unable to move. He could feel the sickening flow of his blood as it left his body, reminding him of the thousands of similar times he felt it in his previous life. The cooling sensation in his mind began to become more powerful, and Vaughn was able to notice his heart, which was previously beating rapidly due to the flooding of adrenaline, was now beginning to slow. As he lay on the ground atop the corpse of his first kill, he began to take deep and heavy breaths. He knew that goblins were among the weakest creatures in this world, and had he failed to land the blow at the expense of his left arm he most likely would have died, bringing an end to his journey before it even started. He began to lament at his powerlessness, as a fierce desire to become stronger awakened deep within the core of his being. Mustering what strength remained in his body, Vaughn stood up, hunched over. He began to hobble towards the entrance of the cave, praying that the interior might offer him safe haven through the coming night. He followed the entrance and continued onwards for about 20 meters before the cave suddenly opened up. Vaughn noted quickly that the cavern was about 8 meters in diameter, and the walls were studded with small crystals that emitted a weak light which brought a mild illumination to the dark interior. Vaughn cuddled up next to the brightest crystal in an effort to use its light to examine his wound. Suddenly, his thought process was once again brought to an immediate halt. As he looked at the blood dripping from the wound on his arm, Vaughn couldn't help but feel a peculiar sensation, like butterflies within his stomach trying to bore their way out. The blood dripping from his arm was a deep crimson, a stark contrast from the pale golden-colored blood that haunted him in his previous life. Inspecting the wound, he could see through the mangled flesh severed blood vessels and tendons, which helped explain why he was now unable to move it. Luckily the knife was small and didn't break any bones. Asterisk yes, but you need to wash the wound and apply pressure quickly. 
Goblin daggers are usually unclean, and the wound they cause, if left untreated could fester and even result in death, asterisk. Vaughn followed her instructions as he flushed the wound using the decanter of replenishment. He also made sure to drink several mouthfuls himself to prevent passing out and developing a fever due to dehydration. As someone who was very experienced with dealing with blood loss, Vaughn knew several of the important steps in treating wounds. It was just the fact that others typically dealt with any injuries he sustained that caused him to slightly overlook it. After cleaning and dressing the wound using a strip he had cut from his tunic, Vaughn found a relatively flat area within the cavern to lay down. He noticed that the crystals within the cavern not only produced light, but they also emitted a very moderate amount of heat which kept the interior of the cave warm. As he lay back staring at the top of the cavern, he began to fantasize that each of the crystals was the various records within the path. He imagined traversing through the worlds, becoming stronger, meeting both friends and enemies, and eventually even finding his mother. As he began to drift off into unconsciousness, one final thought came to Von's mind which he felt an urge to speak aloud. Advertisements. I'm dying, Blay. Rip. The end. A slash N. Just kidding next part is the real quote. I'm home. He whispered into the cavern as sleep overtook him. Chapter 9. Training begins. Endless path, infinite cosmos. Vaughn awoke several hours later with a powerful lethargy settled within his body. It was similar to the times when he was very young and the doctors had been a little too ambitious and had drawn too much blood from his body. How long have I been asleep sis? Asterisk it's been 14 hours Vaughn. It is currently 8 colon 21 am asterisk. 14 hours. Sighed Vaughn as he made an effort to stand. It took several tries, but eventually, he had managed to upright himself, albeit with a lot of difficulties. He put his hand along the cavern wall and began to make his way towards the exit. Noises made by a stomach when you haven't eaten a single bit of food your entire current life. Vaughn removed his hand from the wall, leaning his body against its cold surface. He uses his free hand to massage his stomach in an effort to soothe its hunger pangs. Sis, what do you think I should do for food? With my injured arm, I don't think I'll be able to hunt easily. I need food to recover my strength or my arm won't heal easily. Mentioning his arm, Vaughn took a better look at it. He noticed the blood hadn't spread nearly as much as he expected. Perhaps the waterproofing qualities of the tunic managed to stimmy the flow of blood. Asterisk I would recommend picking various plants and berries. One moment, I've marked areas on your map that you had passed previously. Though I cannot say at present which are edible, the path is able to analyze and identify the properties of items placed within. It may take time for higher quality items, or items that possess magic, but it should be able to easily identify if something is edible asterisk. Vaughn sighed, this time with a bit of relief in his voice. That's great sis. It makes sense that the path would be able to make up for my lack of survival skills and information. Though the fact my inventory can analyze items seems pretty incredible, the fact it shows descriptions of my equipment should have been an indicator of that capability. Advertisements. He makes his way out of the cave and looks towards the area where he had previously slain the goblin. The body seems to have vanished overnight, and the only evidence of his mortal struggle was the small knife, a dull crystal that emitted a small light, and his blood which had dried into the ground. Vaughn walked over, once again drawn to the presence of his own blood. He noted that it had not turned to ash, even though it had been outside of his body for so long without being stored. Most importantly is the fact that the blood, like the stains on his makeshift bandage, was a deep crimson red. Sis, when my body was reconstructed, was my blood changed as well? He inquired after thinking of the best method to ask. Asterisk that is not entirely correct Vaughn. Though I can't go into the details of what exactly happened, your blood still possesses similar qualities to what you had in your previous life. The primary difference is the existence of source energy within this world, whereas your previous world had nothing comparable. Eventually, your blood will dissolve into dust, but the process will take much longer since the source energy maintains its vitality for an extended duration asterisk. Vaughn was somewhat disappointed with her response. He had hoped that the changes to his body would make him normal. Noticing his demeanor, Sis remarked, Asterisk Vaughn, the uniqueness of your blood isn't something to be ashamed of. It is the fault of those that tried to use you for their own convenience that has caused you to feel this way. Remember, your blood is something that only exists because your mother had been willing to birth you even knowing it would likely result in her death. You should see your blood as the embodiment of her love for you, 
and use it and all its benefits to assist you in your growth asterisk. Startled, Vaughn raised his head and looked towards the sky. Gripping his hands, he cursed inside himself at his weakness even though he had sworn to become strong. You're right sis. They used my blood to do whatever they want, but now I have the opportunity to use it as I see fit. I will show them their foolishness, by living freely and saving even more people than their cruelty allowed. Hyper-aggressive omega tear stomach rumbling sounds. With a blush on his face, Vaughn began to move into the forest to investigate the areas marked on his map. After gathering several different types of herbs, nuts, and berries, the system had managed to identify those that were edible. Since he had no methods to create a fire, he was forced to use stones to crack the nuts so they could be digested. It turns out, eating with a single hand is quite difficult, but it's amazing what you're able to do when starving. Vaughn spent until 5 p.m. solely gathering any interesting or unidentified items he could find. He even collected various types of rocks and minerals in hopes the system would be able to analyze them over time. His progress was halted periodically since he made an extra effort to investigate his surroundings before moving on. He knew that if he were to be attacked by a monster at this time, it would likely be the last fight before his death. Eventually, he made his way back to the cave before sunset and took note of the day's harvest. Display Inventory Small-sized Rock X3, Medium-sized Rock X1, Acorns, 3 kgs, Apples X49, Mulberries X103, Tayberries X98, Uncount Mineral X1, Unknown Mineral X1, etc. He was grateful that the inventory allowed him to store similar items within the same slot. It was only when the object had unique qualities that it seemed to separate them, such as in the case of the unknown minerals. He was also informed by Sis that items within the inventory didn't spoil, which was his original motivation for collecting so many different things. He was also able to fashion a sling for his arm after cleaning and changing the bandages. To his surprise, when the bandage was removed he was able to clearly see that it had begun to heal. There was also a slight tingling sensation traveling through his wrist, and when he made an effort he was able to wiggle his fingers slightly. After inquiring with Sis, he learned that it was due to the secondary effects of his blood, combined with the skill Yggdrasil's favor. Even though he hadn't learned any healing skills, it was able to enhance the effects of his blood and accelerate his natural healing. After scanning his body, Sis even informed him that his blood had completely prevented any possibility of infection from occurring, something which he should have known from his previous experiences. It seemed like Sis had been a little flustered at the time when she had urged me to tend to the wound, and that thought made him a little happy. After 10 days Vaughn was surprised to learn his left arm had completely recovered. Now there was just a light scar tissue as the only proof the wound ever existed, and even it had begun to fade. Confirming he had stored an adequate amount of food during the 10 days, Vaughn started considering methods to become stronger. Sis, is there any way I can improve my stats without fighting monsters? I don't want to have to sacrifice body parts just to be able to kill a single goblin. I would recommend converting the crystal you had obtained from the goblin, as well as the iron and copper ore you had found into origin points. Before he could ask, Sis continued. Asterisk origin points, or op for short, is the currency that can be used to exchange for items using the system function shop. Please note that not all items can be converted into points and converting items that do not belong to you requires a great deal of time and will result in the accumulation of negative karma asterisk. Vaughn nodded his head in response. I don't want to rely on stealing from others to grow strong anyways. People that take advantage of others are the type I hate the most, so I want to avoid becoming a person like that. Display shop. Similar to when he had used the display records function, a seemingly infinite list of items and their cost began to appear within his mind. Without being prompted, Vaughn quickly made a mental command to only display items suitable for his soul tier. He noticed in the top left of the screen a value called op, which was currently displayed with a domineering zero points. After sorting through his inventory a bit, he found the only items that could be converted through the shop were the crystal and ores previously mentioned by Sis. After asking, Vaughn learned that the shop used the source energy found within the objects to create the origin points. After using a mental command for the exchange, the items turned into a dust so fine that it seemed to vanish into the air itself. The crystal had been exchanged for a total of 17 points, while the ores both sold for 5 op per kilogram respectively. Since he had accumulated a fair amount over the last 10 days, 
He managed to have a total of 47 points after the exchange concluded. After setting a filter for items that could improve his strength that cost less than 50 points, Vaughn was annoyed to say the list was still very large. Sis, what should I exchange for using my points? I need something that can help me grow stronger in a short period of time to remove the risk to my life while living in this area. Asterisk many of the items in the current list can only increase your stats for a short period of time. Some of the stronger ones even have side effects that could damage your foundation, which would make it harder for you to grow stronger. I would recommend you exchange 30 op for 3 vials of body tempering liquid. You should also exchange 15 op for a beginner close quarters combat techniques manual. The remaining 2 points can be saved for now, or you could exchange them for simple linen mat and cracked firestone to make living in the cave more comfortable asterisk. Okay sis, I trust your judgment. Please purchase all of the recommended items, including the mat and cracked firestone. Asterisk acknowledged, purchase complete. Items have been automatically added to your inventory Vaughn Asterisk. Vaughn looked into his inventory and read the description of each item, as he was unable to see any information prior to the purchase. This is also the reason he was unaware of the temporary, and even negative effects of some items. Body tempering liquid. Rank, D. Use can be mixed into bath water. Soaking in the water after strenuous training accelerates recovery speed and promotes the strengthening of bones and muscles. Caution causes immense pain. He shuddered a little bit at the causes immense pain description. Beginner's Close Quarters Combat Techniques Manual. Rank, E. Use, gives the user knowledge about close quarters combat techniques and auxiliary body training methods. The mat and firestone were self-explanatory but Vaughn was confused by how to use the techniques manual. After inquiring about it from Sis, it seemed to be a consumable item that could be placed into his chest similar to the path. Upon using the manual, a rush of information flood Vaughn's mind. Images of various people performing martial arts and training cycled through his vision for roughly two hours until he passed out. Unfortunately, he was unable to use the mat he had just purchased and ended up sleeping on the hard floor. After awakening the following day with a mild migraine, Vaughn organized the information in his mind and decided to put it to use. He asked Sis to create a training regimen that would allow his body to improve unilaterally. After reviewing it for about half an hour, Vaughn was satisfied as it had accounted for his rate of growth and became more difficult as time progressed. He spent the first week performing basic physical exercises and stretching routines. He would awaken in the morning at sunrise. After half an hour of stretching, he would begin running around the around the largest rock formation in the area for about an hour. Though he wasn't able to run quickly, he noticed that his stamina was increasing rapidly due to the effects of his blood on his recovery. After finishing his run, he would bathe in a pool he had dug from the main flow of the creek. He had filled the pool with various crystals he had dug out of the cave, so it always maintained a moderate temperature even in the mornings. Following his bath, he would begin foraging in the woods to increase his food store since Sis had warned him about the dangers of winter. Around noon he would begin his real workout. He spent another 30 minutes stretching before lifting rocks of different weight and moving them between two circles he had drawn out on the ground. The circles were 20 m apart, and the exercise didn't end until he managed to move all the rocks from one point to the other. After this, he would be completely exhausted, and all the muscles in his body would protest against each movement. Fortunately, with the pain tolerance skill, he was able to work through the pains and finish the exercise. Using some of the points that he had obtained by trading in various ore found within the creek, Vaughn had managed to buy a metal basin which he stationed outside the entrance of the cave. He had originally wanted to use the body tempering liquid in the pool he had dug, but Sis informed him that the essence would drain through the rocks into the ground. After emptying one of the vials of body tempering liquid into the basin, the once transparent water became turbid and evil boiled slightly. Using his leather belt as a gag, Vaughn would submerge himself into the basin. The moment his foot touched the liquid, it felt as if the blood within his body became thick, stagnant, and heavy as lead. Gritting his teeth, he continued to submerge his body as the feeling spread to each area the water came into contact with. By the time the liquid had reached up to his neck, his body had begun to convulse slightly as a result of the pain racking his body. It was at times like this that Vaughn actually hated the pain tolerance skill because even though it prevented the pain from distracting him, it actually made the experience worse since he was able to easily focus on the pain as it spread. 
he would periodically submerge his head while holding his breath, repeating the process over and over until his body was able to absorb the full medicinal effects of the liquid. Vaughn continued this process for the entire 10 days until Sis informed him that the body tempering liquid would no longer have an effect. He would have to buy higher quality medicines if he wanted to continue, but she advised against it since building a foundation using medicines could lead to problems in his growth later on. Advertisements Vaughn was fine with this, as no matter how much time he spent in the basin it never got any easier. Display skill pain tolerance Pain tolerance Rank S the more damage the wielder sustains, the greater the effect this skill has on the mind. Does not inhibit pain, but prevents the wielder from being distracted by it. Gives a slight increase to attack power based on pain threshold. Chapter 10. Hunting, Second Blood. Endless Path, Infinite Cosmos. As the body tempering liquid had lost its effect, Vaughn was curious as to how much his body had grown within the 10 days. Display Status. Name, Vaughn Mason. Age, 14. Race, human, sealed. Parameters, Danmachi. Level 1, 0. Power, I-40, 0, dash H-146, 0. Endurance, I-70, 0, dash G-203, 0. Dexterity, I-23, 0, dash I-95, 0. Advertisements. Agility, I-38, 0, dash H-153, 0. Magic, H-120, 0. Dash H130, 0. Soul Strength, Tier 1, Mortal Soul. Karma 108. Though it had only been 20 days since his arrival in this world, Vaughn was happy to see many of his stats had increased by more than 100 points, with the exception of his magic. His hard training was able to bring at the full effects of each use of body tempering liquid which was able to increase each physical parameter by 10 points if used with maximum efficiency. His daily running and weight contributed to the remaining gain. Vaughn was now ready to move on to the next phase of his training. He would replace his early morning regimen with hunting. It had already been several weeks since his arrival in this world, and surviving on nuts and fruits wasn't exactly satisfying. Since he now had a firestone, he was determined to hunt some small game to obtain meat. He also thought it would be a good method to make money before he entered the city since he would be able to clean the furs for barter. He had now saved up a total of 29 op, which he had used 10 to exchange for a manual on basic trap making. Using 9 of the remaining points Vaughn bought several small traps and wires to set up in the various small trails that lined the forest. He then exchanged the last of his points for a new bow, sunkissed you short bow. Rank, C. Slots, 1. P.ATK, 60 plus 150, X30. M.ATK, 0. A small bow made of flexible you wood. It had undergone a special ceremony during its crafting which causes it to emit a gentle warmth a smell similar to sunlight. Twined Steel Arrow X30. Rank, D. Slots, 0. P.ATK, 150. M.ATK, 0. Arrows forged from steel that have been twined around a U-shaft giving them both flexibility and penetrative power. Vaughn was grateful that purchasing the bow had given him arrows. Immediately after he had made the purchase, he thought of the possibility he would have to collect more ore before he would be able to make use of it. The best thing about the arrows was that he was able to assign them to the slot of the bow within his equipment slots allowing him to immediately knock an arrow with a thought. Using his newly acquired skills and equipment, Vaughn set out into the woods around his home. He tried making sure all of the traps were within 200 meters of his camp so he would be able to check them periodically throughout the day. As it was still early in the morning, the sun had just begun to crest over the trees, casting long shadows through the misty forest. Vaughn stalked patiently through the woods, looking for areas that seemed to have heavy animal foot traffic. He wasn't accustomed to hunting, but with the assistance of Sis he was able to quickly identify the best locations using the analytical ability of the path. The best part of it all was that he was able to clearly mark where he had lain the traps using his the marking function of his minimap. After another hour or so, as the early morning mist began to disp Urs Vaughn found his first target. About 30 meters from his position, near the edge of a clearing, sat a rabbit nibbling on a plant Vaughn had previously identified as alfalfa. He slowly crept towards the rabbit while holding his breath, trying to conceal his presence as best he could. As he closed in on the rabbit's position, it almost felt as if he had begun to blend into the environment around him, and even his thought process started to fade 
becoming one with the forest. In this peculiar state of mind and being, Vaughn was able to close to within 10 meters of the rabbit without startling it. Slowly, he got his bow into position and knocked an arrow with a simple thought. He took aim at the rabbit and held his breath, bringing his focus to its absolute limits. He pulled back the arrow and in a single smooth motion, let it loose at his prey. Sound of arrows whistling far off the intended course. The rabbit was startled by the sudden interruption to its meal and immediately bolted into the nearby bush line. Aw oh man, I got so close and still missed, exclaimed Vaughn as he fell onto his butt feeling defeated. Asterisk of course Vaughn. Not only have you never fired a bow before, but you lack the training and skills to be able to hit small targets at a distance. You should set up targets near home to accumulate experience. There is also the option of trading in for a hunting techniques manual once you've accumulated more up asterisk. Hearing her reminders, Vaughn couldn't help but agree that he had been a little too hasty. After spending about 20 minutes looking for the arrow that had flown astray, Vaughn returned to his camp and added archery training to his midday regimen. The same afternoon, Vaughn had trekked back into the forest to check if any of his traps had been triggered. As he had previously marked them in the map, it was a relatively simple job to locate them. The first three traps had been empty, so Vaughn had to reset them. It may have been that the creature was larger than the trap could hold, or something was able to move through the snare without getting caught in it. On his way to check the remaining tracks, Vaughn was brought to a halt by a noise that seemed to come from the direction of one of his snares. He began to slowly stalk towards the trap in anticipation of his first catch. Once again he began to feel as if his body was blending into the surroundings, and he was able to easily approach his destination without drawing attention to himself. Finally, he was able to clearly see what was caught in the trap. Standing slightly under one meter, with its leg stuck in the snare was a goblin. The wire used in the trap had dug deeply into the flesh around its ankle, and the goblin seemed to lack the intelligence required to escape. Vaughn could feel his pulse begin to accelerate, as thoughts of his previous encounter with the goblin emerged from the back of his mind. He knew the danger such a creature posed, even though it was one of the weakest in the entire continent. Fortunately, this goblin didn't possess a knife similar to the last one, or it would have cut the wire to aid in its escape. Releasing a sigh, Vaughn moved even closer to the goblin which seemed to become aware of his presence as it looked towards his direction. The goblin began to lash out, completely ignoring its still snared leg and tried to lunge at Vaughn. The snare tightened, pulling the goblin directly into the ground once it had been stretched taut. The goblin began to struggle, repeating the process of standing and falling while continually trying to lunge at Vaughn with its characteristic viciousness. Advertisements Vaughn approached within a single meter of the goblin, just out of reach of the range of its lunge. He slowly drew back his bow with an arrow already knocked, aiming directly at the head of the goblin. Perhaps realizing what was about to happen, the goblin ceased its struggling and looked up at Vaughn, an unforgiving hatred preset within the gleam of its eyes. Releasing the arrow, it penetrated directly between the still glaring eyes as the body of the goblin spontaneously turned to dust leaving behind a small crystal in its wake. Picking up the crystal, Vaughn released a repressed sigh. This encounter with the goblin was far different than his previous struggle of life and death. He had been in control of the entire situation, and even though the goblin was trapped, Vaughn was able to face it directly and overcome the fear that had settled in his mind. Looking into the now silent woods, as the sun began its decline towards the horizon, Vaughn added a new goal within his training menu. Other than hunting game, he would begin subjugating the various monsters that could be found within the forest. He wanted to become strong enough that he was able to face them without having to rely on traps. Knowing that it was a necessary step if he ever wanted to successfully venture into the dungeon, Vaughn began to walk towards the next set of traps, and towards the future that he had decided upon. Chapter 11 The Result of Six Months Quest Endless Path, Infinite Cosmos After slaying his second goblin, Vaughn began to train in earnest. As the days stretched into weeks, he slowly became acclimated to the lifestyle of a hunter. The meat and furs that he obtains were beginning to pile up in his inventory, and he had even successfully slain 37 goblins over the course of six months. Though many of the goblins he came across were alone, there was a time when he was fighting where three other goblins had arrived to assist the one he was already engaging. After suffering several injuries, Vaughn managed to come out ahead and slew all four goblins triggering an unexpected event to occur. Slash slash quest function triggered slash slash. Quest, destroy the goblin tribe. Rank, D. 
The presence of goblins has been on the rise in the western forests. They have become a threat to hunters, and have begun to wander from the forest into neighboring villages resulting in the loss of livestock. Find the source of the goblin scourge before further damage is done. Rewards, complete activation of the quest function, 1x effigy of the hero, 1000 origin points. Failure condition, death, goblin chief escapes, 7 days pass. Remaining time, 6d23h57m. Penalty, quest function will be sealed until triggered again. Minus 100 karma. Vaughn was surprised at the sudden notification but decided to look into it after he had secured his safety back at the cave. A slash n he is still injured after the fight with four goblins. Advertisements. Along the way, he had inquired with Sis about why the quest was suddenly triggered. Asterisk you have grown much stronger in the past six months. This, combined with the fact you had overcome your limits in the previous fight made the path trigger the activation of a new function. As you've been slaying goblins as your primary targets, it issued a mission that suited your present strength asterisk. Vaughn contemplated this revelation before asking, does that mean I can activate more functions just by growing stronger? I thought I would have to increase the tier of my soul to be able to acquire more. Asterisk that is correct Vaughn. The path is constantly analyzing and trying to help facilitate your growth, so it will make more functions available when it determines you are ready. Note that the strength of the functions themselves is limited by the tier of your soul though asterisk. Ah, that makes sense. Vaughn had noted over the last six months there seemed to be restrictions within the existing functions. One example was when he thought about buying items from records of different worlds, they cost a great deal more than items that can be found in his present record. There seemed to be an exception for some consumables, but for unique objects and items, they required an astronomical amount. He remembered looking into purchasing a Zenpakuto sealed and was shocked when he noticed the price was 130 million of awakened versions or the various releases noted in the anime cost even more. The most expensive being the leader of the Godi I-13, Captain Commander Yamamoto Genryu Sai's Ryajin Jaka that cost 3 billion 700 million origin points? A slash N, that's a lot of op. It seemed as if he'd have to rely on himself to grow stronger, but now with the existence of the quest function. He had a bit of hope kindled within his fighting spirit. After making his way to the cave which he called home, Vaughn sat on the bed he had purchased a few months ago. It had a queen-sized mattress and was made out of a very unique foam, unlike anything he had experienced in his previous life. He thought beds were just hard surfaces with minimal cushioning, so he was quite surprised when he had purchased the current one through the system. Display status equals 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 Name, Von Mason. Age, 14. Race, Human, Sealed. Parameters, Danmachi. Level 1, 0. Power, H146, 0, Dash E540, 0. Endurance, G203, 0, Dash F461, 0. Dexterity, I95, 0, Dash F407, 0. Agility, H153, 0, Dash E519, 0. Magic, H130, 0, dash G299, 0. Soul Strength, Tier 1, Mortal Soul. Karma 209. Equals 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 Observing his status, Vaughn began to understand why the path decided to trigger the quest so suddenly. He had grown a great deal over the last six months, and several of his parameters were approaching the point where he should level up. Vaughn knew that stat growth typically became harder as you accumulated experience, and it took accomplishing something beyond your present level to gain the acknowledgement of the world before reaching the next level. Fortunately, his parameters weren't the only thing to increase in the last six months as his skills had grown alongside them. Early on he had purchased a beginner's archery techniques manual. 
After a month of serious practice, combined with his growing hunting capabilities, he managed to acquire the skill Vow Mastery. Vow Mastery. Rank F. Increases accuracy when equipped with a bow. Provides slightly enhanced vision when the user focuses. He was also able to identify the source of the weird feeling he would get when trying to sneak up on creatures. It turns out his Veil of the Traveler, which enables him to have increased efficacy for concealment and stealth abilities, allowed him to acquire the skill Stealth. Stealth. Rank F. An active ability that allows the user to conceal their presence. Prolonged use of the skill has diminishing returns. These two skills had made hunting much easier. Vaughn had even used his newfound prowess to kill several goblins before they were even made aware of his presence. Since the quest indicated the existence of a tribe there should be a village which they inhabit. He believed proper use of these two skills would be the most significant contributing factors if he wanted to complete the quest. Sis, do you have any idea where the goblin village might be? I've pretty much mapped every nook and cranny within one kilometer of the cave and I don't recall seeing anything that might indicate a tribe is in the area. Asterisk yes, Vaughn. You can bring up both your map and the quest log at the same time. If you pin the quest to your map, it will display an approximate location of your target once you gain enough information. As you continue to investigate within the region, the indicators on the map should shrink until you are able to determine the exact location of the tribe asterisk. Oh, that's amazing, said Vaughn as he displayed both functions side by side. He could see a giant red circle displayed on the map after pinning the quest. It seemed to be an area towards the southwest which encompassed various hills and rivers. It seems to be in the same direction where I fought the four goblins. I'm guessing they were members of the tribe, but why is the indicated zone so large? Advertisements. Asterisk typically, goblins aren't prone to travel in groups. They usually wander alone until the emergence of a chief or king. Even with the presence of a chief, however, they will often move around to several camps as they forage for food and other resources. The chief himself should be in the area near the river, and it's most likely that the largest group of goblins can be found here asterisk. Vaughn was a little annoyed with this information. He would have to explore a large area to eliminate all the smaller groups before moving on to the larger group near the river, assuming it was there to begin with. His biggest priority was to kill the chief though. He would have to identify it among all the normal goblins and try his best to take him out without drawing the attention of the larger group. Is there anything unique about the chief that would separate him from other goblins? He inquired hoping for any information that could prove useful. Asterisk I have never seen a chief, but all of the stronger goblins you had slain possessed a varying number of horns and weapons. Based on the evidence, the goblin chief will likely be the biggest within the group. He should also have multiple horns and be the most heavily outfitted asterisk. Vaughn couldn't help but laugh. Everything Sis said was pretty self-explanatory but it made sense. He would have to make his own judgments about which goblin was the actual chief. If he could not deduce it on his own, he would just have to kill them all. Chapter 12. Preparation, a new bow, endless path, infinite cosmos. Vaughn spent the remainder of the evening preparing his items and equipment. Maintenance was something he regularly performed on his gear ever since he noticed the physical attack power going down when the blades began to dull. As an experiment, he used a whetstone he acquired from a record called Monster Hunter which allowed him to bring his equipment to maximum sharpness with just a few strokes. Unfortunately, the whetstones were single-use items but he managed to determine that they even worked on his arrows increasing their physical attack by 10% to a total of 165. Hmm, I've managed to accumulate 306 points over the last few months. Sis, what do you think I should buy to increase my chances of completing the quest? I was thinking of purchasing some defensive gear, or maybe something to enhance my stealth capabilities. Asterisk at present you aren't strong enough to be able to fight a large number of goblins at the same times. Increases your equipment may offer you more protection against attacks, but it would also restrict your movements and weight you down. Since you don't have any experience moving around in full gear, I would advise purchasing clothes that provide camouflage in the forest. You can also consider upgrading your bow and relying on ranged attacks to eliminate as many goblins as possible without directly engaging them. Lastly, you should consider potions that increase your parameters, or items that can instantly recover wounds and stamina asterisk. I understand. Vaughn focused in his mind and had the system filter for bows that cost under 200 op. Though there were several options, 
He couldn't decide on which would be the best as the system couldn't give him information on an item until he purchased it. Sis, what bow should I buy from this list? Can you tell me any that have unique capabilities, or those that provide high offensive output? Asterisk I cannot see the stats of the items, but I can use the path to determine which have positive and negative effects for you Vaughn. Give me a moment and I'll use the path to analyze which options may be most suitable for the current situation, asterisk. After several seconds a ping sound could be heard within his head, and the previously extensive list had been reduced to a total of three options, Windstrider Shortbow 200 op, Enforcer Longbow 180 op, and lastly Runic Tempered U Shortbow 200 op which should be a direct upgrade for his current equipment if the name was any indicator. After contemplating the three choices, Vaughn chose the Runic Tempered U Shortbow as it seemed to be the most suited to his current skills. He had never used a longbow and didn't have any confidence in hitting targets beyond 20m, so he was able to eliminate the Enforcer Longbow. As for the Windstrider Shortbow, he assumed it had something to do with the wind element which should increase the speed and penetration of the arrows, but he wasn't willing to gamble on it. Advertisements. Confirming his decision within his mind, a small green, almost weightless bow appeared in his hands. It was slightly larger than his previous bow, but the weightlessness made it feel a bit strange within his hands. Observing more closely, he could see dark gold engravings carved along the spine of the bow. The bowstring seemed to have been made of a dark flaxen material that was dyed the same color as the engravings. Runic Tempered U Shortbow. Rank, B, Magic. Slots, 3. P.ATK, 0 plus 0, X30. M.ATK, 0 plus 0, X30. A U bow bathed within the sap of a sacred tree for 10 years absorbing the essence contained within. The runes engraved upon the bow are a catalyst to allow magic to be imbued with the weapon increasing its output. Runic Tempered Bone Arrows. Rank, B, Magic. Slots, 0. P.ATK, 0. M.ATK, 0. Arrows carved from bones that had been soaked within the sap of a sacred tree for 90 days. The engraving along the shaft allowing the wielder to channel energy within the bolt to drastically increase penetrative power. At first, upon seeing that the bow he spent his precious points on had zero attack value, Vaughn was devastated. As he continued reading the description, that devastation quickly turned to exuberance. This thing is amazing, he exclaimed causing an echo to sound within the cavern. He stared blankly at the arrows, trying his hardest to focus on channeling his energy into one of them. After several minutes sweat began to appear on his brow as his eyes began to turn bloodshot from having been kept open for so long. As the frustration began to build within his mind, Vaughn experienced a burst of inspiration and decided to inquire with Sis on how to channel his energy. Asterisk typically, you would learn to channel energy through meditation and diligent practice. Given the time constraints, it's fortunate you had obtained the skill Yggdrasil's favor upon entering this record. You can channel source energy, which is the highest form of energy in this record, directly into the bow and arrows. You just have to have the intent to use the skill and enough focus to keep it active asterisk. Exhilarated by the response, Vaughn immediately tried doing as instructed. Grabbing one of the arrows he willed himself to activate the skill Yggdrasil's favor. He could feel a sucking motion similar to having his blood drawn as the source energy was imbued into the arrow. After about two seconds the arrow had begun to glow along the shaft until the energy began to accumulate within the arrowhead. The longer he kept his focus the brighter the arrow seemed to glow, so he looked at its description to confirm. He could see the previously zero values for both physical and magical attack increasing in value over time. He observed as the initial value, around 100 or so, continued to climb beyond 500 after about 5 seconds had passed. As he continued channeling more and more energy into the arrow the value began to approach 1000. Sound of an arrow disintegrating. The moment the arrow seemed to break the 1000 attack value it disintegrated into a series of golden particles which caused a small shockwave of air to push Vaughn back onto the bed. It seems like 1000 attack is the limit before it breaks the durability threshold of the arrows. Fortunately, I didn't try the experiment with the bow or else I would have lost 200 points. Vaughn began to sweat thinking of the terrifying implications. At least they are significantly stronger than the previous arrows. I'll need to test their efficacy on the targeting range in the morning before I set out. I'll purchase some more arrows and consumables, any suggestions sis? Asterisk there are various healing potions of different grades available from this record. 
though my analysis indicates the most reliable healing source amongst the records you know of should be called a Senzu bean. They can be purchased for 50 points each within the shop, and can quickly recover both health and stamina within a short period of time. Please be advised they also seem to have a moderate side effect by overdrafting the body's natural healing properties so it could cause damage to your growth if overused asterisk. Advertisements. Vaughn was excited at the thought of using the mystical beans from the record of Dragon Ball. He remembered how the heroes often used them to save people on the brink of death, and even as a mild exploit to overcome some difficult situations. Using 100 of his remaining points Vaughn purchased two Senzu beans and then withdrew one of them from his inventory. It was a relatively large bean similar to the fava beans he had discovered growing within the wilderness north of his cave. Lifting the Senzu bean to his nose, he noticed it had a rather pungent odor though it didn't seem to really leave the surface of the bean like most smelly things. He had to bring it really close to his nostrils before the smell hit him, and he began to sweat thinking of how such a thing might taste. Resolving to do his best to never find out, Vaughn returned the beat to his inventory and began making preparations for bed. He cleaned the wounds he had sustained earlier using disinfectant he had purchased through the shop. After taking a bath using purified water, he applied medical paste and dressings to the wounds before retiring to his bed. He knew that his blood would prevent any infection from spreading, but didn't want to take the chance of catching some foreign or magical disease unique to this world. He began to count the stars on the ceiling of his cave. It had become one of his routines over the last few months to help fall asleep. By now he had already determined there were exactly 238 stars and had even begun to assign various records to them within his mind. Settling his eyes on one of the more unique colored stars which shone red, he assigned the record of Naruto to it. Using that thought as inspiration Vaughn allowed himself to fall asleep, imaging what it would have been like if it had been his first world and what he would be able to do once he visited in the future. Chapter 13. The Hunt Begins. Endless Path, Infinite Cosmos. Awakening the following day, Vaughn immediately set about his final preparations for the quest. Since his inventory had long since been filled with miscellaneous items he had stored many of the non-perishable goods near the back of his home. As a means of self-preservation, he was now filling his inventory with the various traps and gadgets he had been using during his hunts. He figured he could lay them along the path and if things got dicey he would be able to safely retreat. There was also the possibility any goblin chasing him could fall victim to the traps, giving him an edge should things go awry. Leaving the cave, Vaughn noticed the sun had yet to rise. The morning was cool and he could feel a refreshing breeze blowing in from the northwest. Confirming the time with Sis, he realized it was only 3.40 am which would give him ample time to make his preparations and scout the goblin camps. He moved towards the range he had established outside his home. There he had placed several targets at varying ranges between 10 and 50 meters. As a means of experimentation, Vaughn decided to use the bone arrows with his older bow. He wanted to see how much damage they were able to do without the enhancements of his new bow. After his experience last night he determined he was able to inject source energy that could increase the damage output of his arrows by around 100 points in both physical and magic attack respectively. Knocking an arrow, Vaughn pulled the bow to its maximum allowance while simultaneously observing the changing attack value through the system interface. It seemed as though the conversion was taking longer than the previous night which he assumed was a result of actually trying to fire the arrow instead of just holding it. As the arrow began to approach 1000 attack, Vaughn released the arrow at the target 10m away. The arrow seemed to have turned into a beam of light as it tore through the air and pierced the target. It continued to travel unhindered for several meters until it disappeared into the tree lean in the distance. Vaughn was completely shocked at the penetrating power of the arrow and began to commend himself for his selection the previous night. Without searching for the arrow he had just fired, Vaughn inquired with Sis about the time it had taken to charge the arrow to its maximum potential. He learned that instead of the 10 seconds recorded the previous night, it had now taken 17, almost twice the previous amount. Moving on with his experiment, he now decided to use his new bow using his old arrows. He didn't know the safety limits of the bow, but since the attack power of bow was typically much lower than the arrows themselves he decided to limit it to 100 points. The new arrow itself was plenty powerful and he was unwilling to risk breaking what could become the key to completing the upcoming quest. He knocked the arrow into the new bow and began channeling source while observing the change in its stats. 
He noticed that as the attack value increased it became increasingly difficult to keep the bow fully drawn. Given the increased size, it seemed to take much more energy to increase the strength of the bow so Von began to worry about the efficacy of its use. After approximately 7 seconds the value finally reached 100 in both physical and magical attack. Loosing the arrow, it flew silently towards the 20M target, the 10M target got destroyed. Upon contacting the wooden support the arrow penetrated about three-fourths its length into the log. It was significantly weaker than the previous arrow but had the added benefit of flying almost completely silent. Looking down at the bow in his hands, he noticed the runes on its surface were still emitting light which caused him to investigate it through the system. Though the bow took much longer to supply energy to, it appeared to retain the energy for a longer period of time as Vaughn noted the attack value slowly decreasing. Advertisements Pleased with his discovery, he moved on to his final test using both the runic-tempered U shortbow and runic-tempered bone arrows together. He noticed that it was impossible to split his focus between both the bow and arrow, so he experimented with channeling source energy into each of them and seeing how fast they lost the charge. The arrow lost energy almost instantly since the runes along the shaft seemed to only serve the purpose of funneling the energy into the arrowhead. As soon as the supply stopped the energy would begin to rapidly disperse. As he had expected, it seemed the complexity of the runes on the bow gave it a far greater ability to store energy as compared to the arrows. He charged the bow to around 110 attack power before switching his focus to the arrow. After about 20 seconds the arrow was fully charged and he noticed the bow's attack had only decayed by 8 points. Increasing his focus to the limits, Vaughn took aim and loosed the arrow towards the target 50m away. Compared to the first experiment which produced an exceptionally loud sound, the arrow now traveled almost silently which Vaughn assumed was a hidden property of the magical bow. Almost immediately after that thought crossed his mind, the arrow made contact with the target and easily pierced it through, continuing its journey unabated into the woods beyond. Traveling through the woods with a practiced pace, any observer that had known the boy previously would be shocked with how smoothly he transitioned through the various obstacles. He kept a steady pace and generated very little sound as he moved unhindered, a far cry compared to the many scratches and abrasions he had acquired on his initial trek through the forest. Satisfied with the result of the three tests Vaughn decided to rest and eat breakfast. Though he had only fired three arrows it had begun to cause a dull sensation in his mind which Sis informed him was the result of exhausting a large portion of his internal mana. After breakfast, he finalized his preparations and began heading towards the southwestern direction where he could see a river indicated on his map. With any luck, he would be able to scout the area and determine the location of the chief before making preparations to engage. After about 20 minutes of travel, Vaughn had covered a distance greater than the 1 km perimeter he had set up around the cave he called home. Shortly thereafter he finally reached the border indicated on the map and began to slow his pace to increase the efficacy of his observation. He decided to scout areas on the map that had clearings or other landmarks as his experience with goblins had shown they prefer to loiter around open spaces. He continued his search for several hours without finding a single mark but wasn't disturbed since he had been using the opportunity to increase the detail in his map. As he progressed continuously towards the river which Sis suspected of housing the chief, he would move in a zigzag pattern placing traps and tripwires periodically. Eventually, Around 500 m from his destination, Vaughn finally encountered his first group of goblins. They had established a small camp near the remains of a large tree. Judging by their demeanor Vaughn assumed they were acting the role of scouts or an advance guard. Their presence indicated that his thoughts of a village or nest being nearby was highly likely. Instead of immediately engaging the goblins, Vaughn decided to wait for about half an hour as he slowly scouted the perimeter of their camp. His prior experience with the goblin ambush had left a shadow in his heart, and he wanted to make sure there were no unexpected surprises waiting for him if he failed to kill them quickly. His intuition had proven correct as an additional pair of goblins had shown up 20 minutes later to join the previous three. It almost seemed like they were performing a change of the guard as two of the goblins left the way the others just arrived. He contemplated whether or not he should follow the two but he didn't want to leave a path of escape that was populated by goblins. He waited for 10 or so minutes for the newer goblins to settle in and made his final preparations as their guard began to lax. Using his stealth skill he was able to creep within 15m without drawing their attention. 
As they were simple goblins he had decided to eliminate them using his normal U short bow instead of its magical big brother. Lining up his first target Vaughn loosed an arrow while immediately using a mental command to knock a second while the first was still in flight. With practiced movements, he drew back the bow and took aim as the first arrow penetrated directly through the eye socket of his initial target. The other two goblins turned towards the direction of their companion and in the short period they were both stunned, a second arrow slammed into the neck of the goblin furthest away. The final goblin, as if being startled awake from a nightmare, immediately turned and ran while howling towards the sky. It seemed as though he was trying to call for aid as he fled the scene of carnage. Unfortunately for it, he just so happened to flee in the direction of one of the tripwires Vaughn had previously lain. As the goblin fell and tried to scurry back along the path, a third and final arrow pinned him to the ground. Quickly gathering his spoils, Vaughn retreated 100m away from the campsite and tried to find a vantage point to observe the response of any approaching goblins. Ten minutes later a squad of nine goblins came running towards the camp where Vaughn had just slain three of their brethren. Finding the camp empty they began to rage and disperse around the area trying to find the perpetrator. Because he had set various traps in the area, Vaughn was satisfied to observe the two goblins had sustained heavy injuries when their legs got caught in bear traps. Other than that a few others just tripped over the wires he had spread out before the entire group gave up around an hour later. Leaving behind three members, the remaining four carried the two injured goblins back along the path towards where Vaughn assumed their main camp was located. It took around 10 minutes for them to respond, and the entire group came running. Sis, can you analyze the distance a group of goblins could run and try to mark the most likely area in the direction they headed on the map? Advertisements. Asterisk certainly Vaughn. Analyzing data, please confirm the coordinates on the updated coordinate on your map asterisk. Confirming a new area had been highlighted on the map, Vaughn gathered what traps he could before making his way home. The sun had already risen high in the sky, and he wanted to return before darkness arrived as it would be unwise to engage any patrolling goblins during the night as they possessed some degree of night vision. After retreating about 200 m, Vaughn had a moment of inspiration as he faced towards the direction of the goblin camp. Equipping his magic bow and arrow, Vaughn took aim and channeled a fully charged shot at the distant silhouettes. Loosing the arrow, he turned to flee before confirming if it had hit the intended target. On the goblin's end, they were all on high alert waiting for the reappearance of the enemy that had attacked the camp previously. They had spread out a bit and moved around investigating any sounds or suspicious movement that caught their eye. The largest goblin among them had even climbed the rotting tree to try and get a better vantage point. Looking into the distance he saw a golden sheen which seemed to immediately grow larger within his vision. Before he was able to understand what was going on darkness claimed his mind as the golden light penetrated entirely through his brain. Chapter 14. Difficulties. Endless Path, Infinite Cosmos. Vaughn continued to scout the area around the marker for the goblin's village slash nest. Over the course of three days, he had killed a total of 18 goblins in various different camps causing an increase in their security. Camps began hosting groups of five to seven goblins instead of the original three. Vaughn began to worry as he hadn't expected such a large goblin presence and his strategy to slowly whittle them down began to seem unfeasible. Once, when he tried to penetrate through the outer perimeter and scout the location of the chief he ended up nearly getting killed by a group of patrolling goblins. Though he had avoided several groups up till that point, he was caught off guard by sentries stationed in various elevated positions. When they had spotted him they raised a cry that caused the patrolling goblins in the vicinity to congregate towards his position. He managed to fight his way out of the encirclement, but it wasn't without a cost. Due to the severity of his injuries, he was forced to eat both of his senso beans during his retreat. Fortunately, he had acquired several crystals from slaying other goblins which allowed him to purchase an additional three as well as two new pieces of equipment. Handloom Shadow Silk Tunic. Rank D. Slots 2. P.Def, 1. M.Def, 30. A tunic that was caringly woven using the silk produced by a special variant of silk worms nurtured in darkness among strong sources of yin energy. Though it provides little defense, it greatly enhances stealth capabilities. It carries with it the creator's desire that the protector is kept from harm. Scout's Gilly Mantle. Advertisements. Rank F. Slots 0. P.Def, 2. M.Def, 0. A special mantle constructed to emulate the varying types of foliage found within the different forested terrains. 
When the user remains idle they are almost indiscernible from their surroundings. After recouping his supplies, Vaughn made his way into the forest using his new equipment. As a means of countering the goblin patrols, he had purchased several anti-personnel mines which he had scattered along their patrol routes. After triggering many of the mines, the goblins ceased their patrolling and began to consolidate their forces towards the river. They had even begun to dig into the area near the tree lean exposing the dirt and ground below. Seeing the actions they had taken, Vaughn was surprised at the intelligent actions they displayed. Compared to many of the monsters he had seen in the manga, which were mindless creatures that charged endlessly at the protagonist, these goblins displayed caution and tactics. They proved they were capable of adapting to different situations. Vaughn ended up refunding some of the mines, though he still buried the majority along the tree lean for future use. The main reason he hadn't refunded them all was due to the fact the refund only gave 30% of the spent resources which caused him to abandon the idea. It was on the eve of the fifth day that Vaughn finally spotted the chief. Unlike the majority of goblins who stood less than a meter in height, the chief was nearly 1.5 meters and had the build of an average adult. The leathery skin of his torso had scale-like protrusions embedded along the epidermal tissue. It had several horns studding its head with two much larger ones above both temples. Its lower body had bristle-like fur compared to the normal thick coat of other goblins. Its two most notable features, however, were its eyes and the staff he wielded. Unlike the ferocious red eyes of normal goblins, the chief possessed pale yellow eyes that showed signs of rationality and intelligence. He almost had a look of contempt as he ordered the other goblins in the area. Within its right hand, he held a staff that looked to be rigged back together after having been broken. Vaughn could see the periodic glow of runes along the body of the staff, and the occasional spark coming from the crack near the top of the staff. Vaughn assumed the staff had been taken from an adventurer which implied the chief was either able to cast magic or was strong enough on its own to fight against mages. The village which the chief lived in was more of an encampment than anything. They had erected small huts almost as a mockery to humanity and civilized culture. Within the encampment were more than 100 normal goblins, as well as three larger ones which seemed to take turns guarding the chief and enforcing its order. They were each wielding long flexible clubs which they used to periodically whip the smaller goblins to action. The entire village seemed to have come alive as the goblins scuttled about building soil embankments as a makeshift wall around the encampment. Vaughn could tell that the longer he waited, the more difficult it would be to engage the chief. He knew going head-on would be impossible due to the large disparity in numbers, and there was a high chance even if he tried to attack from a distance the chief would deploy its troops while staying in the back. The distance between the tree lean and encampment was around 130m, but there was absolutely no cover in that entire gap. Though the open space would provide him an advantage in picking off any goblins within the area, he wouldn't be able to guarantee his accuracy without getting closer which would leave him exposed. The goblins seemed incapable of using bows, but it didn't stop them from throwing small stones with enough force to cause physical harm if they hit the right spot. It had been one of the more annoying things when dealing with the sentries mounted in trees. He began toying with the idea of firing random arrows into the encampment and try to lure out small groups. Kiting them into the forest would give him the terrain advantage making it easy to secure some simple kills. Even if the goblins stopped their pursuit after triggering the mines he would be able to take advantage of their retreat. If he had more time he could slowly whittle them down and turn the engagement into a war of attrition. He looked at the time remaining for the quest. 2D03H17M. Two days wasn't enough time to force them out of the encampment. There was also the chance they could start to cannibalize the weaker goblins, as they wouldn't disperse into dust unless a lethal strike was performed. Sis, do you have any ideas? I can't think of anything that would allow me to fight a group of 100 plus goblins and survive. Not to mention I haven't even identified how strong the chief himself is. Asterisk I'm sorry Vaughn, all present data indicates you will be unable to break into the encampment with your current status and equipment. If you had more origin points there may be a solution in the shop, but your current op value is only 43. It would be difficult to acquire enough points within the next 50 hours that would give a meaningful advantage in the current situation asterisk. It's okay sis, sighed Vaughn. I suppose I'll have to rely on myself to come up with a solution, please let me know if you think of anything though. At this point, anything could prove helpful. Asterisk understood. I'll keep running simulations to try and find a solution as you take further action asterisk. Nodding his head in affirmation, 
Vaughn began to withdraw towards a secondary base camp he had established near the goblin encampment. It was in the same hollowed rotting tree where he engaged the first group of goblins. After the events of the first day, it had become an area the goblins proactively avoided. Advertisements Blocking off the area near the stump's entrance, Vaughn began to rest while trying to come up with a solution to breaking the encampment's defense and drawing the chief out. He began to mull over various ideas and strategies, even revisiting the idea of firing random shots just to reduce their numbers. Anything to change the status quo of the current situation would give him more options to make further plans. He also thought about trying to sneak near the encampment at night to bury some mines, but upon remembering the goblins possessed some degree of night vision he scrapped the idea. As the light began to fade, Vaughn started nodding off due to the excessive thoughts plaguing his mind. He was unable to find the solution and figured tackling the idea with a fresh mind would be the most optimal choice. First thing tomorrow morning I'll try to draw some of the goblins out of the encampment. If I'm lucky I'll be able to reduce their numbers below 100. He sighed at the thought there would still be more than 80, including the chief himself, remaining. As he began to finally slip into unconsciousness, the last thought that passed through Vaughn's mind was a method on how to break the embankments the goblins had been building up. As sleep claimed him, he released a small expectant smile. Chapter 15 Spoiler, Title at End Endless Path, Infinite Cosmos Awakening before dawn, Vaughn began to put his plan into action. After putting a filter on the shop, he was able to find the item he was looking for. Small explosive charge, 10 op. Ranky, a component used in the making of anti-personnel mines developed by Russian scientist Neil Vankov. The explosive yield is equivalent to 10 mj, 10 sticks of dynamite. Dissatisfied with the idea of simply kiting a few goblins out of the encampment, Vaughn had come up with the idea of pestering them thoroughly over the course of the entire day. Once the goblins retreated further into the camp he would be able to attach the explosives to magically charged arrows and bombard the largest concentration of goblins. If he was lucky, he would even be able to deal large amounts of collateral and potentially injure or kill the chief. He slowly made his way towards the encampment and dug up several of the mines along the tree lean. It was a very dangerous and harrowing experience given the sensitivity of the mines, but he managed to finish without triggering any of them. After replanting them in a funnel-like fashion with only a few safe paths of retreat, Vaughn ate breakfast. He didn't know if he would have any opportunities to eat while harassing the goblins, so he made sure to enjoy a full meal. Starting a fire near his secondary campsite using firestones he managed to roast a rabbit he had hunted previously. Though his inventory kept items from spoiling, he enjoyed the process of cooking and eating as it was very therapeutic to him. Noting the sun had risen above the horizon Vaughn checked the remaining quest time, 1d 17h12m. He now had less than two days remaining, but with luck, he would be able to finish the quest before the day's end. Though he assumed the goblin chief was much stronger than normal goblins, he did not believe it would be able to tank 10 sticks of dynamite to the face. Advertisements Returning to the tree lean near the encampment, Vaughn finished his final preparations by setting up several trip wires crisscrossing the areas around the landmines. Satisfied with his setup, he skulked just behind the trees closest to the clearing. Given the 130m distance between the encampment and the goblins' speed, it would take them more than 20 seconds to close the gap towards his position. With his maximum firing rate, he was confident in being able to eliminate up to one goblin every second. Hopefully, they would send a large group to try and attack him which he would then be able to kite into the mine-infested woods while retreating. Vaughn spent several minutes observing the goblins as they went about their construction. He noticed that they had erected a large structure within the night, presumably to house the chief and his cronies. At present, the chief couldn't be seen, but the presence of two of his henchmen indicated that he was within the building. Vaughn contemplated trying to bombard it immediately but decided it would be beneficial to wait until he dwindled down the number of smaller goblins. Before determining if the chief was inside the larger hut, it would be a mistake to use the explosive arrows. The goblins had shown an ability to adapt to new situations, so they would likely spread their forces out after his initial attack with the explosives. He wanted them to try to fortify and group together, or at least wait until he had eyes on the chief's location. Drawing his bow to a full arc, Vaughn held his breath trying to bring his focus to the limits. He took aim at one of the chief's cronies as he began channeling energy into the arrow. Though he had practiced hitting targets at 50m consistently, 
It was the first time he would be trying to hit a moving target at more than 1.30m. He was hoping the increased flight distance and penetrative power of the magic arrows would make up for the lack of skill. After 20 seconds had passed Vaughn loosed the arrow, it flew with a terrifying velocity as it drew a golden line through the air. Within moments the arrow smashed into the leg of the large goblin severing the limb from the thigh down. Though it hadn't hit the head as intended, Vaughn was still satisfied with the result as the shout from the larger goblin drew the attention of the entire camp, including the chief. A slash N, I know it's been a while since the MC doesn't talk to anyone, so note that the following is a perspective shift. The goblin chief exited his tent and began to look around at the chaos and disorder that had taken over his minions. A grim expression appeared on his face when he saw his chief executor laying on the ground howling at this loss of his leg. Angered at the incident, the goblin chief looked towards nearby goblins and used a language unique to their species to inquire about what happened. The small goblin looked in fear at its mighty leader and explained that a beam of light had come from the forest and cut off the leg of the executor. Seeing the dissatisfied and grim expression that appeared on the face of the chief, he quickly bowed down and continued to affirm what he had seen. The chief looked between the groveling minion, his wailing executor, and finally, the forest where the bush demon had been attacking his tribe for the last six days. It seemed as though no matter how far they retreated from the forest, the demon was not satisfied. It continued to pursue them further and further and even incorporated a strange magic that caused the earth to erupt beneath his minions as they patrolled the forest. Ever since the chief had devoured a dying mage and stole his broken staff, he had been much stronger than his frail kin. He had begun to believe he was special and unique among his kind, and even forcefully took over the various small groups of goblins until he was able to build his village along the river. With time he had intended to destroy the nearby human settlements and expand his village into a kingdom, and from there continue to spread until it grew into an empire? However, fate seemed to envy his prestige and glory. Soon after he had picked the area to begin laying the foundation of his plan one of his patrols had disappeared. The chief had assumed they had met a bear or another more powerful creature and died due to carelessness. His brethren were weak, so a few losses were well within his expectations. He could not imagine that this incident, which he had belittled at the time, would become the prelude to his approaching nightmares. In the days to follow, the bush demon had slowly encroached upon the outer perimeter he had established with great difficulty. It had begun to slowly eliminate each three goblin camp in the area. As it never seemed to attack the larger groups, the chief had ordered to increase the camp sizes to seven, with two always patrolling between the other camps. He also stationed sentries within the trees as none of his scouts had gotten sight of their invisible killer. His order paid off almost immediately, a testament to his brilliant mind. Unfortunately, his minions were unable to prevent the unknown assailant from escaping. After the engagement, his scouts reported that the creature seemed to be covered in a strange fur similar to the shrubbery that dotted the forest. It was capable of moving quickly between the trees, and even when his men dealt reportedly fatal damage to the monster it seemed to recover almost instantly. By the time of its escape, the creature now known as the Bush Demon had slain more than ten of his minions before disappearing into the forest like a ghost. His scouts tried to give pursuit, but the ground seemed to come alive beneath them and an additional five lives were lost in the process. Though the chief was displeased with the result, he was secretly terrified at the existence of such an irrational creature. He could not understand why the bush demon had been targeting his minions, even to the point he had to recall all of his sentries from the forest. He had even ordered for his minions to clear away all of the shrubbery and debris between the village and the tree lean to discourage the bush demon from further antagonizing them. This order had seemed to work, as there had been several hours since the last attack of the bush demon. The chief had foolishly begun to hope that this prolonged nightmare had come to a close. As he stood there contemplating the events of the past week, the chief weighed his options. He could send his minions into the forest and try to flush out the demon which would likely allow it to claim more lives with its devious magic. Other than that he also considered ordering his minions to begin trying to cross the river and escaping into the wilds further south. He knew there were several small villages in the direction, and he would be able to build a new kingdom in a land far away from this demon. He looked towards the river and began to earnestly consider retreat. Even though the idea of fleeing was something that went against his pride as a superior being, his minions were still weak and he had to ensure their survival in order to build his kingdom. As the chief continued to hesitate, he became distracted by the continued wailing of his previous executor. In his fury, 
he turned towards the delirious fool and used the magic provided by his staff to incinerate the weakling. Advertisements. He observed as his previous executor thrashed about in a futile attempt to extinguish the flames. Surrounding him, his minions looked towards the incident with fear and awe which further inflated his ego. With a gruesome smile on his face, he prepared to order his subjects to ford the river so they could seek paradise and security away from this cursed land. The chief raised his staff towards the sky and readied his command, only for a beam of golden light to fly in his direction. Using his quick reaction time, he managed to intercept the beam using his staff as a contemptuous smirk appeared on his face. Asterisk boom, asterisk. That was the last sound the chief ever heard as a searing wave engulfed his body and darkness claimed him. Title, A Single Decisive Arrow. Chapter 16. Rewards. Endless Path, Infinite Cosmos. Vaughn stood stark still beyond the tree lean observing the effects of the arrow he had just released towards the chief. He was momentarily unable to comprehend the turn of events that had just taken place. Though he had originally planned to thin the goblin tribe down and make use of the explosive arrows later that day, he was caught off guard by how the encampment had responded. Instead of immediately charging towards his position, the goblins seemed to enter a chaotic state which only escalated with the emergence of their chief. Vaughn noted the chief was acting in a peculiar manner outside his initial expectations. He noted the demeanor of the chief to be one of indecisiveness and scorn. For nearly a minute it just stood in the same spot observing the chaotic state of the encampment as it likely ruminated over the next course of action. It was during this period of time that Vaughn decided to change his plan. If the goblin chief was just going to stand there aimlessly, why not try to eliminate it now instead of later? Vaughn readied his magical bow and arrow, this time charging the bow beyond the safety threshold he had decided upon. He allowed the runes to absorb enough energy to bring the bow's attack to a value of 200. Vaughn noted that the string of the bow had begun to glow, and it became increasingly difficult to draw to its apex. Taking aim at the chief, Vaughn began charging his arrow to its maximum potential. Moments before it reached a full charge, the chief broke from its absent-minded state and used the magical staff within its possession to burn the large goblin that was struggling on the ground. Its expression turned to one of hate and maliciousness as it watched one of its subordinates' struggles. As the chief raised the staff towards the sky, Vaughn loosed the arrow that had now reached capacity. The arrow traveled with a speed far greater than any of Vaughn's previous shots, and he held his breath in anticipation of the impending result. The goblin chief, as if sensing the incoming projectile used the raised staff to intercept the arrow along its flight path. It displayed a look of satisfaction and contempt at having succeeded. Asterisk boom, asterisk. With an expression attesting to its successful defense still fixed on its face, the chief and every goblin within 15m were consumed by the explosion triggered after contacting the arrow. As they had all been previously observing the chief as it burned the large goblin, the remaining tribesmen stood awestruck at the aftermath of the explosion. Their once revered chief who inspired both fear and respect among their kin had been reduced to nothing more than pulp before their eyes. The staff which had become a symbol of his power now lay embedded within the walls of the largest hut of the encampment in a shattered state. Advertisements. They continued to stare for a brief moment, as the remnants of their chief turned to dust along with several of their kin including the remaining executors. Broken from their stupor, a chaos far greater than their previous state returned to the tribe. They began to flee in all directions, many of them choosing to jump into the rapids of the river adjacent to their encampment only to be claimed by the current. Some of the bolder ones had elected to avenge their fallen chief and ran towards the accursed creature that had claimed so many of their kin. Vaughn stood amongst the tree lean observing the spectacle caused by the explosive arrow he had loosed upon the goblin chief. He observed as they fled in random directions and began to fear he would fail his quest as a result of being unable to eliminate the tribe in its entirety. Just as this thought crossed his mind several notifications sounded in his head. He took a quick glance and had noticed it was congratulating him for completing the quest, but he had to dismiss it to engage the thirty or so goblins that had begun to charge towards his position. He began to enact his original plan to eliminate the goblins as they approached his location and managed to take out more than half before they forced him to retreat deeper into the forest. Continuing their mad charge, the remaining goblins were rapidly dispatched by the combination of anti-personnel mines and archery. After less than 10 minutes of actual fighting, all of the berserk goblins had fallen. Vaughn quickly gathered what crystals he could find before observing the goblin encampment once more. At this point, 
the majority of goblins had fled leaving a few that had been injured as a result of the earlier explosion. Vaughn slowly approached the now abandoned site and dispatched all the surviving goblins. After a cursory glance in all of the decrepit mud structures, the only spoils Vaughn could find were fragments of the broken staff, the chief's crystal, various small crystals, and lastly a book that had been kept within the chief's compound. The staff had been completely splintered into three larger fragments and various smaller parts which Vaughn did his best to collect. The crystal obtained from the corpse of the chief was much larger than a normal goblin, around 10 centimeters compared to the usual 1 to 2. After consulting with Sis, she speculated it could be exchanged for around 230 points, nearly 23x the amount of a single small crystal. She had also encouraged him to keep it within his inventory as it could prove a useful item to trade in once he entered the city. Agreeing with her recommendation, Vaughn stored the crystal and inspected the book. The book was much larger than any book he had ever seen. It was even bigger than the textbooks provided for Vaughn's education in his previous life. The outside of the book seemed to be comprised of a kind of aged leather that had been embossed with golden leaves, vines, and runic symbols. The cover displayed a large golden tree with various gems inlaid to represent fruits. Curious to its contents, Vaughn tried and failed to open the latch holding the book closed. Sis, do you know what this book is? Why am I unable to open it, even though it doesn't have a lock? Asterisk I am unable to determine the origin of the book or its uses. I would recommend leaving the book in of your inventory so it can be analyzed by the path. As for being unable to open the book, it could be the result of a magical spell or enchantment asterisk. Storing the book, Vaughn left the goblin encampment towards his home. Along the way, he took the opportunity to inspect the notifications that had popped up after the slew the chief. Slash slash quest complete slash slash. Quest, destroy the goblin tribe. Status, completion rate 100%. Grade, SS. Rank, D. Rewards, complete activation of the quest function, 1x effigy of the hero, 1000 origin points. Grade rewards, skill, Call of the Reaper, B, complete quest without being seen by the boss, 50,000 origin points grade reward, S, 1x skill enhancement scroll grade reward, SS, slash slash quest function permanently available slash slash. Vaughn was surprised at the grading and grade rewards. He hadn't expected to obtain any bonuses when he had decided to eliminate the chief with his explosive arrow. Curious about the new skill and various items, Vaughn vegan to inspect each of their descriptions. Skill. Call of the Reaper. Rank B. Attacks dealt from stealth deal an additional 300% damage. Your attacks carry the aspect of death, calling victims unseen into its silent embrace. Failure to land the blow removes stealth and reduces parameters by 50% for 30 minutes. Cooldown is reduced to 5 minutes if the user is able to re-enter stealth status. Items. Effigy of the Hero X1. Rank. S. Use. This effigy is automatically consumed by its owner when they take otherwise fatal damage. Upon consumption, the effigy transfers all wounds from the owner unto itself. The effigy will begin to burn for 3 minutes increasing all parameters of the owner by 3x for the duration. After 3 minutes the effigy turns to ash and the owner enters a dormant state for 3 hours. Skill Enhancement Scroll X1 Rank A Use Can be used to increase the rank any skill by 1 rank. Cannot be used on skills rank, A or higher. Advertisements. Vaughn's eyes went wide at the three descriptions. Call of the Reaper would give him incredible benefits if he decided to pursue the path of stealth. Effigy of the Hero was essentially a life-saving item that would allow him to turn a perilous situation around, and the skill enhancement scroll would be very beneficial for any B-ranked skills he acquires in the future. He contemplated using the scroll the Enhance Call of the Reaper but decided to put it off until he was able to understand the skill's potential. Since he had just acquired such a large amount of origin points, Vaughn could learn a plethora of new skills that could prove to be of greater use in the long run than a skill with high requirements and a downside. If anything he could use it to increase his bow mastery which had increased from rank, F, dash, D. With a bit more effort he was confident in being able to raise it to B in the future. Vaughn finally arrived back at the cave around noon and decided to celebrate his triumph by roasting a boar he had hunted several weeks ago. He had kept it in his inventory since it seemed to require a lot of effort to prep, but now it felt like a simple task as Vaughn began to feel like he was capable of accomplishing anything. 
As the day began to come to a close Vaughn sat around the campfire enjoying the roasted boar. He thought about the last six months he had spent training, and how much he had grown since his arrival in this world. The quest, which he thought would be immensely difficult ended up getting completed with relative ease, with ample rewards to show for his efforts. He opened his map and began to look towards the direction of Orario, the place where his journey would officially begin. With various thoughts passing through his mind, Vaughn decided to retire to bed early that night in anticipation of the coming day. With the completion of the quest, he believed he was ready to take his first steps along the path. Chapter 17 Entering the City Endless Path, Infinite Cosmos For the next week, Vaughn spent the majority of his time enjoying the peace and quiet of his life within the forest. Though he had initially intended to set out the day after completing the quest, he found himself unable to leave behind the place he had called home for the last seven months. This place had been the first real home he had ever known and the thought of leaving it behind saddened him. By the week's end, he had gathered most of the traps he had lain in the forest. As he wouldn't be around to tend to them, he felt pity at the thought of any creature unfortunate to get caught during his absence. The evening before he set out, Vaughn reminisced his days since arriving in this world. Though he had arrived with nothing, through his hard work and the assistance of Sis and the path he had slowly grown strong enough to survive in this world. He knew he was still weak compared to many of the characters he would meet, but he believed with his continued efforts that it wouldn't be long before he stood at their level. Early the next morning he gathered up the remaining items within the cave and burned them. As he stared at the pyre that represented the life he was leaving behind he was unable to hold back the tears that had periodically crept up on him during the past week. For the first time in this life, Vaughn cried his heart out. The sun had already risen in the sky by the time the fire burned out. With one last look at the cave, Vaughn took his first steps on his journey along the path. His destination was the Labyrinth City Orario, and he was determined to become the strongest adventurer. Vaughn made his way quickly through the forest towards Orario. Though his level hadn't increased automatically upon completing the quest, there was a marked improvement in his overall parameters. Equals 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 Name, Von Mason. Age, 14. Race, Human, Sealed. Advertisements. Parameters, Danmichi. Level 1 plus, 0. Power, E540-D604. Endurance, F461-E529. Dexterity, F407-D620. Agility, E519-E589. Magic, G299-G326. Soul Strength, Tier 1, Mortal Soul. Karma 273. Equals 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 The best thing was the new plus icon that had appeared next to his level. After inquiring about it, Sis informed him it was a feature implemented by the path to allow him to stockpile his attributes to increase his foundation. As long as he willed it he could increase his level whenever he wanted, but by keeping it the same it allowed him to increase the overall amount of parameters he'd have for future levels. For example, say there were two people that are both level 5. The first adventurer increased their level the moment one of their attributes hit the D rank. The second adventurer didn't accept the upgrade until they had trained for several years and increased all their parameter to D or higher. After both adventurers reached LV5, the second adventurer would be much stronger than the one who had cut corners. This was the main reason Bell Cranel was able to become so strong in the manga. Because he had a unique skill called Lyris Freeze he was able to be one of the only documented adventurers to have almost all of his stats at S rank or higher while at LV1. Though Vaughn didn't have the same skill, he believed his own wouldn't fall short in the long run. It might take time, but as long as he put in the effort he would be able to increase his stats to S rank or higher before deciding to level up. He believed in the idiom that to build a tall tower, you had to first build a strong foundation. 
By the way, out of curiosity he had looked up Lyris Freeze and Argonaut within the shop and found out they cost as much as 1,000,000,000 op and 400,000,000 op respectively. It's no wonder Bell was able to become the protagonist with skills like that as early as Leave 2. After roughly three hours of travel through the forest, Vaughn was finally able to see Orario in the distance. Though he had seen how large it was on the map, he was awestruck seeing the city in person. He had spent the entirety of his previous life within various labs and cells, so this was his first time seeing an actual city. All of the structures and buildings were beyond anything he could imagine, and Vaughn couldn't understand how the characters in the manga were able to freely navigate it in short periods of time. As far as he could see, it would take several hours at the very least to travel from end to end, and that's if he were running. Approaching the nearest gate, Vaughn could see a long line of carriages and people waiting for their opportunity to pass through the gate. There were armored men with pole arms stationed around the entrance, and they inspected the identification of everyone entering as well as any goods they were transporting. As Vaughn joined the queue, he noticed a very peculiar phenomenon which he didn't expect. Emanating from every person within the line he could see a vague colorless haze coming from their bodies. He curiously looked at the adventurer-like man ahead of him in the line. As if sensing the look, the man turned towards Vaughn and gave him a cursory glance. Seeing the strangely dressed and unkempt appearance of the child in front of him he couldn't help but grimace and speak out. What are you looking at kid? I ain't got no money to give, go bug someone else before I get pissed off. Vaughn was surprised hearing the exclamation of the adventurer, before him. It wasn't his intention to ask for money, but he didn't know how he should explain that he was only looking at the aura of the man which had now turned slightly grey. As he was thinking of an excuse, the man once again began speaking. I said beat it kid. If you want handouts go ask a monk said the man with a face full of distaste. Without knowing how to deal with the situation, Vaughn ended up moving towards the end of the line to put some distance between him and the disgruntled man. He didn't want to cause trouble or draw the attention of the guards before he even entered the city. What was the deal with that guy? And do you know anything about the aura that is coming off from everyone sis? A slash N, I usually use, to show when someone is talking within the mind. For Vaughn it will almost always have, while sis has. Let me know if it's confusing and I'll try to find a better way. Asterisk the aura is due to the passive effect generated by the system function view affection that you had received from the beginner's package when you entered this world. For anyone that you haven't interacted with, it will always display as a clear slash transparent aura. Depending on their impression and how you interact with them the aura will change to reflect how they see you. You can also physically touch the aura to get more comprehensive information about the person. This will allow you to see the actual value gained from particular actions and more asterisk. Vaughn had completely forgotten about the skill. Though he had tried messing around with it in the beginning, since there were no people nearby he was never able to determine its actual use. So when the aura turned from clear to grey it was because he was angry with me. But I didn't even do anything. Vaughn was very upset. The first person he had talked to in this world hated him for no reason. Asterisk it is likely due to how you are dressed Vaughn. If you look closely many people are wearing relatively similar attire and follow certain standards for hygiene and appearance. Since you have been living in the forest your clothes are in a distinctly different state than everyone else around you. There is also the matter of your hair which has grown quite a bit in the last 7 months asterisk. After Sissa's explanation, Vaughn began to inspect his own appearance. He noticed that his clothes were torn and had stains in various spots. He had only worn a total of three different outfits since his arrival in this world, and everything except his shadow silk tunic was in poor state. He also noted that his hair had indeed grown long, but he liked it since it was always shaved to the scalp in his previous life. After looking around at the clothing of others nearby, Vaughn couldn't help but agree he stood out. It could also be seen that people in the crowd would give him side wards glances every now and then as the aura around their bodies became slightly dimmer. He had no way of knowing how his appearance would affect people's first impression, and how the first impression was often the deciding factor when dealing with new people. After around two hours it was finally Vaughn's turn to undergo the inspection. Many of the guards showed an expression of distaste at the boy who had arrived at the gate. After asking for his identification they sent him into the side office for processing without wasting any extra effort. Seeing how everyone was treating him, Vaughn resolved to purchase some nicer clothes after he was able to secure lodging within the city. 
After entering the small office near the gate a middle-aged man with an unkempt beard stood up and faced Vaughn. Greetings young man, my name is Gregory House. I'm the chief customs officer on duty today, and I heard from my men you didn't have any ID. The man named Gregory evaluated the young man standing before him. By appearance, he had likely migrated to the city from a mountain village or some other rural area. Curiously, the boy didn't seem to have any luggage or weapons which caused the veteran officer to assume the boy had likely been robbed along the way. After giving the boy a once-over, he gave a gentle smile and asked kindly, Can I ask for your name and why you are trying to enter the city? Vaughn was surprised at the tone of the middle-aged man before him. He was even able to see that the aura emanating from the man's body had begun to glow with a gentle light after examining him for a few moments. My name is Vaughn Mason, sir. I came to Orario after my grandfather had passed away. He always told me stories about his life as an adventurer, and I thought it would honor his memory to become one myself. Vaughn had responded with the story he had made up with Sis prior to his arrival. Since he didn't know anything about the world, he would try to respond as vaguely as possible when questioned. He felt guilty for deceiving the man, especially since he seemed to not dislike him based on his appearance like everyone else. Hearing Vaughn's response, Gregory had begun to feel bad for the boy who could barely be called a young man. You must have had it rough. I'm certain your grandfather would be proud to see you had made it here. Tell me, Vaughn, what are your plans after you enter the city? You must know you can't enter without paying an entrance tax and a temporary pass without identification would cost you 3,000 valis. Vaughn nodded. Sir, I would like to register at the guild to receive an identification. For the tax and entrance pass, I have a few items to barter if that is acceptable. Gregory gave Vaughn another look and was unable to see anything which could be used as barter. He also didn't see any items that would be acceptable collateral to allow Vaughn to enter the city. You don't have to worry about it kid. I just had a grandson myself born this past week, so I'm in a pretty giving mood. I'll go ahead and pay for your entrance pass and tax as long as you can promise me you'll make an honest living and pay me back in the future. Gregory had seen several outsiders led astray after entering the city. He had hoped his extension of kindness would prevent the boy from treading down a shady route in the future. Vaughn was overwhelmed by the man's kindness. He could feel his eyes get a bit wet as he engraved the man's name within his heart. Once he became stronger he would not only return the kindness he had received but return it with interest. I swear on my mother and grandfather, I will never walk a path that would bring shame to their memory. Since Vaughn never knew his real grandfather he felt guilty swearing on just him alone, so he included the most important person within his heart as well. Satisfied with the boy's response, Gregory quickly filled out the required forms before allowing Vaughn to enter to city. Advertisements. Good luck boy, I have high expectations for you he waved as the boy exited the office. Vaughn turned and bowed slightly towards the man, thank you Mr. House. I will remember the kindness you have shown me. I will do my best to meet your expectations. The aura surrounding the man became a bit brighter as he turned away and triggered the bell signaling for the next person in line to enter. Vaughn stared towards the direction of the office for a moment before turning away. He looked at his surroundings and marveled at the architectural design of each building. There were people of various shapes and sizes walking around in high spirits. He even caught sight of a young woman with rabbit ears traveling with a stout hairy man which Vaughn assumed was a dwarf. Orario, here I come. Vaughn muttered as he walked towards the center of the city, where the massive Babel Tower was located. Chapter 18. The Guild. Endless Path, Infinite Cosmos. As he made his way towards the tower, Vaughn continued to look around at the various combings and goings of people on the street. He noticed that even though everyone had unique outfits and appearances, nobody stood out quite as much as he did. It was rather ironic that clothing meant to enhance stealth now made him appear like a sore thumb as he moved along drawing the eyes of several curious pedestrians. After about an hour Vaughn noticed a building that had dozens of people coming and going in groups of differing sizes. The building had an aged but regal look. From what he could see there were three floors and the design of the architecture made it stand out from all the surrounding buildings. After observing the building, he didn't see any posted signs indicating what the building contained so Vaughn let his curiosity get the better of him and decided to enter. Once he entered the building he immediately knew where he was. It seems entering from the northwestern gate was the correct decision, as it put him on the same route where the guild was located. Vaughn couldn't help but sigh at how the path always seemed to take his future actions into consideration. 
following the map directly from his cave ended up putting him in the same trajectory as the guild if he were to try and approach the tower when entering the city. Vaughn looked around to see if he could recognize any of the characters from the show. He remembered the two girls Inna and Miss Ha as they were noteworthy characters within the manga and thought it would be interesting to meet them in real life. Excuse me, sir, may I help you find something? Spoke a sonorous voice from behind Vaughn. Vaughn turned towards the source and saw a mature lady with lilac-colored hair and pale green eyes. She looked only a few years older than Vaughn, but she carried herself a lot like Dr. Keenly from his previous life which caused Vaughn to grimace slightly. The most notable thing that caught his eye was the fluctuation of her aura which seemed to change back and forth between transparent and a dull gray color. Noticing the change in the boy's expression the receptionist, Fauna Vestile, couldn't help but feel a twitch in her eye. She had taken the initiative to approach this vagrant child in front of her in accordance. Yes, she probably would have overlooked him outside of work, but she couldn't help but feel annoyed with his the boy seemed to observe her body with a frown on his face. Trying to keep her cool she continued to perform her duties, this, sir, is this your first time at the guild? Vaughn realized the woman must be one of the guild employees, and seeing the black pantsuit that seemed to match everyone behind the counter he couldn't help but feel apologetic for worsening her mood. I'm sorry, and yes, this is my first time in the guild and I'd like to register as an adventurer. Advertisements. Fauna was a bit surprised with how polite the boy was, especially since he had so rudely stared at her body previously. She decided he was likely not used to interacting with girls and believed her charm was the reason for the slip in his expression. Smiling at the thought, she turned to the boy. Welcome to the Orario Guild main office. My name is Fauna, may I ask for your name young sir? Vaughn was able to see a drastic change in the aura emitted by the woman who had introduced herself as Fauna. Though transparent, it now had a vague mellow color similar to sunlight. With a smile on his face, he decided to introduce himself as well. Hello, Ms. Fauna. My name is Von Mason. Fauna giggled a bit at how quickly the boy named Von's expression changed. It was very subtle, but due to her profession, she could easily distinguish what the boy was thinking based on the small changes in his facial features. It would seem this unkept child was taught proper manners, and she shouldn't have snuck up behind him thinking he was a vagrant that had wandered in. It's nice to meet you Von. You can find the desk for adventurer registration over there, near that blonde-haired woman wearing glasses. Vaughn followed the direction she was pointing at and saw a petite girl with blonde hair standing behind a desk. Thanking the receptionist, Fauna, Vaughn made his way towards the desk with a bit of excitement apparent on his face. As she watched him walk away like an expectant child, Fauna couldn't help but giggle with how interesting the boy acted despite his appearance. She began to wonder if maybe she should lecture him on how he should dress if she got the opportunity in the future. The boy had deep aquamarine eyes, dark hair, and handsome facial features. She believed with a proper haircut and decent attire he would be quite the lady killer when he grows up. Unaware of the ripples he had set in motion, Vaughn approached the registration desk and gave his best smile towards the girl that had noticed his arrival. Good afternoon, my name is Vaughn Mason. I would like to register as an adventurer. After observing the change in Fauna after he had smiled, Vaughn determined it would be a good tactic to improve the impression he made on people. The young girl seemed to be startled by the exclamation of the boy in front of her. She had expected as much since she had seen him talking to Fauna as the later pointed towards her direction, but she hadn't anticipated the excitement of the boy who she initially thought had a rather solemn air. Gee greetings Vaughn, my name is Millie Strauss. May I ask what level you are and which familia you belong to? After his introduction, Vaughn noticed the aura around the girl had turned blue and began to flicker slightly. He was unsure of what he had done to bring about the change and stood there blankly for a moment before responding. A.H.H., I'm level 1 and I don't belong to a familia yet, he said with a sorry expression on his face. Millie was surprised with his sudden change in character. For a moment she even felt as though she should apologize, but decided against it for the time being. You may be unaware but the guild only really accepts people that have been registered to a familia. Since we wouldn't be able to maintain liability for all the free adventurers moving in and out of the dungeon, we only accept those that can be held accountable to the various gods that reside within the city. Vaughn was surprised as he didn't recall that type of detail from the manga. He knew it wouldn't be easy to join a familia with his current strength, and without becoming an adventurer it would be very difficult to make money in the future. Seeing the dejected look on Vaughn's face, 
Millie decided to try and cheer him up by offering some advice. If you'd like, I can arrange for you to meet some of the familia that are recruiting. You also have the option of becoming a freelance dungeoneer and delving into the upper levels to improve your strength if there is a particular familia that interests you. After hearing what she had just said, Vaughn's mood did an immediate 180 and he inquired, You're saying it's possible to go into the dungeon without registering at the guild? And can you give me a list of the familia that are recruiting right now? Taken aback by his exclamation, Millie couldn't help thinking, This boy must be pretty simple, he changes his mood so quickly. She sighed before saying, Yes, the biggest difference between being a freelance dungeoneer and becoming an adventurer is the number of benefits you receive from the guild. For freelancers, there is a 30% tax on all items and loot drops they sell to the guild. There are also restrictions on the missions you can accept based on your level, and adventurers always have priority for higher ranked quests since they can rely on their familia if difficulties arise. While explaining, she had handed a roster of all the currently recruiting familia to Vaughn. As she listed out all the benefits being in an official adventurer provided, Vaughn was distracted by all of the names that were on the list he had received. He couldn't recognize the majority of the familia on the piece of paper, and was surprised by the sheer number of gods that seemed to reside within the city. Towards the bottom of the list, the rankings of the familia began to increase and Vaughn finally noticed a familiar name, Loki Familia. Interested at the thought of joining one of the most powerful guilds within the story, Vaughn looked at the requirements before sighing within his mind. They required a person to be at least LV2 and to have recommendations from other familia before being able to apply. It didn't seem like they accepted outsiders very easily and only wanted members that had positive reputations. Vaughn by surprised when reading this as he recalled out abrasive the wolf man bet acted in the manga. Noticing the boy in front her seemed to get distracted, Millie looked to see where he eyes were drawn. Millie was rather surprised that the familia that caught Vaughn's interest was the Loki familia. She assumed he had heard about their fame and wanted to try and join their ranks. Too bad he wasn't yet strong enough. The Loki Familia? They are considered one of the top three alongside the Freya and Hephaestus Familius. They usually only accept the best of the best and are constantly competing for the name of number one Familia within the city. Vaughn nodded at hearing her explanation since it was similar to what he had read in the manga. He knew that Loki and Freya were constantly competing for talent, whereas the Hephaestus Familia only focused on creating quality goods to be used by capable adventurers within the dungeon. Vaughn continued to browse the list and was surprised that he didn't see the Hestia familia listed anywhere. He was almost about to inquire before Sis interrupted within his mind. Asterisk Vaughn, please remember that you entered this world before the main timeline of the story. It is most likely the Hestia familia does not yet exist as she may not have descended yet. Asterisk. He had almost completely forgotten that fact since he spent the majority of his time over the last seven months just training and hunting. Thanks, Sis. I almost gave away a bit too much information. You saved me. Asterisk you are very welcome Vaughn. Just remember that while you may alter events in the future, you shouldn't give away any information that would allude to the fact you are aware of what is supposed to happen asterisk. Vaughn nodded and returned the list to Millie. Thanks for the list, but I want to improve my strength before trying to apply to a familia. If possible, I would like to sell a few items to the guild. Is that okay? Receiving the list, Millie nodded at his inquiry. Certainly Vaughn. Though it's not a typical procedure, there aren't many people trying to register as an adventurer at this time of year so I have a bit of time if you'd like to sell things now. What would you like to exchange? Vaughn placed his hand above the table and murmured some words under his breath before the goblin chief's core appeared on the table. He had previously discussed it with Sis and determined that storage magic, though very rare, did exist in this world. He masked the existence of his inventory by pretending to chant a magic spell before placing the core down. Millie was shocked at the fact the boy before her seemed to possess storage magic. If news were to spread, he wouldn't even need to apply for a familia because they would be lining up to recruit him. She looked around to see if anyone had been watching before leaning towards Vaughn and whispering, you should be very careful about using storage magic in public. If you'd like, we can handle this trade in the private booths in the back. Vaughn smiled before saying, it's fine to trade here for now, the only item I want to exchange is this core, but thanks for your concern, I'll be more careful in the future. Staring at the gently smiling boy, Millie blushed slightly before staring at the core that had been placed on her desk. This, where did you obtain this core, she asked. 
Remembering the excuse he had prepared, Vaughn quickly explained, Before I came to the city, my grandfather had entrusted this core to me saying it would help me procure enough funds for food and lodging when I became an adventurer. I don't know where he had obtained it. Millie nodded at the explanation, as she didn't believe a level 1 would be able to obtain such a high-quality core. She could tell that, even though it wasn't as pure as some high-grade monster cores, it definitely came from a variant species. I see. I will have to verify its price with our appraisal expert since the core is from an unknown origin. Please wait here for a few minutes. Millie bowed and took the core into a back room. Advertisements. After several minutes, as Vaughn continued to look around at the various adventurers she finally returned with a small pouch. It was determined that the core came from an evolved species of goblin, likely the variant known as a chief. Since goblin chiefs are a nuisance that causes devastation in rural areas outside the dungeon, it was determined that you would receive the bounty of hunting one as well as its exchange value. The total, after a 30% tax, comes to 14,000 valis. Please confirm the total. Vaughn wore an incredulous expression as he counted the coins within the purse. He hadn't expected to earn so much for a goblin he killed with a single arrow. After confirming the amount, he once again thanked Millie before leaving the guild. On his way he noticed the receptionist, Fauna, looking at him with an almost scary smile as she waved in his direction. Giving a curt nod, Vaughn exited the guild. Remembering the first survival lesson he had obtained when he came to this world, Vaughn set out to look for a place to stay. He didn't have to worry about food with his inventory, but it would be difficult to get by without a roof over his head. Besides, the thought of staying within an inn was an exciting and new experience that he was looking forward to. As he continued to wander down the street towards the huge tower in the center of the city, Vaughn was unaware of the attention he had garnered from an unexpected source. He never could have anticipated the troubles that would find him in the future. Chapter 19 The Hearth's Embrace Endless Path, Infinite Cosmos At a cafe located outside of the Guild of Orario, a beautiful woman sat staring aimlessly as adventurers went about their business. Seated across from her was a handsome gentleman with a fervent expression as he made an earnest effort to try and earn her attention. The woman sighed in her mind. Listening to the feeble attempts of the fool across from her, she began to wonder why she had allowed him to accompany her in the first place. As a god, his looks were pleasing to the eye, but after a time she had grown bored with his company. As the fool drolled on endlessly, she continued to stare at the various adventures. It had become a pastime of hers to seek out those with talent and she often spent her free time observing any newcomers entering and exiting the establishment. Unlike the seemingly unchanging gods she often associated with, she had gained an appreciation for the seemingly endless variations of mortals. To her, they were the only excitement in the perpetuity of her life. She especially liked those with unique souls harboring untold potential for growth. She grew progressively more dissatisfied with the company of her fellow god and began to ignore him entirely. Just as she was about to dismiss him and conclude her hobby for the day, she noticed a peculiarity within the flow of people. There stood a young boy, garbed in black attire from head to toe. Compared the vibrancy of the rest of the crowd, he stood out as he began moving further down the street almost as if opposing the flow of everyone else. Ordinarily, she would dismiss his existence as a mild anomaly that lacked tact and common sense, but for reasons uncertain, she continued to follow the boy with her eyes. Sensing the change in atmosphere, the male god followed the sight of the goddess he was trying to woo. There he observed an unkempt boy barely considered a young man. The boy was garbed in a black tunic that seemed to absorb the light, whereas the rest of his clothing was simply tacky and soiled. Testing the waters he looked towards the goddess and spoke. He is dressed rather, interestingly, isn't he? I wonder how he can walk so calmly through the crowd dressed in such a foolish outfit. Maybe he is trying to become a clown. He laughed at his own joke. Hearing the abrasive sound, the female goddess flinched before scornfully turning towards the foolish god. You may leave. I've grown bored with your company. Perhaps you should consider evaluating yourself before you so carelessly speak of others. Angered by the admonishment he experienced, the god stood up before lashing out. Freya, don't think you're so much better than everyone else just because your familia is a little bit bigger. We don't all have the same benefits to provide our children. A gleam passed through the eyes of Freya as she sized up the insect in front of her. Oh, you make it sound like you weren't wishing to enjoy those same benefits. You must feel so inferior that mortals are able to experience something you'll never be able to obtain. Advertisements. Why why you? 
How dare you insult me in such a manner, he shouted. Freya looked directly into his eyes and waited for several breaths before speaking. Do you perhaps wish for a war? The male god immediately stopped any words that were able to leave his throat. He stared into the eyes of Freya and saw the seriousness contained within. With cold sweat dripping down his back, he bowed slightly towards her in his most gentlemanly manner. I spoke out of turn. If you'll please excuse me, I have other matters to attend. Without waiting for her response he immediately left the private booth, desperate to escape the pressure of the gaze at his back. Freya continued to watch as he exited the room. She made a special note to have Otterl disappear some of the foolish god's children in the near future. Turning towards the window, she looked for the silhouette of the boy that had caught her eye. After about two minutes she eventually gave up and prepared to leave for the day. She was unable to understand just what had caught her eye about the abnormal child but decided that if they crossed paths in the future she would be certain to discover the reason. Meanwhile, Vaughn continued his journey towards the Tower of Babel. After about 20 minutes he had arrived in an area that seemed to double as both residential area and marketplace. Considering it would be beneficial to live in an area with readily available commodities that was also in close proximity to the guild, Vaughn decided to enter a nearby inn called the Hearth's Embrace. Entering the inn, Vaughn caught the attention of a uniformed girl who seemed to be around 10 years old. She had chestnut brown hair split into two lively pigtails. Her most notable feature was the cat ears that danced playfully on the top of her head. The ears accented the relatively plain facial features of the girl who still had a bit of baby fat in her cheeks. The girl looked towards Vaughn with her large golden eyes and shouted, Welcome. Would you like to stay the Naya right? Or would you like to order some food Naya? Vaughn was completely at a loss as he stared directly at the twitching ears on the girl's head. Though he knew of their existence and had even seen a girl with rabbit ears from a distance, he was caught off guard by the overwhelming presence of the girl before him. He couldn't pull his eyes away from the ears, ah, they twitched. The girl began to back away under the gaze of the boy in front of her. Though she didn't sense any danger coming from the look, it still made her rather uncomfortable. Mooom, there is a customer that needs you Naya. She shouted before running into the back room. Vaughn watched as the girl turned away, and turned his eyes downwards. As he had expected, once the girl turned away she was chased by a tail that poked through a ribbon near the waist of her uniform. As he watched the girl disappear into the back room, he couldn't help but marvel at the existence of cat ears and tail in reality. He was very curious how they were attached, and if the girl had stayed any longer he might have asked. Moments later a much larger version of the girl entered through the door. They shared many of the same features, but the woman before him was far more mature. She stood around 1.7 meters tall and had a very athletic looking figure that was noticeable even through the maid-like blue uniform she was wearing. Vaughn let his eyes wander over the woman before turning his attention towards her chest, where some modest-sized breasts could be seen. He briefly stared for a few moments before fixing his gaze towards the head of the mature cat person to observe her ears. In the process, he also noticed that the aura emitting from her body was a mixture of oranges and reds that appeared very similar to a weak flame. Though he was unaware of what each color meant, he could determine she was likely angry from how the flame flickered back and forth. After her daughter, Tina had informed her of the arrival of a strange man, the woman, Melanuel, exited the kitchen. The moment she stepped through the door, she could feel the wandering gaze from the young man in front of her. As a woman and proprietor of an inn, she was very sensitive to the gazes of others. She noticed the boy had a look on intrigue on his face and dismissed the thought of lecturing him, at least until his eyes had landed on her breasts. She began to get angry at the boy who continued to hold his gaze for a few moments before looking towards the top of her head. Is he looking at my ears, she wondered. As that thought passed her mind, she noticed that the moment his gaze fixed on her ears his expression froze and he began to look a little apologetic. Out of curiosity, she spoke towards the young man. What brings you to my inn young man? Vaughn noticed that the flame-like aura had begun to fade and looked into the eyes of the woman who had just addressed him. Please forgive my intrusion, ma'am. I had just entered the city today and was looking for a place to room for several days. Your inn caught my attention as it seems to be in a very convenient location. Milan looked towards the boy and re-evaluated him. He definitely had the looks of a traveler but wasn't sure he would be able to afford room and board given the quality of his clothing. Is that so? Well, rooms are 2,100 valis a night with an additional 400 valis for meals and water. 
You can choose to eat at the bar or have the food placed within the compartment near your room if you prefer. Vaughn nodded before asking, Is it alright to pay for just the room? I have my own plans for food and water. I, but make sure you don't bring outside food into the inn during mealtimes. It's bad for business if other customers start getting similar thoughts. Milan nodded at the boy's question and assumed he wouldn't have any difficulties paying given his leisurely expression. How many nights would you like to stay? We give a 10% discount if you book more than a week at a time. Vaughn noted that with the 10% discount he would have just enough to be able to pay for an entire week in advance. He began to marvel at the apparent foresight of the path. He wasn't worried about spending all his money either since he would be able to earn more than enough once he entered the dungeon. I would like to book a room for one week, ma'am. He handed over the entire sack of coins he had received from the guild. After confirming the amount and issuing his change, Milan looked towards the boy who kept sneaking glances at her ear and tail. She checked the logbook that he had just signed before asking, Tell me Von Mason, have you never seen a cat person before? Vaughn was surprised at the question and didn't know what to say. He thought for a few moments before responding, Yes ma'am. I lived in the forest with my grandfather and had only ever interacted with humans before today. Judging by the honest expression on the boy's face, Milan nodded in understanding. I see, I see. I'll let it slide for today, but you'd do well to remember it's very impolite to stare at a lady without permission. You about scared my daughter half to death, she almost thought you were going to eat her up. Milan laughed as she watched the boy's expression become increasingly flustered. Vaughn bowed his head and offered his most sincere apology while the mature woman before him simply laughed. Confused, he turned towards her just as she covered her mouth and continued to giggle for a moment. He noticed that the aura around her body had turned into a yellow color with a tinge of sky blue along the edges. I really wish I knew what these colors meant. I can kind of understand that darker colors mean the person doesn't like me. But what does yellow and sky blue mean? Vaughn couldn't help but wonder as a bold thought crossed his mind. Excuse me Mrs. UMM. Milanuel. I'm the proprietress of this here establishment. Milan could see the apprehension in his body, but the curiosity within his eyes didn't escape her attention. Mrs. Ewell, I know it may not be appropriate to ask, but could I, um, touch your ears? Though he wasn't aware of the reason, Vaughn became progressively more nervous with each word. He could also see the aura around Milan fluctuate slightly as the yellow color became more prominent. Era sure, but only one touch. Any more than that and I might hold you responsible Naya. Milan was very amused with how Vaughn was acting and couldn't help but tease him a bit. Though he wasn't sure what she meant by holding him responsible, he understood it was something very dangerous. Overcoming his fear he stretched out his hand while Milan leaned forward slightly with a sly grin on her face. As his hand came into contact with the ear, his body jumped when the ear spontaneously twitched. He began to reach out again before Milan interrupted him, Era didn't I say just one touch? Few few fu dot. She squinted her eyes while looking at his outstretched hand. Vaughn quickly pulled back his hand and apologized. Few few fu it's quite alright Vaughn. Here is your key, you'll find your room on the second floor towards the far end on the right. Make sure you don't lose your key or else there is a fee to replace it and the lock dot. Satisfied with the boy's response, she sent him on his way with a grin and wave. Vaughn quickly entered the stairwell and made his way towards the second floor. He couldn't help but feel like he had been messed with, but wasn't sure what to do about it. Fortunately, he was able to succeed in his plan during the brief moment of contact. View affection, Milanual affection, 53 amicable, intrigue 59 playful. Uncertain of the meaning behind the numbers or how they related to the colors, Vaughn finally found his room. He unlocked the door and took a look around the place he would be staying for the foreseeable future. Though the room was much smaller than his cave, it was still around 50 meters squared and contained a large single bed, writing desk with lamp, and a small separate area for bathing. Advertisements Vaughn laid in his bed and enjoyed the warm atmosphere that permeated throughout the room. Even though his cave wasn't cold, there was something fulfilling about living in a room that has been prepared and tended to by other people. It had been a long day, so Vaughn decided to take a short nap before heading out for dinner. There was a specific place that was often shown in the manga he wanted to visit, but for now, he was just happy to have a place to live that was surrounded by interesting people. He began to look towards the future as he slowly fell asleep. Slash slash millennial, affection plus one slash slash. With that notification sounding in his head Vaughn lost consciousness. 
Chapter 20 The Hostess of Fertility Endless Path, Infinite Cosmos After resting for a few hours Vaughn awoke to the sound of another notification within his mind. Slash slash Melanual, Intrigue, 1 slash slash. Confused, Vaughn called up the system log to see what happened while he was asleep. Slash slash system log slash slash. Slash slash Melanual, Affection plus 1 slash slash. Slash slash Melanual, Intrigue, 1 slash slash. Slash slash Melanual, Intrigue plus 1 slash slash. Slash slash Melanual, Intrigue, 1 slash slash. Slash slash Melanual, Intrigue, 1 slash slash. This must be the extra details sis talked about when I touched the aura of someone using view affection. It seems to show me whenever the values change. But why would they change when I'm nowhere near them? Advertisements. Asterisk the reason is simple Vaughn. Imagine if you were really angry at someone, but then they left for an extended period of time. Your anger would diminish over time, and if they were gone long enough it may cease entirely asterisk. Vaughn had a small epiphany after listening to Sissa's explanation. So you're saying that people's thoughts and feelings change based on exposure, time, and other factors. Asterisk yes, but you should keep in mind that everyone is unique. Different people may respond in unexpected ways, and time may even enhance certain emotions asterisk. He could understand what she meant. Even though he had never had the opportunity to spend time with his mother, his affection for her had only grown with time. Other than experiencing everything the records had to offer, it was the primary force driving him forward. Sounds of stomach Sama demanding your attention. Hearing the protest of his stomach Vaughn quickly left the room, making sure to lock the door on his way out. Though he hadn't left any valuables inside, he actually enjoyed the thought of locking away his own little personal space that nobody had free access to. On his way down he came across the small girl who was shuffling between several tables serving food to the other guests. Noticing his appearance, she immediately began to back away before saying, My mother said you were a guest Naya. And to make sure not to let you touch my ears or tail Naya. Hearing what the girl said, the surrounding customers all burst out laughing. Ha 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 ha, you tell I'm lass. Don't be getting handsy now why here, said one man with a deep baritone voice. I, you tell I'm Jim? Keep your filthy mitts off our little Tina, shouted his companion while raising a flagon of ale. Vaughn didn't know what to say in response to the ruckus of the crowd. He looked helplessly at the young girl that seemed to be terrified of him and noticed her aura was a wispy purple color. Though he wanted to touch her and see her values, he assumed it would probably make the situation worse. Giving up, he waved towards the proprietress who seemed to be enjoying his misery and left the inn. Slash slash Melanual, Intrigue plus 5 slash slash. Slash slash Melanual, Affection plus 2 slash slash. The moment the notification sounded, he almost tripped which caused another round of laughter to erupt behind him. Slash slash Melanual, Affection plus 1 slash slash. He quickly left the area before asking a passerby for directions. Tonight he had decided to visit one of the more popular places in the manga, the Hostess of Fertility. That was where Bell had met the silver-haired beauty seer Fleva and was also the workplace of Ryu Lion who was one of his favorite characters. He wasn't sure if they were working there yet, but it would still be worth it to visit. He remembered it being one of the most famous places in the city due to its all-women staff and incredible food. After nearly half an hour traveling by foot, Vaughn finally arrived at the Hostess of Fertility. It boasted a size similar to the guild office, and also had three floors that seemed capable of housing hundreds of guests with ease. Vaughn could smell a captivating aroma escaping the slightly ajar double doors. It was the first time in both his lives that the simple smell of food was able to dominate his senses. The sound of Thulhu awakening from its thousand-year slumber, a slash n, this is his stomach. With a rising anticipation, he entered through the doors and was immediately welcomed. Welcome to the hostess of fertility Naya. Will you be dining in tonight? Vaughn looked towards the voice and saw a black-haired cat person with green eyes smiling at him with a dangerous look in her eyes. She seemed rather petite at 158 centimeters but was still slightly taller than he was. Her aura was a mixture of yellow surrounded by an almost illusory pink. I slash N, I switched to CM by suggestion, since not a lot of people liked meters for height. BTW, Vaughn is 150 centimeters tall right now. Nya, it's not nice to stare Mr. Customer she seemed to be admonishing him, but the smile on her face grew to the point it reached her eyes causing her to squint slightly. Snapping out of his stupor, Vaughn gave a polite nod before saying, Sorry about that miss. And yes, 
I'd like to dine in tonight. I've heard great things about this restaurant and had to experience it for myself. While guiding him towards an area near the bar she couldn't help but ask, what great things have you heard Naya? Without thinking about his response, Vaughn replied, they say this place has cute women and great food. Immediately after the words left his mouth, he felt a slight shiver down his spine. Cute women Naya? Does that include me? She gave him her most playful look as she put her finger to her chin and tilted her head. Vaughn didn't know why, but he felt a sense of danger in the look as he noticed the aura around her become a deeper shade. Swallowing his saliva he responded with a smile, oh of course. Hearing his response, the cat person leaned towards him with a seemingly malicious grin. Oh, and what part of me is cute Naya? She couldn't help but tease the young boy further. Thoughts rapidly spun through Vaughn's mind as she inched closer and closer towards his face. When she was less than a foot from him, he blurted out the first thing that he could think of. Your hair and ears are definitely very cute. The woman seemed to freeze slightly and Vaughn noticed the ears on her head begin to noticeably twitch. The aura emitting from her body began to fluctuate slightly. Thinking he may have offended her, he was preparing his apology when she suddenly interrupted him. My name is Chloe Lolo, what is your name Naya? Vaughn noticed her eyes seemed to shimmer with an evil light and felt compelled to answer. My name? Vaughn Mason. Vaughn Mason? How old are you Vaughn? Based on her demeanor, she almost seemed to be interrogating him. As he prepared his answer, another voice cut in from across the bar. Chloe, you're terrifying the poor boy. Take his order and get back to work, or I'll find someone else to take care of him. After the voice sounded, Chloe assumed a more professional stance and bowed slightly towards Vaughn. Forgive me Naya. I didn't mean to pressure you, I just couldn't help myself Naya. Unsure of what had just happened, Vaughn nodded slightly before giving his order to Chloe. As she passed by to submit the order to the kitchen, she made sure to swipe her tail secretly across his hand. Feeling the unexpectedly soft touch, Vaughn looked in her direction and saw her give a wink before turning away. Slash slash Chloe Lolo, affection plus seven slash slash. Slash slash Chloe Lolo, intrigue plus eleven slash slash. As he heard the notifications within his mind, Vaughn couldn't help but feel like he was navigating through a minefield and had forgotten the layout. The woman who had spoken out earlier to admonish Chloe saw his expression and walked over. Don't let her get to you kid. She gets that way sometimes when dealing with some of the younger boys. You need to learn to have a little backbone or someone will walk all over you in the future. Vaughn nodded his head and looked towards her as she went about serving the customers at the bar. Though she looked a bit different from the manga, he was able to easily determine her identity. She was Mia Grande, the proprietress of the Hostess of Fertility. She was around 180 centimeters tall and had filled out in various areas due to her age. She had brown hair and eyes that both seemed to glisten in the tavern's light. Though Vaughn knew she was pushing into her fifties, she still maintained a youthful vigor likely due to her secret as being one of the few level SIXS in the city. While he was waiting for his food he began to look around to see if he could recognize anyone else. Though he wasn't able to see the appearance of Seer or Ryuo, he did spot Anya Frommel and Lenoir Faust. They were both going around in their waitress attire and Vaughn couldn't help but smile seeing their interactions with other customers. Enjoying the sight Naya. MMM. Vaughn nodded his head in response before jolting his body and turning towards the voice. Chloe was standing there with his food and had been observing him as he looked around the pub. Though she found it amusing at first, she couldn't help but get annoyed when he hadn't noticed her presence for such a long period of time. Seeing that Mama Mia was busy with other customers, she decided to punish Vaughn for ignoring her. Placing his food on the bar, she sat down on the stool immediately to his left which was a slight blind spot unless Mama Mia looked directly over here. She turned towards Vaughn with a big grin before gesturing at his plate. Go ahead. Eat up Naya. Feeling the hair on the back of his neck rise, Vaughn smiled as he picked up the fork and looked at his plate. Though the meal looked unlike any he had previously seen, he couldn't help but feel like he was about to eat his last meal. Slowly spooling the noodles called spaghetti, Vaughn began to bring it to his mouth only to stop once his nose had caught the smell of the dish. Releasing all his previous anxiety, he couldn't help but close his eyes and inhale deeply the rich aromatic fragrance. After several long breaths, Vaughn finally put the food into his mouth as he was assaulted by the vibrant array of herbs and spices. It almost felt like his soul was leaving his body and he was about to transmigrate to another world. 
He savored every single instance as he slowly chewed the richly textured noodles and perfectly spiced meat sauce. Before this moment, he didn't even know food could taste so good. In his previous life, he was fed almost exclusively vitamin supplements and nutrient cocktails. Ever since coming to this world he had the opportunity to sample various wild fruits and vegetables as well as wild game. He had mistakenly assumed the bland taste of the meat he roasted was something high class since it tasted so much better than what he had back in the labs. Anno why are you crying Naya? Did I go too far? Hearing a voice of concern, Vaughn looked towards Chloe and saw an apologetic expression on her face as she stared at him. Reaching his free hand to his face, he noticed he was actually crying over the taste of the food. Embarrassed, he could help but look away as he said, No, it's not your fault. The food was just so good that I, sighing in relief, Chloe noticed that Mama Mia had been looking in this direction and panicked slightly. Instead of saying anything, Mia just gave a subtle thumbs up and then indicated for her to return to work. Advertisements Vaughn continued to eat after Chloe left and even took the opportunity to order seconds. After finishing the second plate and paying his tab, he got ready to leave. On his way out Chloe personally sent him out and got him to promise to come back when she was on her shift. On his way home he seemed to remember the notifications from earlier and decided to see the affection values for Chloe. View affection, Chloe Lolo affection, 64 interested, intrigue 71 desire to pet. Seeing the value for intrigue, Vaughn couldn't help but feel a cold sweat for what seemed like the tenth time this evening. What does it mean desire to pet? Lamenting at the implications, Vaughn returned to his room and passed out in exhaustion. Chapter 21 Into the Dungeon, Desire Endless Path, Infinite Cosmos Vaughn awoke early the next morning and gave a cursory glance at the system log. He noted there weren't many changes in Milan's affection, but Chloe's had increased overnight. Seeing the strange description desire to pet Vaughn quickly closed the log. He spent a few minutes washing his face and using water from the decanter of replenishment. Afterward, he performed some routine maintenance on his equipment before heading downstairs. Preparing to leave the inn, he noticed someone new at the counter. She was a human girl, around 17 to 18 years old with black hair neatly arranged into a long braid flowing over her shoulder. Her purple eyes seemed to droop a bit towards the end giving her a gentle expression. Noticing his presence she displayed a gentle smile and waved. Vaughn returned a smile of his own with a curt nod as he exited the inn. Today was an important day and he wanted to get an early start. If she was a permanent worker at the inn, he would have plenty of time to interact with her in the future. He turned to walk towards the massive tower in the center of the city. Today he was planning to enter the dungeon for the first time. As he made his way along the road he couldn't help but increase his pace a bit. Along the way, several people gave him curious glances but he would worry about that later. He had almost used some of his stock piled up to purchase new clothing but wanted to see how far he could get into the dungeon relying on his current equipment. If things were more difficult than he expected he would upgrade his gear before making a second attempt. Due to his increased pace, he managed to reach the tower in under 20 minutes. Before entering he looked up to take in the view of the tower from its base. He remembered from the manga that the tower had been built by the gods to seal the dungeon below. It should be 50 floors tall and from where he stood it almost seemed to pierce into the heavens. The top could be seen, but it was almost a blur that disappeared into the atmosphere above. He couldn't imagine how long it would take to go to the top. Vaughn entered the first floor of Babel and was surprised to see the number of adventurers present. He wasn't the only person that decided to enter the dungeon first thing in the morning. He observed the hustle and bustle before making his way towards a desk near the stairwell leading downwards into the earth. Entering one of the open windows, Vaughn met his first elf in this world. At around 178 centimeters with golden hair and green eyes stood an elven male. He had very smooth facial features giving a bit of ambiguity to his gender, but his style and the way he carried himself answered any questions observers might have. His hair was short and combed back giving him a very princely look, and the expression in his eyes was intelligent and intimidating. Noticing the approach of the human child before him, Nicholas Grimm waved him over. He had a good memory for faces and was often posted outside the dungeon, so he assumed this human child was likely a new adventurer or freelancer. Though it didn't concern him much, he knew it damaged the guild's bottom line when adventurers died within the dungeon. Advertisements. Good morning. I assume you would like information about the dungeon before entering. 
Vaughn nodded while observing the peculiar green aura emitted by the elf receptionist. Very well, you can exchange 100 valis for a map of the first four floors of the dungeon. Though the layout changes on the deeper floors, the upper levels remain relatively consistent and we update the maps weekly. For first timers, it's one of our most recommended items. We also have several volumes that cover the ecology and weakness of various monsters. Vaughn listened as the elf tried to offer him various items for purchase. After selecting books about kobolds and dungeon lizards the man started to explain various other hazards that might appear in the dungeon. Vaughn was surprised with how much detail the man put into his explanation, and had Sis keep a log so he could review it later. Lastly, the man had Vaughn fill out his information like address and expected time of stay within the dungeon. He was told that if he failed to leave within the written time, they would wait 72 hours before informing the people listed on the contacts of his disappearance. After everything was said and done, Vaughn finally entered the dungeon. The first floor was a wide open path with brackish blue walls and a peculiar off-green colored floor. Vaughn wasn't the only person walking along the path, but everyone seemed to stick to their own groups so he didn't go out of his way to bother them. Though he had expected to encounter monster immediately upon entering the dungeon, they seemed to spawn infrequently and were eliminated quickly by others. Creating some distance between himself and all the other groups, Vaughn made his way through a corridor that branched off of the main pathway. At this point, he was proactively trying to map as much as he could using the auto-mapping function of the system. Everything within his line of sight was updated in detail within the minimap displayed within the periphery of his vision. He tried not to focus on the map too much as it wouldn't really increase his progress and might even distract him. He knew it would become a valuable asset whenever he tried to backtrack in the future and was satisfied only checking it periodically. Fifteen minutes into his first dive, Vaughn finally encountered a monster. Eight meters ahead of his current position, the wall seemed to open and spit out a form he instantly recognized. With the familiar creature in sight, Vaughn equipped his bow and dispatched the goblin with a single arrow. Approaching the area where the goblin fell, Vaughn bent over to pick up the crystal left behind. I may have to go deeper into the dungeon if I want to test myself. Goblins in small groups don't pose any threat to me anymore. Asterisk Vaughn? Look out, asterisk. Hearing the shout of Sis within his mind, Vaughn leaped forward and rolled along the ground. He rebounded to his feet and saw the creature that had just tried to sneak attack him. Standing in the spot he had just occupied stood a second goblin wielding a small wood club. Vaughn could see behind it two more goblins being spit out of the wall. The closet goblin lunged towards him and Vaughn had to reopen the distance to take aim. Unlike the goblins on the surface, this one seemed to be much quicker as it was easily able to close the distance towards Vaughn who was backstepping. Swinging its club, Vaughn managed to intercept with his bow before kicking the goblin away during the resulting struggle. Before the goblin was able to find its footing, Vaughn immediately loosed an arrow into its body turning it to dust. Not missing a beat, he continued to open the distance and fired two more arrows into the other goblins who were trying to close the gap and attack. They both turned into dust as Vaughn released a sigh he had been withholding. He carefully looked around to see if there were any other goblins trying to sneak up on him. Unlike the forest where he was able to make use of the terrain to stealth kill goblins, in open areas like this where monsters could spawn freely he had to always be alert. When the dungeon released monsters it was almost soundless, and Vaughn almost paid the price for his negligence. Even though I thought goblins didn't pose a threat, I was almost forced to swallow my words, the fact that the goblins are able to spawn in such close proximity makes the bow less effective. I'm too reliant on attacking things from a distance which isn't suitable for someone soloing the dungeon. Vaughn reassigned his bow to the secondary slot and equipped the dagger he had received when he first arrived in this world. He hadn't used it since his breakaway from the goblin sentries, and its low attack value made it unreliable if he wanted to fight stronger monsters. Sis, please filter through the list and purchase a dagger that is about twice as strong as this one, no, wait. Instead of a dagger make it a sword. It has better range and looks a lot cooler than a small knife. Confirmed, purchasing runic Tamahagana blade for 2000 op. At this point Vaughn had saved a total of 51,790 op, so he wasn't worried about the loss of 2000. What caught his attention was the large black sword that had appeared before him. Its total length was 130 centimeters, with the blade taking up three-fourths of that total. When he picked it up he was surprised at how light it felt compared to its size. Taking a look at his surroundings, 
Vaughn stood with his back to a wall so he could see anyone approaching. Afterward, he decided to quickly inspect the new sword. Runic Tamahagana Blade. Rank A, Magic. Slots, 2. P.ATK, 510 plus 50. M.ATK, 180. A sword reforged countless time by a young blacksmith from the Far East who aspired to become the greatest in the land. Upon his death, his friend enchanted the blade using an ancient technique in hopes that his friend's dream would become a reality. Vaughn was surprised at the attack value of the sword, but it made sense given the increased size. He gave it a few practice swings, and even though it felt light his arms began to tire after a while. I'll have to focus on landing decisive strikes if I don't want to tire myself out. But I can use this as an opportunity to further my training. As the last test before he moved on, Vaughn began to channel his source energy into the sword while watching its stats. It seemed to take far more energy than the bow and arrow, but he noticed as the runes began to glow that the sword actually became lighter. Another thing was the fact that the P.ATK of the sword remained unchanged while the M.ATK seemed to increase rapidly. Vaughn continued to channel magic into the sword until all of the runes began to glow. The blade began to hum and whenever he swung it, the sword felt as light as a feather in his hands. The coolest thing was how the blade now left a trail of light wherever he swung. He noticed that the M.ATK was now 1800, 10x the initial value. Curious about the effect he decided to attack the nearest wall. The moment the sword contacted the wall Vaughn was surprised. The expected impact never came and the sword seemed to pass effortlessly through the dense dungeon wall. It seemed that the magic not only decreased the weight but also enhanced the sharpness to an insane degree. Even as a novice in swordsmanship, as long as he managed to hit the target he would likely be able to kill it. Marveling at how powerful an item that cost 2000 points was, Vaughn made a determination to stockpile as much as he could for the future. He would still buy consumables and upgrade his equipment when needed, but now it had become his goal to buy an item that cost 100,000, no, 1 million op, slash slash quest triggered slash slash, quest, birth of a legend, rank, SS, advertisements, heroes are as famous as the weapons they wield, even a lowly squire can become a legend when wielding a sword forged by the gods, condition, exchange 1 million op with the system to obtain a random weapon, rewards, gotcha function unlocked, 10 plus 1 premium gotcha pull, 1000 karma, failure condition, death, 12 months past 364d 23h 58m, spend more than 100,000 op 4, 997 slash 100, 000, penalty, all items within the inventory destroyed, shop function disabled for 12 months, equipment items become cursed for 1 month, cursed items cannot be removed, Vaughn smiled, if the path wanted to challenge his conviction, he wouldn't let it down. He turned towards the depths of the dungeon and continued to walk forward. Chapter 22 Reflection, Slaughter, Endless Path, Infinite Cosmos Vaughn progressed further into the dungeon until he found a staircase leading deeper into the dungeon. After a brief hesitation, he decided to head down so he could test his new sword. He continued onwards until the staircase opened to another floor. Looking beyond the door he could see the staircase continued further on, but when he tried to pass he felt a resistance preventing him from passing. Sticking out his hand as a test, he was able to feel a membrane that became increasingly resistant based on how much pressure he applied. Out of curiosity, he even backed up and swung his sword to try and cut through the invisible barrier. Though it seemed to cut through easily at first, after progressing 30 to 40 centimeters he felt a sudden rebounding force. Caught off guard, the sword was sent flying and Vaughn felt a warm sensation coming from his now numb hand. Looking down he saw blood dripping from his the skin between his thumb and forefinger. The rebound had completely severed the soft flesh between the two fingers. I didn't think that one through properly. But at least I was able to understand the limits of my sword a bit. It might have enhanced sharpness, but a strong enough resistive force can overwhelm the enchantment. After treating his wound using a low-grade healing potion obtained from the system, Vaughn continued into the second floor of the dungeon. The second floor was very similar to the first. The biggest difference was the sheer number of paths to explore. As he began exploring the floor Vaughn finally encountered his first new monster. Standing around 130 centimeters tall and covered in mangy grayish fur Vaughn was able to identify the creature as a kobold. It possessed the head of a dog and seemed to have a lazy expression as it shambled through down the corridor. 
Though he was momentarily overcome by the instinct to use his bow, Vaughn quickly put the idea to the back of his mind. He got into what he thought was a proper stance and began to awkwardly step towards the cobalt. Noticing his presence, the cobalt looked towards the approaching human before breaking out into a mad sprint. It was much faster than a goblin and possessed the ability to run on all fours which increased its ability to make sudden changes in direction. Once it got in range Vaughn tried swinging his sword into the cobalt's path. As the sword traced an arc through the air, the cobalt used its nimble movements to easily dodge under the path of the blade. Using the time he was off-balanced during the swing, the cobalt leaped into his stomach and began to sink its sharp canines into the flesh of Vaughn's abdomen. Advertisements Before he could respond to the sudden pain, the cobalt began to jerk its head side to side as it tried to tear the flesh from Vaughn's stomach. In a panic, Vaughn dropped his sword and tried to grab the head of the cobalt to prevent it from moving. As a response the cobalt began to use the jagged claws on its hands to fiercely claw away, causing lacerations all over Vaughn's chest and arms. As the pain threshold continued to rise, Vaughn felt the familiar cooling sensation spread through his mind as blood began to pool in the back of his throat. Mustering his strength he turned towards the wall and rammed his body, with the cobalt between it, with the greatest force he could muster. The cobalt finally released its jaw from Vaughn's abdomen only to change its target to his left thigh. Feeling the fresh pain coming from his leg, Vaughn used the remainder of his fading consciousness to equip the dagger he had stored in his inventory. He took the dagger and began to stab into the back of the cobalt over and over until it finally turned to dust. Vaughn collapsed, back to the wall, and looked at his stomach where he could see a deep black blood slowly oozing from what looked like his liver. He also saw the bright crimson blood which flowed like a tide from the torn blood vessels and arteries. Seeing the bright blood he began to have flashbacks to how he died in his previous. Asterisk, asterisk. As his consciousness began to fade he could hear a shouting from within his mind, but he couldn't hear it. He tried focusing on the voice, but the darkness encroaching on his vision seemed to hinder the message from getting through. The cold feeling that was in his mind began to spread to his entire body. He began to shiver and lose feeling in his legs. Asterisk, asterisk. Whose voice is that, sis? I'm sorry, I can't, hear you? Vaughn coughed up blood while trying to speak. His eyelids began to feel like lead weights as he struggled to keep them from closing. No matter how hard he tried, he just couldn't seem to keep them open. He knew that if he wasn't able to keep them open something terrible would happen, but he wasn't able to muster any strength. The darkness completely covered his vision and he finally let his eyes close fully. Throb, 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 throb. Vaughn could feel a powerful force trying to break through the darkness. He had already lost all feeling within his body, and couldn't form any coherent thoughts. Throb, throb. As the throbbing feeling began to increase in strength he started to see images. Accompanying each beat he could see the various memories he had accumulated in this world. He was sent back to the time when he first arrived in the record of Danmachi. Though he was scared he resolved himself to live freely to honor his mother's wishes. Throb, throb. He saw his six months of hard training, observing how he made the transition from an emaciated lab animal to a capable hunter that could even defeat a goblin tribe single-handedly. Throb, throb. He began to recall all the people he had met after journeying to the city. The kind middle-aged man at the city gate, Gregory. The mature receptionist Fauna, the petite Millie who cautioned him for his own benefit. Throb, throb. He remembered the mother and daughter combo Milan and Tina. He still wanted to clear up the misunderstanding so Tina didn't fear him, he even remembered the phenomenal taste of the dish called spaghetti and the terrifying black-haired cat person Chloe. Throb, throb. That's right, there are so many things I've experienced since coming to this world. The people, the places, and the food, I want to experience more. I don't want my journey to end here. No, I refuse to let it end. Throb, throb, throb shatter. Slush slush obtained innate skill will of the emperor slash slash. Vaughn felt something snap in his mind as he tried desperately to resist the darkness. He grit his teeth so hard he could feel his molars crack. His fingernails cut into his palms as Vaughn slowly opened his eyes. The cooling feeling originating from his mind seemed to encompass his body. Using his newfound awareness Vaughn quickly opened his inventory and withdrew a sense of bean. Feeling the small bean in his hand, he struggled to lift it to his mouth. He felt the darkness in his vision begin to return but forced it away using sheer willpower. Finally, 
he managed to put the sense of bean into his mouth and madly devoured the life-giving essence within. He felt his wounds begin to heal rapidly and was even able to see the huge tear in his abdomen close up. It was almost as if time had been reversed, and after several breaths, Vaughn was able to regain his strength. He lifted the nearby sword and turned towards his audience. Sorry to keep you waiting. Shall we begin? When he had begun to lose consciousness earlier, several goblins and kobolds had been spawned in the surrounding area. Though they wanted to charge at his limp body immediately, they were all forced back by an invisible pressure. It was unlike anything the monsters had experienced, and they felt a fundamental feeling of fear within their core. It was almost like the boy before they contained the soul of an ancient dragon. When the boy addressed them, the pressure suddenly increased as they looked into the deep aquamarine eyes. Within his pupils, they could see the silhouette of a fierce warrior shrouded in divine light. They could even vaguely see an illusion of a great army standing behind him. Without waiting any longer, Vaughn charged at the monsters who stared in his direction in reverence and fear. He swung his sword in wide arcs, trailing a white light that carried a deadly momentum. The sword began to hum as it cut through each successive body. As if possessing a life of its own, it began to resonate with the aura of its new master. Vaughn continued to slay monsters in a frenzy and seemed to trigger something within the dungeon itself. From the walls, floor, and even ceiling monsters continued to spawn to confront the mad tyrant wreaking havoc on the second floor. Advertisements. After several minutes Vaughn had cut a path of destruction towards the third floor. Even the walls of the dungeon itself could not impede the path of his blade as he left dozens of marks to scar its surface. Arriving at the staircase leading down, Vaughn decided to against continuing further and followed the staircase upwards. The power that had been coursing through his body since his awakening had begun to diminish and his instincts told him that once it faded he would most likely pass out. He sprinted upwards with his maximum speed and arrived at the entrance within 20 minutes. As he took several steps from the entrance, Amidst the crowd of people entering and exiting the dungeon, Vaughn collapsed into unconsciousness. Those in his surroundings immediately retreated for the boy who looked in terrible shape. There was blood covering every inch of his body, and they assumed he had most likely overestimated his own capabilities and suffered from his inexperience. One bolder adventurer decided to confirm if the boy was still alive and then flagged down the approaching guild staff after he noticed the boy was still breathing. One of approaching staff members was the elf Vaughn had seen earlier, Nicholas Grimm. Seeing the state of the boy he had just recently lectured about the dangers of the dungeon, he couldn't help but frown. Signaling the staff to escort him to the medical ward, he resolved to give the child a fierce lecture after he woke up. Chapter 23 A Qualitative Change Endless Path, Infinite Cosmos Vaughn awoke staring at a foreign ceiling. His limbs felt like lead and his breathing was labored. He felt the familiar cooling sensation of his pain tolerance, s, skill which brought some clarity to his mind. Opening his inventory, Vaughn pulled out a sense of bean. Given the current state of his body, it would likely take a long period of time to recover and he wasn't willing to wait it out. After ingesting the sense of bean he felt his body begin to warm up. The cooling sensation that had been permeating throughout his mind began to recede, allowing a powerful migraine to take its place. Vaughn gripped his head and began to massage his temples in an effort to alleviate the pain. Sis, why doesn't my pain tolerance work on this migraine? It feels like my brain is about to split open. Hearing the silence Vaughn felt something was off. Sis had never ignored him before so he began to panic, throwing the pain of his head to the back of his mind. Sis, what's wrong, why are you not responding? Due to his anxiety, he ended up asking the question out loud. The nearby nurse heard his exclamation and left to inform the doctor what had happened. Seeing her exit, Vaughn calmed down a bit and spoke in his mind. Please respond sis. I can't bear the silence. A mechanical sigh sounded. I'm here Vaughn, I'm just a little upset and thought I should punish you a little. Vaughn was ecstatic to hear her response but became confused after hearing the latter part of her words. Punish? What did I do wrong sis? He thought back to everything that happened today. No matter how hard he strained himself he was unable to reason why sis would be mad at him. Advertisements. Asterisk of course you did something wrong? You almost died, and no matter how much I shouted to get your attention you just lay there bleeding out. Even when you finally woke up and I started to feel relieved, you continued to ignore my prompts and just went on a killing spree. Asterisk. Vaughn was shocked hearing what she said. He did seem to recall that during the moment he was losing consciousness he thought someone was calling out to him. 
and after he woke up, the only thing he could think of was killing everything that opposed him. He realized his actions had caused Sis to worry about him. I'm sorry Sis. I promise not to ignore you in the future. You are the most important companion in my life, and I didn't mean to make you worry so much. Vaughn apologized in earnest, but couldn't help but feel a warmth spreading in his heart due to her concern. Apology accepted Vaughn, just make sure never to end up in that kind of situation again. Vaughn balled both his hands into fists while nodding. A firm expression appeared on his face as a glow emitted from the depths of his eyes. Through the door came two people. Vaughn recognized the first person as the elf he had seen before entering the dungeon. He wore a grim expression as he looked towards the location where Vaughn was resting. The second person was an old lady with silver hair and grey eyes. She was dressed in white robes and had a powerful smell of medicine wafting from her body. Vaughn Mason, I would think my advice when we spoke earlier was very straightforward. After everything I had said to prepare you for the dungeon, you return just a few hours later covered in blood? I am very disappointed with your lack of awareness. Nicholas looked at the boy who had a blank expression on his face and couldn't help but let out a sigh. Before he could continue his lecture, the old woman interrupted. That's enough of that now Nicholas. The boy just woke up and is probably still confused according to the nurse. Let me take care of things from here. Surrendering to the gaze of the doctor, Nicholas decided to excuse himself for the moment. He was able to confirm the boy had awoken and he could lecture him at a later date. He nodded at the doctor before frowning in the direction of Vaughn as he left the room. Vaughn felt guilty under the gaze of Nicholas and hung his head. Seeing the expression and demeanor of the young man, the old lady couldn't help but chuckle. It's good that you realize your error lad. Not everyone has the opportunity to listen to the lectures of others after making such a grave mistake. Vaughn heard what she said and nodded in approval. He decided to do something to make it up to Nicholas in the future. Satisfied with the boy's response, the old woman introduced herself. I'm the doctor that had performed first aid when you were brought into the ward. Most of the folks around here call me Granny Marin, feel free to do the same. Hearing her word Vaughn decided to thank her. Thanks, Granny Marin. I'm grateful for your help and will do my best to repay this favor in the future. Granny Marin waved her hand to dismiss his words. We can talk about payment and stuff later. What I'm curious about is how you're even awake at this moment. With the state your body was in you should have been asleep for several days, not just a couple of hours. Vaughn took a moment to come up with an explanation. His hesitation didn't escape Marin's eye as she began to squint slightly. I have a passive regeneration skill and when I woke up I drank a few potions to recover my health and stamina. Thinking she might inquire further, Vaughn mumbled while raising his hand. In his palm, a transparent red potion appeared which shocked Granny Marin. Storage magic? How rare. She seemed to think for a while before shaking her head. I won't ask any more questions then. The only things I need to know is how to best help my patients, and you don't seem to be in need of my skills. Vaughn once again thanked her and accepted her advice to stay overnight just in case any complications appear. Left alone in the room Vaughn decided to take the opportunity to review the skill he had obtained in the dungeon. It had been nagging at the back of his mind for a while, and he wanted to know exactly what it was. He couldn't ignore a skill that granted so much power. Will of the Emperor. Rank, Innate, SSS. Asterisk innate skills cannot be identified. Attempts to do so will result in a backlash asterisk. Passive, transcend all limitations and boundaries. Increases growth based on the conviction of the wielder and their followers. Active, only those who stand above the ranks of all creatures are privy to the will of the emperor. Creates a domain that suppresses those much weaker than the user. Has a moderate influence on those that are stronger. Reading the description Vaughn was gobsmacked. He quickly checked his stats to see if they had changed. Equals 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 Name, Von Mason. Age, 14. Race, Human, Sealed. Parameters, Danmachi. Level 1 plus, 0. Power, D604-A893. Endurance, E529-B714. Dexterity, D620-B799. Agility, E589-A811. Magic, 
G326 SS1124, total, 4241, A slash N, since people wanted me to include this. Soul Strength, Tier 2, Hero Soul, Karma 704. Equals 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 all of his stats experienced a qualitative improvement, especially his magic which had broken through to SS. If others were to see his parameters they would be shocked. Other than Bell who had yet to begin his journey, he was likely the only level 1 in the city to break through the S rank in magic. They would probably faint if they knew he didn't even know how to cast any spells. Vaughn continued to stare blankly at his parameters before noticing an abnormality. His soul strength, which had been tier 1 ever since he obtained the path had actually increased to tier 2. After thinking for a while, he suspected this was the reason for the abnormal growth of his magic. As if to confirm his theory, the migraine which he had been ignoring for so long reared its ugly head. The mental strain of overdrafting his source energy, or mana, had burdened his mind resulting in his current suffering. He had experienced a milder version of the same situation when he experimented with his bow several weeks ago. After trying to test the capacity of the bow to determine its limits, he ended up going too far and almost passed out on the archery range. It took nearly two hours before he was able to recover and continue the test. Vaughn continued to browse through his various stats and functions. Once he turned to his inventory he couldn't help but release a sigh. He was in a unique state of mind when he was slaughtering his way through the second floor. Because of that, he didn't pick up a single core or drop item after leaving the first floor. Looks like I'll be going back to roasted meat until I can earn some valis. Lamenting at his current lack of funds, Vaughn was suddenly struck by a brilliant idea. Sis, the shop allows me to exchange for pretty much any kind of item from every world, right? Can I exchange op for Valis? Vaughn began to get excited at the prospect of earning easy money. With the system he might not even have to go to the guild and exchange his items in the future. Asterisk it is possible Vaughn, but you should know there are negative consequences for doing so. The exchange rate remains the same for all levels of currency due to the common nature of the material, but you would accumulate a corresponding amount of negative karma depending on its real-world value asterisk. Vaughn was devastated. Though he wanted to be able to earn money easily, he didn't want to do it at the expense of earning negative karma. He had learned previously that the higher value someone's negative karma, the more likely terrible events would happen in the future. There was even the possibility of inviting retribution from the world's laws if it got too high. Why does creating money generate negative karma, sis? Given Vaughn's lack of common sense when it came to money, he was unable to comprehend how it was considered a bad thing. A slash N, he didn't buy anything in his previous life. You can literally count the stuff he has purchased on both hands. Asterisk it is a result of the nature of money as a balancing factor within society. A currency has to be strictly regulated by the governing body of every country or it can destabilize the economy and cause adverse effects on all levels of society. If you were to arbitrarily create funds and introduce them into the market, it could cause serious consequences for business and citizens in the future. This is one of the reasons it is considered against the law to create currency, and thus the reason why it generates negative karma when doing so asterisk, a slash n, I am not an economics guru. Advertisements. Though he wasn't sure he understood, he could see that creating money was bad. He tried thinking about it from various angles, but couldn't rationalize how something that seemed so important to maintain order was regulated by others. How did they know when to make more money? And what stopped them from giving themselves as much money as they wanted? He shook his head and lay back in his bed. The only thing that really mattered was that he had to earn money on his own, or exchange for items within the system to sell later. Since he was even able to purchase monster cores and drop items from the system, he could accept missions at the guild and simply exchange for the required resources. Thinking he had found a loophole to circumvent the problem Vaughn began to fall asleep wearing a smile on his face. Exchanging for items within the system to complete missions would also give negative karma. Vaughn blacked out after hearing Sis burst his bubble. Chapter 24 Will of the Emperor, One Half Endless Path, Infinite Cosmos Vaughn had gone to sleep early the previous day, so he had awoken at 2 a.m. 
Since he was unable to make much progress yesterday, he wanted to immediately head back into the dungeon. He might have been able to slaughter his way through the second floor, but since he wasn't in full control at the time he wanted to better understand the uses of will of the emperor. He checked out of the ward and they issued him a bill for 20,000V, which he would have to repay within 30 days. Though it was more money than he had ever possessed, he wasn't too worried about being able to earn enough. 20,000V was considerably less than the 1,000,000,000 op required for his quest after all. The medical ward was located within the first floor of Babel and was run in cooperation with the guild. They took care of any adventurers that were rescued and even sold potions and items to aid continued progression into the dungeon. This also meant that the ward was located relatively close to the entrance of the first upper floor, so Vaughn didn't have to travel far after leaving. As he passed the registration booths near the entrance, a familiar face caught his attention. He noticed Nicholas staring directly at him with an intimidating expression. Since Nicholas seemed to be dealing with another adventurer, and he also wanted to avoid a lecture, Vaughn gave a slight bow before continuing down the stairs. He could feel a gaze on his back as a chill crept down his spine which caused him to shudder a bit. Vaughn made his way through the corridor that had been registered as the beginner's road on his map and continued along his previously explored path. He wanted to try his hand at dealing with the second floor, so he put off mapping the rest of the dungeon until later. As he descended the stairs, he discovered the barrier barring his entrance to the third floor had vanished. Resisting his urge to investigate, Vaughn following his original intention and entered the door to the second floor. He noticed that the spawn rate of monsters on this floor was marginally higher than that of the previous level. Due to the fact paths began to diverge after passing the main corridor, there were very few situations where those venturing into the dungeon crossed paths. This meant there were plenty of monsters and Vaughn would have to fight them alone. He equipped his sword into his main hand equipment slot and mentally activated Will of the Emperor. He felt a surge of energy swell from his abdomen and extend to every part of his body. A cooling sensation similar to when he was using pain tolerance spread in his mind and he could feel the presence of an invisible force extending around him. He was vaguely aware that this was his domain, and any kobolds nearby seemed to hesitate to approach within 20 m. As none of the monsters seemed willing to approach, Vaughn took the opportunity to check and see if any of his parameters changed while the skill was active. Unfortunately, they had all remained the same, but Vaughn was able to discover that the cone displaying his line of sight in the minimap had now grown into a full circle. The circle spread out for 21.8 m from his position, and Vaughn became aware that any creatures within the radius had their location indicated on the map. As long as the skill was active he would be able to track monsters, even if they were behind him. Due to the spiritual nature of the domain, it could even pass through solid objects allowing him to see rudimentary details of corridors beyond walls. A slash n, it doesn't let him map things like his minimap, but more like the vague way his larger map does things. He would still have to look at things closely to enhance the details, at least for now. Vaughn walked towards the closest kobold and began to channel mana into the blade. He was surprised to notice that the runes began to glow instantly but wasn't sure if it was due to his greater magic capacity or a byproduct of will of the emperor. Advertisements. The sword became light in his hand and he charged towards the kobold who seemed reluctant to fight back. It got on all fours and tried to lunge at Vaughn in a manner similar to his first encounter. Unlike then, Vaughn was now able to easily keep track of the movements of the monster due to the increase in his attributes. He was easily able to intercept its path and bisect the kobold at the waist. With the fall of their brethren as a catalyst, the remaining four kobolds began to charge at Vaughn. Even without looking at the minimap he was able to vaguely feel their presence. Without retreating, Vaughn began trying to use his footwork to maneuver around the charging kobolds. He noticed they were able to make single rapid turns, but couldn't handle simultaneous changes in direction. Using a combination of his agility and low sweeping strikes, Vaughn was able to dispatch three of the remaining four kobolds. The final kobold seemed to succumb to the pressure of facing Vaughn alone and fell to its knees trembling. It put its head to the ground and tried to hide its eyes using its malformed paws. Vaughn realized that when the others had fallen his domain seemed to focus entirely on the last kobold. Unable to withstand the pressure caused by the difference in strength, it decided to submit instead of fighting. Vaughn was able to vaguely feel that the kobold was trying to establish a connection with him through will of the emperor. He knew that if he desired it, 
the monster before him would become his subordinate and follow his will. The longer he continued contemplating the decision, the more he could see the cobalt shake. He almost felt pity for the creature but denied the feeling since it had previously tried to kill him. No matter how much time passed, Vaughn couldn't think of any benefit in accepting the cobalt as a subordinate. It was one of the weakest monsters in the dungeon, and he had no way of caring for it if he wanted to take it outside. As if coming to a realization, the cobalt sprawled out on the ground. Moments later it turned to dust, succumbing to the oppression generated by the domain. Picking up the magic core, Vaughn couldn't help but feel a little guilty. Even if he didn't want to accept it, he could have let it go since it had surrendered. Sighing, he collected the remaining cores and continued deeper into the second floor. Along the way, he kept slaying every goblin and kobold as they appeared. Any group smaller than three was dealt with simply. The larger groups were more challenging, but as his experience with Will of the Emperor grew it became progressively easier to advance. He also noticed that if he focused all of his attention on a single monster it would become slightly stunned and temporarily unable to move. He could use the moment after they froze up as an opportunity to deal a lethal blow. Two hours later he had finally arrived at the stairs leading further into the dungeon. Before continuing downwards, he decided to rest for a while. Since he had been using Will of the Emperor for the entire duration, he consumed an Mana Recovery Potion, 100 op, and waited for his slight migraine to completely dissipate. During this brief period, he checked his spoils. He had obtained a total of 73 magic cores, 51 from kobolds and 22 from goblins. With an average value between 15 to 20 op, he had netted a potential 1100 total op. This, combined with the drop items that were still being identified in the inventory would likely bring the value towards 1200 to 1300. Vaughn was surprised knowing he had obtained over 1000 origin points within a short two-hour period. That was nearly a quarter of the total op he had obtained, minus quest, during his entire seven-month stay in the forest? At this rate, he would easily be able to obtain the one M-op required to complete his current quest. After thinking for a moment, Vaughn separated the cores into two equally sized piles within his inventory. He still needed to exchange some with the guild to earn living expenses, and it was his intention to frequent the Hostess of Fertility whenever he had the time. Thinking of the food he had enjoyed previously, Vaughn could feel phantom pangs of hunger and anticipation from his stomach. Taking some jerky from his inventory, Vaughn had the thought of convincing Mama Mia to allow him to store some dishes. Though he knew that exposing his inventory was dangerous, he was very tempted by the idea. If only storage magic was able to preserve items as well. I wouldn't have to try to think of a way to hide its existence so much. That was the biggest difference between Vaughn's inventory and known storage magic. His inventory had the ability to halt the time of objects and preserve them perfectly whereas storage magic slowed the decay but could not prevent it. Advertisements. After resting for 20 minutes Vaughn's mana had completely recovered. He made his way towards the third floor and activated Will of the Emperor again. Though he was secretly worried about becoming too reliant on the skill, he wanted to become accustomed to its use as quickly as possible. Though it didn't enhance his parameters, the increased perception allowed him to rapidly improve his combat capabilities. The longer he fought, the easier it was to adapt his body to the various situations he'd find himself in during combat. He assumed that if he were to fight a group between four to five monsters he would be able to eliminate them easily, even without relying on the skill. The entrance of the third floor opened into a very wide area approximately 50 m in diameter. Along the wall were around 20 tunnels that lead further into the dungeon. Vaughn knew he would probably have to investigate several of them if he wanted to find the way to the next floor, but first, he had to deal with the situation in front of him. Since the room was much larger than normal it was occupied by a total of 19 kobolds. He knew it would be a tough fight, but he should be able to overcome the situation. That is if it was just kobolds he had to worry about. Among the kobolds, he could see three large lizards. They were 2-3m long and covered in a dense assortment of warts and scale-like protrusions. Vaughn recognized them from the ecology book he had purchased previously. They were dungeon lizards and were considered the strongest monster on the first four floors. Due to the size of the group, they did not seem to suffer any constraints from will of the emperor. Vaughn decided it was best to retreat, but stopped after a realization hit him. Damn, how can I forget something so obvious? Mocking his own foolishness, Vaughn swapped his sword for the magic bow he used to assassinate the goblin chief. 
He knocked an arrow that had a strange protrusion on the end. Taking aim at the closest lizard, he let the arrow fly. Chapter 25 Will of the Emperor, Two Halves Endless Path, Infinite Cosmos Asterisk boom, asterisk Contacting the lizard's head, the arrow exploded creating a thunderous boom. The nearby kobolds were knocked off their feet while the remaining two dungeon lizards roared. In response to the chaos, Vaughn continued to fire explosive arrows towards the remaining lizards and larger groups of kobolds. Because of his increased magic capacity, the bow and arrows charged almost immediately as they were drawn. Pleasantly surprised, Vaughn loosed as many arrows as he could before the monsters could close the distance. As the closest kobolds entered the range of his domain, Vaughn was overcome by a peculiar sensation. It seemed like his perception had increased further with the use of the bow. He could easily track every monster within his domain, and could even see a small shadow forecasting where they would move next. Instead of changing back to his sword, Vaughn decided to take the opportunity to test the influence of will of the Emperor on his ranged capabilities. He had yet to engage anything after the massive leap in his attributes and found the current situation the perfect solution to appease his curiosity. While his previous style with the bow relied on opening a distance between him and the opponent, he now used his experience with the sword to improve his combat style. Instead of opening the gap, Vaughn used his footwork to outmaneuver the kobolds. In the brief gaps when they were trying to adjust their positioning to match his, Vaughn was able to quickly fire an arrow into their defenseless form. When one kobold had tried to flank him and attack his back, Vaughn was able to intercept it with his bow using the senses gained from will of the emperor. He was surprised to see that when the bow made contact with the kobold's neck, the body seemed to fold around the point of contact before it was launched several meters away. It was at that moment Vaughn realized his strength had increased to an almost superhuman level compared to his previous self. After around three minutes Vaughn had dealt with the entire pack of kobolds. He looked towards the previous location of the dungeon lizards and found some slightly larger magic cores. After analyzing them through the system, he was able to determine they had a value of 23, 24, and 27 respectively. Though this implied they were only slightly stronger than kobolds, Vaughn knew it wasn't always the size of magic core that determined the threat of a monster. Once everything was cleaned up, Vaughn took a good look at his bow. He had initially decided it wouldn't be useful for soloing the dungeon but now knew that it had potential even in close-ranged combat. There seemed to be a synergy between bow mastery and will of the emperor. Bow mastery had increased to rank D, from F, and gave a large enhancement to his vision. Combined with the increased perception of will of the emperor he could almost predict the movements of monsters within the domain. Advertisements. Looking towards the various tunnels, he equipped the bow to the secondary slot and brought out his sword. The bow was exceptional in open spaces, but he still preferred the sword for combat within the majority of the upper floors. The wide arcs of the sword allowed him to dispatch multiple monsters at once if they were close enough, and he didn't have to risk causing a collapse from misfiring an arrow into the wall. He also remembered how his bow combat had improved due to the footwork he had been developing with the sword and wanted to polish the skill further. Vaughn approached a random tunnel and started following it away from the large room. On his way, he continued to slay numerous small groups of kobolds. Even though they had become much easier to deal with, because of his close experience with death the previous day he didn't slack. Instead, he tried various different fighting methods, even incorporating punches and kicks into his combinations. He was especially surprised when his back fist had caught a kobold that had evaded his sword strike. Attempting to use the opportunity while Vaughn was completing a swing, the kobold leaped claws first towards Vaughn's neck. Releasing his left hand from the grip of the sword, Vaughn used a twisting motion to counter the kobold with the back of his fist. On contact he could feel the skull of the kobold collapse under the force of the blow, disintegrating into dust before it could make contact with the nearby wall. As it was the last kobold of the group, Vaughn stared blankly at his fist. He hadn't expected the result to be so drastic. He couldn't help but shudder when recalling the feeling of bone contorting against his fist. He shook his head to put the image out of his mind and pressed onward. Using around 40 minutes, Vaughn found the stairs leading to the next floor. Though he wasn't as drained as the second floor, he still took the opportunity to rest in the relative safety of the stairwell. The dungeon barrier that prevented him from going down to floors he hadn't accessed also prevented most monsters from going up. Unless they could overcome the barrier, the majority of monsters were stuck to their assigned floors. 
I wanted an opportunity to fight a dungeon lizard with my sword. I remember they're pretty resistant against physical attacks, so I wonder how they would fare against the sharpness enchantment of my blade. Vaughn looked at the now magically inert blade. Its 130 centimeters length made it stand out against his 150 centimeters frame. From the perspective of an observer, it probably looked like a child swinging around the sword of an adult. Vaughn blushed slightly at his self-deprecating thought and continued to inspect the sword. The thing he found most interesting was the lack of a guard or any other embellishments. For a sword whose description says it was reforged countless times, it seemed rather plain. Even its cutting age didn't possess the typical silver sheen polish to counter the dark metallic color of the blade. In fact, other than when the runes were active the blade was entirely black in color and seemed to reflect a peculiar wavy pattern in the light. As he continued to observe the blade using the illumination of the dungeon walls, he noticed a small mark engraved where the blade and handle met. It looked like two winged snakes twining around a scale. After inquiring about what it might represent, he was told it was probably the maker's mark. Without knowing the name and background of the blacksmith, it would be impossible to interpret its meaning. Satisfied with his rest, Vaughn continued towards the fourth floor. Much like the previous three floors, it had glowing blue walls and an off-green colored floor. It also contained a combination of kobolds, goblins, and dungeon lizards. Unlike the previous floors though, dungeon lizards were the prominent creature of the fourth floor and Vaughn finally had the opportunity to engage one using his sword. Even though the blade was fully charged with magic, Vaughn was surprised to discover there was actually a bit of resistance when he cut through the lizard's hide. He inferred that, due to the existence of magic flowing within the body of monsters, as they became stronger they would offer more resistance against the blade. Since the dungeon lizards were resistant to both physical and magical attacks, it made sense that they were slightly more difficult to cut. Only slightly though, as Vaughn was able to bisect it from head to tail in a single leaping swipe. The fourth floor was slightly longer than the previous three, and it took a total of five hours to navigate to the stairs. He had to backtrack on several occasions due to the complex layout of the dungeon. Luckily he was prevented from getting lost due to the existence of his minimap. He avoiding the scenario where he would reach the same dead end more than once. After arriving at the stairwell, Vaughn decided to immediately head up and call it a day. By now it was nearing 3 p.m. and he wanted to exchange magic cores at the guild to obtain some valis before visiting the hostess of fertility. He was very satisfied with his growth and decided to inspect his stats as he ascended the stairs. Equals 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 Name, Von Mason. Age, 14. Race, Human, Sealed. Parameters, Danmachi. Level 1 plus. 0. Power, A893-S909. Endurance, B714-B740. Dexterity, B799-A833. Agility, A811-A889. Magic, SSS1124-SSS1493. Advertisements. Total, 4864. Soul Strength, Tier 2, Hero Soul. Karma 721. Equals 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 Most of his stats were nearing S, and he was surprised at how much his magic had increased in half a day. It seems his use of will of the emperor promotes magical growth to a terrifying degree. Vaughn began to seriously consider using some op to purchase magic from the system shop. 